Section 22 of the Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. The Natural History, Volume 2 by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 22. Book 8, Chapters 36 through 47. Chapter 36, The Ichneumon. This hostility is the especial glory of this animal, which is also produced in Egypt. It plunges itself repeatedly into the mud, then dries itself in the sun, as soon as by these means it has armed itself with a sufficient number of coatings, it proceeds to the combat. Raising its tail, and turning its back to the serpent it receives its stings which are inflicted to no purpose until at last turning its head sideways and viewing its enemy it seizes it by the throat not content however with this victory it conquers another creature also which is no less dangerous chapter thirty seven the crocodile the nile produces the crocodile also a destructive quadruped and equally dangerous on land and in the water this is the only land animal that does not enjoy the use of its tongue and the only one that has the upper jaw movable and is capable of biting with it and terrible is its bite for the rows of its teeth fit into each other like those of a comb its length mostly exceeds eighteen cubits it produces eggs about the size of those of the goose and by a kind of instinctive foresight always deposits them beyond the limit to which the river nile rises when at its greatest height there is no animal that arrives at so great a bulk as this from so small a beginning it is armed also with claws and has a skin that is proof against all blows it passes the day on land and the night in the water in both instances on account of the warmth when it has glutted itself with fish it goes to sleep on the banks of the river a portion of the food always remaining in its mouth upon which a little bird which in egypt is known as the trochilus and in italy as the king of the birds for the purpose of obtaining food invites the crocodile to open its jaws then hopping to and fro it first cleans the outside of its mouth next the teeth and then the inside while the animal opens its jaws as wide as possible in consequence of the pleasure which it experiences from the titillation it is at these moments that the ichneumon seeing it fast asleep in consequence of the agreeable sensation thus produced darts down its throat like an arrow and eats away its intestines Chapter 38. The Sinkus. Like the crocodile, but smaller even than the ichneumon, is the Sinkus, which is also produced in the Nile, and the flesh of which is the most effectual antidote against poisons, and acts as a powerful aphrodisiac upon the male sex. But so great a pest was the crocodile to prove, that nature was not content with giving it one enemy only, the dolphins, therefore, which enter the Nile have the back armed with a spine, which is edged like a knife, as if for this very purpose. And although these animals are much inferior in strength, they contrive to destroy the crocodile by artifice, which, on the other hand, attempts to drive them from their prey, and would reign alone in its river as its peculiar domain. For all animals have an especial instinct in this respect, and are able to know not only what is for their own advantage but also what is to the disadvantage of their enemies they fully understand the use of their own weapons they know their opportunity and the weak parts of those with which they have to contend the skin of the belly of the crocodile is soft and thin aware of this the dolphins plunge into the water as if in great alarm and diving beneath its belly tear it open with their spines there is a race of men also who are peculiarly hostile to this animal 
they are known as the Tentiriti from an island in the Nile which they inhabit. These men are of small stature, but of wonderful presence of mind, though for this particular object only. The crocodile is a terrible animal to those who fly from it, while at the same time it will fly from those who pursue it. These, however, are the only people who dare to attack it. They even swim in the river after it, and mount its back like so many horsemen, and just as the animal turns up its head for the purpose of biting them, they insert a club into its mouth, holding which at each end, with the two hands, it acts like a bit, and by these means they drive the captured animal on shore. They also terrify the crocodile so much by their voice alone, even as to force it to disgorge the bodies which it has lately swallowed, for the purpose of burial. This island, therefore, is the only place near which the crocodile never swims. Indeed, it is repelled by the odor of this race of men, just as serpents are by that of the silly. The sight of this animal is said to be dull when it is in the water, but when out of the water, piercing in the extreme, it always passes the four winter months in a cave without taking food. Some persons say that this is the only animal that continues to increase in size as long as it lives. It is very long-lived. Chapter 39. The Hippopotamus. The Nile produces the hippopotamus, another wild beast, of a still greater size. It has the cloven hoof of the ox, the back, the mane, and the neighing of the horse, and the turned-up snout, the tail, and the hooked teeth of the wild boar, but not so dangerous. The hide is impenetrable, except when it has been soaked with water, and it is used for making shields and helmets. This animal lays waste the standing corn, and determines beforehand what part it shall ravage on the following day. It is said also that it enters the field backwards, to prevent any ambush being laid for it on its return. Chapter 40. Who first exhibited the hippopotamus and the crocodile at Rome? Marcus Scaurus was the first who exhibited this animal at Rome, together with five crocodiles, at the games which he gave in his aedileship in a piece of water which had been temporarily prepared for the purpose. The hippopotamus has even been our instructor in one of the operations of medicine, when the animal has become too bulky by continued overfeeding, it goes down to the banks of the river and examines the reeds which have been newly cut. As soon as it has found a stump that is very sharp, it presses its body against it and so wounds one of the veins in the thigh and by the flow of blood thus produced, the body which would otherwise have fallen into a morbid state is relieved after which it covers up the wound with mud. Chapter 41. The Medicinal Remedies Which Have Been Borrowed from Animals The bird also, which is called the ibis, a native of the same country of Egypt, has shown us some things of a similar nature. By means of its hooked beak, it laves the body through that part by which it is especially necessary for health that the residuous food should be discharged nor indeed are these the only inventions which have been borrowed from animals to prove of use to man. The power of the herb dittany in extracting arrows was first disclosed to us by stags that had been struck by that weapon, the weapon being discharged on their feeding upon this plant. The same animals, too, when they happen to have been wounded by the phalagium, a species of spider, or by any insect of a similar nature, cure themselves by eating crabs. One of the very best remedies for the bite of the serpent is the plant with which lizards treat their wounds when injured in fighting with each other. The swallow has shown us that the Caledonia is very serviceable to the sight by the fact of its employing it for the cure of its young when their eyes are affected. The tortoise recruits its powers of effectually resisting serpents by eating the plant which is known as the cuneal bubula and the weasel feeds on rue when it fights with the serpent in the pursuit of mice. The stork cures itself of its diseases with wild marjoram, 
and the wild boar with ivy, as also by eating crabs, and more particularly those that have been thrown up by the sea. The snake, when the membrane which covers its body has been contracted by the cold of winter, throws it off in the spring by the aid of the juices of fennel, and thus becomes sleek and youthful in appearance. First of all, it disengages the head, and it then takes no less than a day and a night in working itself out, and divesting itself of the membrane in which it has been enclosed. The same animal, too, on finding its sight weakened during its winter retreat, anoints and refreshes its eyes by rubbing itself on the plant called fennel or marathrum. But if any of the scales are slow in coming off, it rubs itself against the thorns of the juniper. The dragon relieves the nausea which affects it in spring with the juices of the lettuce. The barbarous nations go to hunt the panther provided with meat that has been rubbed with aconite, which is a poison. Immediately on eating it, compression of the throat overtakes them, from which circumstance it is that the plant has received the name of part alianches. The animal, however, has found an antidote against this poison in human excrements, besides which it is so eager to get at them that the shepherds purposely suspend them in a vessel placed so high that the animal cannot reach them even by leaping when it endeavors to get at them. Accordingly, it continues to leap until it has quite exhausted itself, and at last expires. Otherwise, it is so tenacious of life that it will continue to fight long after its intestines have been dragged out of its body. When an elephant has happened to devour a chameleon, which is of the same color with the herbage, it counteracts this poison by means of the wild olive. Bears, when they have eaten of the fruit of the mandrake, lick up numbers of ants. The stag counteracts the effects of poisonous plants by eating the artichoke. Wood pigeons, jackdaws, blackbirds, and partridges purge themselves once a year by eating bay leaves. Pigeons, turtle doves, and poultry with wall pellitory or helk sign. Ducks, geese, and other aquatic birds with the plant sideritis or vervain. Cranes and birds of a similar nature with the bulrush. The raven, when it has killed a chameleon, a contest in which even the conqueror suffers, counteracts the poison by means of laurel. Chapter 42. Prognostics of Danger Derived from Animals. There are a thousand other facts of this kind, and the same nature has also bestowed upon many animals as well the faculty of observing the heavens and of presaging the winds, rains, and tempests, each in its own peculiar way. It would be an endless labor to enumerate them all, just as much as it would be to point out the relation of each to man. For, in fact, they warn us of danger not only by their fibers and their entrails, to which a large portion of mankind attach the greatest faith, but by other kinds of warnings as well. When a building is about to fall down, all the mice desert it beforehand, and the spiders with their webs are the first to drop. Divination from birds has been made a science among the Romans, and the college of its priests is looked upon as peculiarly sacred. In Thrace, when all parts are covered with ice, the foxes are consulted, an animal which, in other respects, is baneful from its craftiness. It has been observed that this animal applies its ear to the ice for the purpose of testing its thickness. Hence it is that the inhabitants will never cross frozen rivers and lakes until the foxes have passed over them and returned. Chapter 43. Nations that have been exterminated by animals. We have accounts, too, no less remarkable, in reference even to the most contemptible of animals. Marcus Varro informs us that a town in Spain was undermined by rabbits and one in Thessaly by mice that the inhabitants of a district in Gaul were driven from their country by frogs, and a place in Africa by locusts, that the inhabitants of Jarus, one of the Cyclades, were driven away by mice, and the Amicle of Italy by serpents. There is a vast desert tract on this side of the Ethiopian Sinomolgi, 
the inhabitants of which were exterminated by scorpions and venomous ants and theophrastus informs us that the people of rhotium were driven away by scalopendra but we must now return to the other kinds of wild beasts chapter forty four the hyena it is the vulgar notion that the hyena possesses in itself both sexes being a male during one year and a female the next and that it becomes pregnant without the cooperation of the male aristotle however denies this the neck with the mane runs continuously into the backbone so that the animal cannot bend this part without turning round the whole body many other wonderful things are also related of this animal and strangest of all that it imitates the human voice among the stalls of the shepherds and while there learns the name of some one of them and then calls him away and devours him it is said also that it can imitate a man vomiting and that in this way it attracts the dogs and then falls upon them it is the only animal that digs up graves in order to obtain the bodies of the dead the female is rarely caught its eyes it is said are of a thousand various colors and changes of shade it is said also that on coming in contact with its shadow dogs will lose their voice and that by certain magical influences it can render any animal immovable round which it has walked three times chapter forty five the coracoda the manticora by the union of the hyena with the ethiopian lioness the coracoda is produced which has the same faculty of imitating the voices of men and cattle its gaze is always fixed and immovable it has no gums in either of its jaws and the teeth are one continuous piece of bone they are enclosed in a sort of box as it were that they may not be blunted by rubbing against each other juba informs us that the manticora of ethiopia can also imitate the human speech chapter forty six wild asses great numbers of hyenas are produced in africa which also gives birth to multitudes of wild asses in this species each male rules over a herd of females fearing rivals in their lust they carefully watch the pregnant females and castrate the young males with their teeth as soon as they are born the pregnant females on the other hand seek concealment and endeavor to bring forth in secret being desirous to increase their opportunities of sexual indulgence chapter forty seven beavers amphibious animals otters the beavers of the euxine when they are closely pressed by danger themselves cut off the same part as they know that it is for this that they are pursued this substance is called castorium by the physicians in addition to this the bite of this animal is terrible with its teeth it can cut down trees on the banks of rivers just as though with a knife if they seize a man by any part of his body they will never loose their hold until his bones are broken and crackle under their teeth the tail is like that of a fish in the other parts of the body they resemble the otter they are both of them aquatic animals and both have hair softer than down End of section 22. Section 23 of The Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 23. Book 8, chapters 48 to 56. Chapter 48. Bramble Frogs. Bramble Frogs also, which live both on land and in water, are replete with various medicinal substances, which they are said to discharge each day and to take in again with their food of which they only retain the poisonous parts. Chapter 49. The sea calf, beavers, 
lizards. The sea calf, too, lives equally in the sea and on land, being possessed of the same degree of intelligence as the beaver. It vomits forth its gall, which is useful for many purposes in medicine. Also the rennet, which serves as a remedy in epilepsy, for it is well aware that it is hunted for these substances. Theophrastus informs us that lizards also cast their skins like the serpent and instantly devour them, thus depriving us of a powerful remedy for epilepsy. He says, too, that the bite of the lizard is fatal in Greece, but harmless in Italy. Chapter 50. Stags. Stags, although the most mild of all animals, have still their own feelings of malignancy. When hard pressed by the hounds, of their own accord they fly for refuge to man, and when the females bring forth, they are less anxious to avoid the paths which bear traces of human footsteps, and solitary spots which offer a retreat to wild beasts. They become pregnant after the rising of the constellation Arcturus. They bring forth after a gestation of eight months, and sometimes produce two young ones. They separate after conception, but the males, upon being thus abandoned, become maddened with the fury of their passion. They dig up the earth, and their muzzles become quite black, until they have been washed by the rain. The females, before they bring forth, purge themselves by means of a certain herb, which is called sessilis, by the use of which parturition is rendered more easy. After delivery, they take a mixture of the two plants called sessilis and aros, and then return to the fawn. They seem desirous, for some reason or other, that their first milk, after parturition, should be impregnated with the juice of these plants. They then exercise the young ones in running, and teach them how to take flight, leading them to precipices and showing them how to leap. The sexual passion of the male having been now satisfied, he repairs to the pasture lands with the greatest eagerness. When they feel themselves becoming too fat, they seek some retired spot, thus acknowledging the inconvenience arising from their bulk. Besides this, they continually pause in their flight, stand still and look back, and then again resume their flight when the enemy approaches. This pause is occasioned by the intense pain which they feel in the intestines, a part which is so weak that a very slight blow will cause them to break within. The barking of a dog instantly puts them to flight, and they always run with the wind in order that no trace of them may be left. They are soothed by the shepherd's pipe and his song. When their ears are erect, their sense of hearing is very acute, but when dropped they become deaf. In other respects the stag is a simple animal, which regards everything as wonderful, and with a stupid astonishment, so much so indeed, that if a horse or cow happens to approach it, it will not see the hunter who may be close at hand, or, if it does see him, it only gazes upon his bow and arrow. Stags cross the sea in herds, swimming in a long line, the head of each resting on the haunches of the one that precedes it, each in its turn falling back to the rear. This has been particularly remarked when they pass over from Sicilia to the island of Cyprus. Though they do not see the land, they still are able to direct themselves by the smell. The males have horns, and are the only animals that shed them every year, at a stated time in the spring, at which period they seek out with the greatest care the most retired places, and after losing them, remain concealed, as though aware that they are unarmed. Still, however, they envy us the good that these might do us, for it is said the right horn, which possesses, as it were, certain medicinal properties, can never be found, a circumstance the more astonishing from the fact that they change their horns every year, even when kept in parks. It is generally thought that they bury their horns in the ground. The odour of either horn, when burnt, drives away serpents and detects epilepsy. They also bear the marks of their age on the horns. Every year, up to the sixth, 
a fresh antler being added, after which period the horns are renewed in the same state, so that by means of them their age cannot be ascertained. Their old age, however, is indicated by their teeth, for then they have only a few or none at all, and we then no longer perceive, at the base of their horns, antlers projecting from the front of the forehead, as is usually the case with the animal when young. When this animal is castrated, it does not shed its horns, nor are they reproduced. When the horns begin to be reproduced, two projections are to be seen, much resembling at first dry skin. They grow with tender shoots, having upon them a soft down like that on the head of a reed. So long as they are without horns, they go to feed during the night. As the horns grow, they harden by the heat of the sun, and the animal, from time to time, tries their strength upon the trees. When satisfied with their strength, it leaves its retreat. Stags, too, have been occasionally caught with ivy green and growing on their horns, the plant having taken root on them, as it would on any piece of wood, while the animal was rubbing them against the trees. The stag is sometimes found white, as is said to have been the case with the hind of Q. Sertorius, which he persuaded the nations of Spain to look upon as having the gift of prophecy. The stag, too, fights with the serpent. It traces out the serpent's hole, and draws it forth by the breath of its nostrils, and hence it is that the smell of burned stag's horn has the remarkable power of driving away serpents. The very best remedy for the bite of a serpent is the rennet of a fawn that has been killed in the womb of its mother. The stag is generally admitted to be very long-lived. Some were captured at the end of one hundred years with the golden collars which Alexander the Great had put upon them, and which were quite concealed by the folds of the skin in consequence of the accumulation of fat. This animal is not subject to fever, and indeed it is a preservative against that complaint. We know that of late some women of princely rank have been in the habit of eating the flesh of the stag every morning, and that they have arrived at an extreme old age free from all fevers. It is, however, generally supposed that the animal must be killed by a single wound to make sure of it possessing this virtue. Of the same species, is an animal which only differs from the stag in having a beard and long hair about the shoulders. It is called Tragelaphus, and is produced nowhere except on the banks of the Phasis. Chapter 51. The Chameleon. Africa is almost the only country that does not produce the stag, but then it produces the chameleon, although it is much more commonly met with in India. Its figure and size are that of a lizard, only that its legs are straight and longer. Its sides unite under its belly, as in fishes, and its spine projects in a similar manner. Its muzzle is not unlike the snout of a small hog, so far as in so small an animal it can be. Its tail is very long, and becomes smaller towards the end, coiling up in folds like that of the viper. It has hooked claws, and a slow movement like that of the tortoise. Its body is rough like that of the crocodile, its eyes are deep sunk in the orbits, placed very near each other, very large, and of the same colour as the body. It never closes them, and when the animal looks round, it does so not by the motion of the pupil, but of the white of the eye. It always holds the head upright and the mouth open and is the only animal which receives nourishment neither by meat nor drink, nor anything else but from the air alone. Towards the end of the dog days it is fierce, but at other times quite harmless. The nature of its colour, too, is very remarkable, for it is continually changing, its eyes, its tail, and its whole body always assuming the colour of whatever object is nearest, with the exception of white and red. After death, it becomes of a pale colour. It has a little flesh about the head, the jaws, and the roots of the tail, but none whatever on the rest of the body. It has no blood whatever, except in the heart and about the eyes, and its entrails are without a spleen. 
It conceals himself during the winter months, just like the lizard. Chapter 52. Other Animals Which Change Colour The Tarandrus, the Lycaon, and the Thos The Tarandrus, too, of the Scythians, changes its colour. But this is the case with none of the animals which are covered with hair, except the Lycaon of India, which is said to have a mane on the neck. But with respect to the Thos, which is a species of wolf, differing from the common kind in having a larger body and very short legs, leaping with great activity, living by the chase and never attacking man, it changes its coat and not its colour, for it is covered with hair in the winter and goes bare in summer. The Tarandrus is of the size of the ox. Its head is larger than that of the stag, and not very unlike it. Its horns are branched, its hoofs cloven, and its hair as long as that of the bear. Its proper colour, when it thinks proper to return to it, is like that of the ass. Its hide is of such extreme hardness that it is used for making breastplates. When it is frightened, this animal reflects the colour of all the trees, shrubs and flowers, or of the spots in which it is concealed. Hence it is that it is so rarely captured. It is wonderful that such various hues should be given to the body, but still more so that it should be given to the hair. Chapter 53 The Porcupine India and Africa produce the porcupine, the body of which is covered with prickles. It is a species of hedgehog, but the quills of the porcupine are longer, and when it stretches the skin it discharges them like so many missiles. With these it pierces the mouths of the dogs which are pressing hard upon it, and even sends its darts to some distance further. It conceals itself during the winter months, which indeed is the nature of many animals, and more especially the bear. Chapter 54 Bears and Their Cubs Bears couple in the beginning of winter, and not after the fashion of other quadrupeds, for both animals lie down and embrace each other. The female then retires by herself to a separate den, and there brings forth on the thirtieth day mostly five young ones. When first born, they are shapeless masses of white flesh a little larger than mice, their claws alone being prominent. The mother then licks them gradually into proper shape. There is nothing more uncommon than to see a she-bear in the act of parturition. The male remains in his retreat for forty days, the female four months. If they happen to have no den, they construct a retreat with branches and shrubs, which is made impenetrable to the rain and is lined with soft leaves. During the first fourteen days they are overcome by so deep a sleep that they cannot be aroused by wounds even. They become wonderfully fat, too, while in this lethargic state. This fat is much used in medicine, and it is very useful in preventing the hair from falling off. At the end of these fourteen days they sit up and find nourishment by sucking their forepaws. They warm their cubs, when cold, by pressing them to the breast, not unlike the way in which birds brood over their eggs. It is a very astonishing thing, but Theophrastus believes it, that if we preserve the flesh of the bear, the animal being killed in its dormant state, it will increase in bulk, even though it may have been cooked. During this period no signs of food are to be found in the stomach of the animal, and only a very slight quantity of liquid. There are a few drops of blood only near the heart, but none whatever in any other part of the body. They leave their retreat in the spring, the males being remarkably fat. Of this circumstance, however, we cannot give any satisfactory explanation, for the sleep, during which they increase so much in bulk, lasts, as we have already stated, only fourteen days. When they come out, they eat a certain plant, which is known as aros, in order to relax the bowels, which would otherwise become in a state of constipation, and they sharpen the edges of their teeth against the young shoots of the trees. Their eyesight is dull, for which reason, in especial, they seek the combs of bees, in order that from the bees stinging them in the throat and drawing blood, 
the oppression in the head may be relieved. The head of the bear is extremely weak, whereas in the lion it is remarkable for its strength. On which account it is that when the bear, impelled by any alarm, is about to precipitate itself from a rock, it covers its head with its paws. In the arena of the circus, they are often to be seen killed by a blow on the head with the fist. The people of Spain have a belief that there is some kind of magical poison in the brain of the bear, and therefore burn the heads of those that have been killed in their public games. For it is averred that the brain, when mixed with drink, produces in man the rage of the bear. These animals walk on two feet and climb down trees backwards. They can overcome the bull by suspending themselves by all four legs from its muzzle and horns, thus wearing out its powers by their weight. In no other animal is stupidity found more adroit in devising mischief. It is recorded in our annals that on the fourteenth day before the calends of October, in the consulship of M. Piso and M. Messala, Domitius Ahenobarbus, the Curile Edile, brought into the circus one hundred Numidian bears, and as many Ethiopian hunters. I am surprised to find the word Numidian added, seeing that it is well known that there are no bears produced in Africa. Chapter 55 The Mice of Pontus and of the Alps The mice of Pontus also conceal themselves during the winter, but only the white ones, I wonder how those authors, who have asserted that the sense of taste in these animals is very acute, found out that such is a fact. The alpine mice, which are the same size as badgers, also conceal themselves, but they first carry a store of provisions into their retreat. Some writers, indeed, say that the male and female, lying on their backs alternately, hold in their paws a bundle of gnawed herbs and, the tail of each in its turn being seized by the teeth of the other, in this way they are dragged into their hole. Hence it is that at this season their hair is to be found rubbed off their backs. There is a similar animal also in Egypt, which sits in the same way upon its haunches, and walks on two feet, using the four feet as hands. Chapter 56 Hedgehogs Hedgehogs also lay up food for the winter. Rolling themselves on apples as they lie on the ground, they pierce one with their quills, and then take up another in the mouth, and so carry them into the hollows of trees. These animals also, when they conceal themselves in their holes, afford a sure sign that the wind is about to change from northeast to south. When they perceive the approach of the hunter, they draw in the head and feet, and all the lower part of the body, which is covered by a thin and defenceless down only, and then roll themselves up into the form of a ball, so that there is no way of taking hold of them but by their quills. When they are reduced to a state of desperation, they discharge a corrosive urine, which injures their skin and quills, as they are aware that it is for the sake of them that they are hunted. A skilful hunter, therefore, will only pursue them when they have just discharged their urine. In this case the skin retains its value, while in the other case it becomes spoilt and easily torn, the quills rotting and falling off, even though the animal should escape with its life. For this reason it is that it never moistens itself with this poisonous fluid, except when reduced to the last stage of desperation, for it has a perfect hatred for its own venomous distillation, and so careful is the animal so determined to wait till the very last moment that it is generally caught before it has employed this means of defence. They force it to enrol itself by sprinkling warm water upon it, and then, suspended by one of its hind legs, it is left to die of hunger, for there is no other mode of destroying it without doing injury to its skin. This animal is not, as many of us imagine, entirely useless to man. If it were not for the quills which it produces, the soft fleece of the sheep would have been given in vain to mankind, for it is by means of its skin that our woollen cloth is dressed. From the monopoly of this article, great frauds and great profits have resulted. There is no subject on which the Senate has more frequently passed decrees, and there is not one of the emperors who has not received from the provinces complaints respecting it.
End of section 23. Section 24 of The Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vinnie Tesla. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 24. Chapter 57. The Leontophonus and the Lynx. There are also two other animals whose urine possesses very wonderful properties. We have heard speak of a small animal to which the name of Leontophonus has been given, and which is said to exist only in those countries where the lion is produced. If its flesh is only tasted by the lion, so intensely venomous is its nature that this lord of the other quadrupeds instantly expires. Hence it is that the hunters of the lion burn its body to ashes and sprinkle a piece of flesh with the powder, and so kill the lion by means of the ashes even. So fatal to it is this poison. The lion, therefore, not without good reason, hates the Leontophonus, and after destroying its sight, kills it without inflicting a bite. The animal, on the other hand, sprinkles the lion with its urine, being well aware that this too is fatal to it. The urine of the lynx, in the countries where that animal is produced, either becomes crystallized, or else hardens into a precious stone resembling the carbuncle, and which shines like fire. This is called lincurium, and hence it is that many persons believe that this is the way in which amber is produced. The lynx, being well aware of this property, envies us the possession of its urine, and therefore buries it in the earth. By this, however, it becomes solid all the sooner. Chapter 58. Badgers and Squirrels The badger, when alarmed, shows its fear by a different kind of artifice. Inflating the skin, it distends it to such a degree as to repel equally the blows of men and the bite of dogs. The squirrel, also, has the power of foreseeing storms, and so, stopping up its hole at the side from which the wind blows, it leaves the other side open, besides which the tail, which is furnished with longer hair than the rest of the body, serves it as covering for it. It appears, therefore, that some animals lay up a store of food for the winter, while others pass the time in sleep, which serves them instead of food. Chapter 59. Vipers and Snails It is said that the viper is the only one among the serpents that conceals itself in the earth the others lurking either in the hollows of trees or in holes in the rocks. Provided they are not destroyed by cold, they can live there without taking food for a whole year. During the time that they are asleep in their retreat, none of them are venomous. A similar state of torpor exists also in snails. These animals again become dormant during the summer, adhering very powerfully to stones, and even when turned up and pulled away from the stones, they will not leave their shells. In the Balearic Islands, the snails which are known as the cave snail do not leave their holes in the ground, nor do they feed upon any green thing, but adhere to each other like so many grapes. There is another less common species also, which is closed by an operculum that adheres to the shell. These animals always burrow under the earth, and were formerly never found except in the environs of the Maritime Alps. They have, however, of late been dug up in the territory of the Ternium. The most valued, however, of all, are those of the island of Astapthea. Chapter 60. Lizards. It is said that the lizard, the greatest enemy of all to the snail, never prolongs its life beyond six months. The lizards of Arabia are a cubit in length, while those upon Nysa, a mountain of India, are twenty-four feet long, their color being either yellow, purple, or azure blue. Chapter 61. The qualities of the dog, examples of its attachment to its master, nations which have kept dogs for the purposes of war. Among the animals also that are domesticated with mankind, there are many circumstances that are far from undeserving of being known. Among these, there are more particularly that most faithful friend of man, 
The Dog and the Horse We have an account of a dog that fought against a band of robbers in defending its master, and although it was pierced with wounds, still it would not leave the body, from which it drove away all birds and beasts. Another dog, again in Epirius, recognized the murderer of its master in the midst of an assemblage of people, and, by biting and barking at him, extorted from him a confession of his crime. A king of the Garamantes also was brought back from exile by two hundred dogs, which maintained the combat against all his opponents. The people of Colophon and Castabala kept troops of dogs for the purpose of war and those used to fight in the front rank and never retreat they were the most faithful of auxiliaries and yet required no pay after the defeat of the kimbiri their dogs defended their movable houses which were carried upon wagons jason the lycian having been slain his dog refused to take food and died of famine a dog to which darius gave the name hyrenaeus upon the funeral pile of King Lysimachus being blighted, threw itself into the flames, and the dog of King Hiero did the same. Philistius also gives a similar account of Pyrrhus, the dog of the tyrant Galon, and it is said also that the dog of Nicomedes, King of Bithynia, tore Consignus, the wife of the king, in consequence of her wanton behavior when toying with her husband. Among ourselves, Volcatius, a man of rank, who instructed Caecilius in the civil law, as he was riding on his Asturian genet toward evening from his country house, was attacked by a robber, and was only saved by his dog. The senator Caelius, too, while lying sick at Placentia, was surprised by armed men, but received not a wound from them until they had first killed his dog. But a more extraordinary fact than all is what took place in our own times and is testified by the public register of the roman people in the consulship of apius junius and p Silius, when titus sabinius was put to death together with his slaves for the affair of nero the son of germanicus it was found impossible to drive away a dog which belonged to one of them from the prison nor could it be forced away from the body which had been cast down the germatorian steps but there it stood howling in the presence of vast multitudes of people, and when someone threw a piece of bread to it, the animal carried it to the mouth of its master. Afterwards, when the body was thrown into the Tiber, the dog swam into the river and endeavored to raise it out of the water, quite a throng of people being collected to witness this instance of an animal's fidelity. Dogs are the only animals that are sure to know their masters, and if they suddenly meet him as a stranger, they will instantly recognize him. They are the only animals that will answer to their names and recognize the voices of the family. They recollect a road along which they have passed, however long it may be. Next to man, there is no living creature whose memory is so retentive. By sitting down on the ground, we may arrest their most impetuous attack, even when prompted by the most violent rage. In daily life, we have discovered many other valuable qualities in this animal, but its intelligence and sagacity are more especially shown in the chase. It discovers and traces out the tracks of the animal, leading by the leash the sportsman who accompanies it straight to the prey, and as soon as ever it has perceived it, how silent it is and how secret but significant is the indication which it gives, first by the tail and afterwards by the nose. Hence it is that even when worn out with old age, blind and feeble, they are carried by the huntsman in his arms, being still able to point out the coverts where the game is concealed, by snuffing with their muzzles at the wind. The Indians raise a breed between the dog and the tiger, and for this purpose tie up the females in the forest when in heat. The first two litters they look upon as too savage to be reared, but they bring up the third. The Gauls do the same with the wolf and the dog, and their packs of hounds have, each of them, one of those dogs, which acts as their guide and leader. This dog they follow in the chase, and him they carefully obey, for these animals have even a notion of subordination among themselves. It is asserted that the dogs keep running when they drink at the Nile, for fear of them becoming prey to the voracity of crocodiles. When Alexander the Great was on his Indian expedition, he was presented by the king of Albania with a dog of unusual size. 
being greatly delighted with its noble appearance, he ordered bears, and after them wild boars and then deer, to be let loose before it. But the dog lay down, and regarded them with a kind of immovable contempt. The noble spirit of the general became irritated by the sluggishness thus manifested by an animal of such vast bulk, and he ordered it to be killed. The report of this reached the king, who accordingly sent another dog, and at the same time sent word that its powers were to be tried not upon small animals, but upon the lion or the elephant, adding that he had had originally but two, and that if this one were put to death, the race would be extinct. Alexander, without delay, procured a lion, which in his presence was instantly torn to pieces. He then ordered an elephant to be brought, and never was he more delighted with any spectacle. For the dog, bristling up its hair all over the body, began by thundering forth a loud barking, and then attacked the animal, leaping at it first on one side and then on the other, attacking it in the most skillful manner, and then again retreating at the opportune moment, until at last the elephant, being rendered quite giddy by turning round and round, fell to the earth and made it quite re-echo with his fall. Chapter 62 the generation of the dog. This animal brings forth twice in the year. It is capable of bearing young when a year old, and gestation continues for sixty days. The young ones are born blind, and the greater the supply of nourishment from the mother's milk, the more slowly do they acquire their sight. Still, however, this never takes place later than the twentieth day, or earlier than the seventh. It is said by some writers that if only one is born, it is able to see on the ninth day and that if there are two they begin to see on the tenth every additional one causing the power of seeing to come a day later it is said too that the females which are produced by the mother in her first litter are subject to the nightmare the best dog of the litter is the one which is last in obtaining its sight or else the one which the mother carries first into her bed chapter sixty three remedies against canine madness Canine madness is fatal to man during the heat of Sirius, and, as we have already said, it proves so in consequence of those who are bitten having a deadly horror of water. For this reason, during the thirty days that this star exerts its influence, we try to prevent the disease by mixing dung from the poultry-yard with the dog's food, or else, if they are already attacked by the disease, by giving them hellebore. We have a single remedy against the bite, which has been but lately discovered, by a kind of oracle, as it were. The root of the wild rose, which is called Sinorhodos, or dog rose. Colomela informs us that, if on the fortieth day after the birth of the pup, the last bone of the tail is bitten off, the sinew will follow with it, after which the tail will not grow, and the dog will never become rabid. It is mentioned among the other prodigies, and this I take to be one indeed, that a dog once spoke, and that when Tarquin was expelled from the kingdom, a serpent barked. Chapter 64. The Nature of the Horse King Alexander had also a very remarkable horse. It was called Bucephalus, either on account of the fierceness of its aspect, or because it had the figure of a bull's head marked on its shoulder. It is said that he was struck with its beauty when he was only a boy, and that it was purchased from the stud of Philonicus, the Pharsalian, for thirteen talents. When it was equipped with the royal trappings, it would suffer no one except Alexander to mount it, although at other times it would allow anyone to do so. A memorable circumstance connected with it in battle is recorded of this horse. It is said that when it was wounded in the attack upon Thebes, it would not allow Alexander to mount any other horse. Many other circumstances also of a similar nature occurred respecting it, so that when it died, the king duly performed its obsequies and built around its tomb a city, which he named after it. It is said also that Caesar, the dictator, had a horse which would allow no one to mount but himself, and that its forefeet were like those of a man. Indeed, it is thus represented in the statue before the temple of Venus Genetrix. The late Emperor Augustus also erected a tomb of his horse, 
on which occasion Germanicus Caesar wrote a poem which still exists. There are, at Agrigentum, many tombs of horses in the form of pyramids. Juba informs us that Semiramis was so greatly enamored of a horse as to have had connection with it. The Scythian horsemen made loud boasts of the fame of their cavalry. On one occasion, one of their chiefs having been slain in single combat, when the conqueror came to take the spoils of the enemy, he was set upon by the horse of his opponent, and trampled on and bitten to death. Another horse, upon the bandage being removed from his eyes, found that he had covered his mother, upon which he threw himself down a precipice and was killed. We learn also that for a similar cause a groom was torn to pieces in the territory of Reata. For these animals have a knowledge of the ties of consanguinity, and in a stud a mare will attend to its sister of the preceding year even more carefully than its mother. Their docility, too, is so great that we find it stated that the whole of the cavalry of the Sybarite army were accustomed to perform a kind of dance to the sound of musical instruments. These animals also foresee battles. They lament over their masters when they have lost them, and sometimes shed tears of regret for them. When King Nicomedes was slain, his horse put an end to its life by fasting. Philarchus relates that Centoratus the Galatian, after he had slain Antiochus in battle, took possession of his horse and mounted it in triumph, upon which the animal, inflamed with indignation, regardless of the rain and become quite ungovernable, threw itself headlong down a precipice, and they both perished together. Philistius reports that Dionysius, having left his horse stuck fast in a morass, that animal, as soon as it disengaged itself, followed the steps of its master with a swarm of bees which had settled in its mane, and that it was in consequence of this portent that Dionysius gained possession of the kingdom. Chapter 65. The Disposition of the Horse. Remarkable Facts Concerning Chariot Horses. These animals possess an intelligence which exceeds all description. Those who have to use the javelin are well aware how the horse, by its exertions, and by the supple movements of its body, aids the rider in any difficulty he may have in throwing his weapon. They will even present to their master the weapons collected on the ground. The horses, too, that are yoked to the chariots in the circus, beyond a doubt, display remarkable proofs how sensible they are to encouragement and to glory. In the secular games, which were celebrated in the circus under the emperor Claudius, when the charioteer Corax, who belonged to the white party, was thrown from his place at the starting post, his horses took the lead and kept it, opposing the other chariots, overturning them, and doing everything against the other competitors that could have been done, had they been guided by the most skilful charioteer. And while we quite blushed to behold the skill of man excelled by that of the horse, they arrived at the goal after going over the whole of the prescribed course. Our ancestors considered it a still more remarkable portent that when a charioteer had been thrown from his place in the plebeian games of the circus, the horses ran to the capital just as if he had been standing in the car and went three times round the temple there. But what is the greatest prodigy of all? is the fact that the horses of Ramatumena came from Vei to Rome, with the palm, branch, and chaplet, he himself having fallen from his chariot after having gained the victory, from which circumstance the Ramatumenan gate derived its name. When the Sarmatai are about to undertake a long journey, they prepare their horses for it by making them fast the day before, during which they give them but little to drink, by these means are they enabled to travel on horseback without stopping for one hundred and fifty miles. Some horses are known to live fifty years, but the females are not so long-lived. These last come to their full growth at the fifth year, the males a year later. The poet Virgil had very beautifully described the points which ought more especially to be looked for as constituting the perfection of a horse. I myself have also treated of the same subject in my work on the use of the javelin by cavalry, and I find that pretty nearly all writers are agreed respecting them. The points requisite for the circus are somewhat different, however, and while horses are put in training for other purposes at only two years old, they are not admitted to the contest of the circus before their fifth year. 
Chapter 66. The Generation of the Horse. The female of this animal carries her young for eleven months and brings forth in the twelfth. The connection takes place at the vernal equinox, and generally in both sexes at the age of two years. But the colt is much stronger when the parents are three years old. The males are capable of covering up to the thirty-third year, and it is not till after the twentieth that they are taken for this purpose from the circus. At Opus, it is said, a horse served as a stallion until his fortieth year, though he required some assistance in raising the forepart of his body. There are few animals, however, in which the generative powers are so limited, for which reason it is only admitted to the female at certain intervals. Indeed, it cannot cover as many as fifteen times in the course of one year. The sexual passion of the mare is extinguished by cropping her mane. She is capable of bearing every year up to the fortieth. We have an account of a horse having lived up to its seventy-fifth year. The mare brings forth standing upright, and is attached beyond all other animals to her offspring. The horse is born with a poisonous substance on its forehead, known as hippomanes, and used in love filters. It is the size of a fig, and of a black color. The mother devours it immediately on the birth of the foal, and until she has done so she will not suckle it. When this substance can be rescued from the mother, it has the property of rendering the animal quite frantic by the smell. If a foal has lost its mother, the other mares in the herd that have young will take charge of the orphan. It is said that the young of this animal cannot touch the earth with the mouth for the first three days after its birth. The more spirited a horse is, the deeper does it plunge its nose into the water while drinking. The Scythians prefer mares for the purpose of war, because they can pass their urine without stopping in their career. Chapter 67. Mares Impregnated by the Wind It is well known that in Lusitania, in the vicinity of the town Odysipo and the river Tagus, the mares, by turning their faces toward the west wind as it blows, become impregnated by its breezes, and that the foals which are conceived in this way are remarkable for their extreme fleetness, but they never live beyond three years. Galicia and Asturia are also countries of Spain, and they produce a species of horse known as Theodones, and when smaller, Astercones. They have a peculiar and not common pace of their own, which is very easy, and arises from the two legs of the same side being moved together. It is by studying the nature of this step that our horses have been taught the movement which we call ambling. Horses have very nearly the same diseases as men, besides which they are subject to an irregular action of the bladder, as indeed is the case with all beasts of burden. Chapter 68. The Ass, Its Generation. M. Varro informs us that Quintus Axius, the senator, paid for an ass the sum of four hundred thousand surstices. I am not sure whether this did not exceed the price ever given for any other animal. It is certainly a species of animal singularly useful for labor and ploughing, but more especially for the production of mules. In these animals also the country in which they are born is taken into consideration. In Greece those from Arcadia are the most valued, and in Italy those from Riate. The ass is an animal which is unable to endure cold, for which reason it is never produced in Pontus, nor is it allowed to cover at the vernal equinox, like other cattle, but at the summer solstice. The males are less proper for covering when out of work. The earliest age at which the females are ever capable of bearing is the thirtieth month, but the usual time begins at the age of three years. The number to which it gives birth is the same as the mare, which it also resembles in the length of its gestation and the mode of bringing forth, but the female will discharge the generative fluid from the womb, being unable to retain it, unless by blows she is forced to run immediately after being covered. They seldom bring forth two at birth. When the she-ass is about to bring forth, she shuns the light and seeks darkness, in order to escape the observation of man. Asses are capable of breeding throughout the whole of their life, which extends to thirty years. Their attachment to their young is great in the extreme but their aversion to water is still greater. They will pass through fire to get at their foals, while the very same animal, if the smallest stream intervenes, will tremble and not dare so much as to wet even its feet. 
nor yet in their pastures will they ever drink at any but the usual watering-place, and they make it their care to find some dry path by which to get at it. They will not pass over a bridge, either, when the water can be seen between the planks beneath. Wonderful to relate, too, if their watering-places are changed, though they should be ever so thirsty, they will not drink without being either beaten or caressed. They ought always to have plenty of room for sleeping, for they are very subject to various diseases in their sleep, when they repeatedly throw out their feet, and would immediately lame themselves by coming into contact with any hard substance, so that it is necessary that they should be provided with an empty space. The profit which is derived from these animals exceeds that arising from the richest estate. It is a well-known fact that in Celtiberia there are some she-asses which have produced to their owners as much as four hundred thousand surstices. In the rearing of she-mules it is said to be particularly necessary to attend to the color of the hair, of the ears and eyelids, for, although the rest of the body be all of one color, the mule that is produced will have all the colors that are found in those parts. Mycenas was the first person who had the young of the ass served up at his table. They were in those times much preferred to the onager or wild ass, but since his time the taste has gone out of fashion. An ass, after witnessing the death of another ass, survives it but a very short time only. Chapter 69 The Nature of Mules and of Other Beasts of Burden From the union of the male ass and the mare, a mule is produced in the thirteenth month an animal remarkable for its strength in laborious work. We are told that for this purpose the mare ought not to be less than four years old, nor more than ten. It is said also that these two species will repulse each other, unless the male has been brought up in its infancy upon the milk of the other species, for which reason they take the foals away from the mare in the dark, and substitute for them the male colts of the ass. A mule may also be produced from a horse and a female ass, but it can never be properly broken in, and is incorrigibly sluggish, being in all respects as slow as an old animal. If a mare has conceived by a horse, and is afterwards covered by an ass, the first conception is abortive, but this is not the case when the horse comes after the ass. It has been observed that the female is in the best state for receiving the male, in the seventh day after parturition and that the males are best adapted for the purpose when they are fatigued a female ass which has not conceived before shedding what are called the milk teeth is considered to be barren which is also looked upon as the case when a she ass does not become pregnant after the first covering a male which is produced from a horse and a female ass was called by the ancients hinulus and that from an ass and a mare mulus it has been observed the animal which is thus produced by the union of the two species is of a third species, and does not resemble either of the parents, and that all animals produced this way, of whatever kind they may be, are incapable of reproduction. She-mules are therefore barren. It is said indeed in our annals that they have frequently brought forth, but such cases must be looked upon only as prodigies. Theophrastus says that they are commonly brought forth in Cappadocia but that the animal of that country is of a peculiar species. The mule is prevented from kicking by frequently giving it wine to drink. It is said in the works of many of the Greek writers that from the union of a mule with a mare, the dwarf mule is produced, which they call genus. From the union of the mare and the wild ass, when it has been domesticated, a mule is produced, which is remarkably swift in running, and has extremely hard feet and a thin body, while it has a spirit that is quite indomitable. The very best stallion of all, however, for this purpose, is one produced from the union of the wild ass and the female domesticated ass. The best wild asses are those of Phrygia and Lycaonia. Africa glories in the wild foals which she produces as excelling all others in flavor. These are called lalisones. It appears from some Athenian records that a mule once lived to the age of eighty years. The people were greatly delighted with this animal, because on one occasion, when, on the building of a temple in the citadel, it had been left behind on account of its age, it persisted in promoting the work by accompanying and assisting them, in consequence of which a decree was passed that the dealers in corn were not to drive it away from their sieves. End of section 24 Recording by Vinnie Tesla of VinnieTesla.com
Section 25 of the Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ted Garvin. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 25. Chapter 70. 45. Oxen, their generation. We find it stated that the oxen of India are of the height of camels, and that the extremity of their horns are four feet asunder. In our part of the world, the most valuable oxen are those of Epirus, owing, it is said, to the attention paid to their breed by King Pyrrhus. This perfection was acquired by not permitting them to breed until after their fourth year. By these means, he brought them to a very large size, and descendants of this breed are still to be seen at the present day. But in our times, we set heifers to breed in their first year, or at the latest, in their second. Bulls are fit for breeding in their fourth year, one being sufficient, it is said, for ten cows during the whole year. If the bull, after covering, goes to the right side, the produce will be a male. If to the left, a female. Conception takes place after a single union, but if, by any accident, it should not have taken place, the cow seeks the male again at the end of twenty days. She brings forth in the tenth month. Whatever may be produced before that time cannot be reared. Some writers say that the birth takes place the very day on which the tenth month is completed. This animal but rarely produces twins. The time of covering begins at the rising of the dolphin, the day before the nones of January, and continues for the space of thirty days. Sometimes it takes place in the autumn, and among those nations which live upon milk, they manage so as to have a supply of it at all times of the year. Bulls never cover more than twice in the same day. The ox is the only animal that walks backwards while it is feeding. Among the Garamantes, they feed in no other manner. The females live fifteen years at the longest, and the males twenty. They arrive at their full vigor in their fifth year. It is said that they are made fat by being washed in warm water, or by having the entrails inflated with air by means of a reed, introduced through an incision in the skin. We must not look upon those kinds as having degenerated, the appearance of which is not so favorable. Those that are bred in the Alps, although very small of body, give a great quantity of milk, and are capable of enduring much labor. They are yoked by the horns, and not by the neck. The oxen of Syria have no dewlap, but they have a hump on the back. Those of Caria also, which is in Asia, are unsightly in appearance, having a hump hanging over the shoulders from the neck, and their horns are movable. They are said, however, to be excellent workers, though those which are either black or white are condemned as worthless for labor. The horns of the bull are shorter and thinner than those of the ox. Oxen must be broken in when they are three years old. After that time it is too late, and before that time too early. The ox is most easily broken in by yoking it with one that has already been trained. This animal is our especial companion, both in labor generally and in the operations of agriculture. Our ancestors considered it of so much value that there is an instance cited of a man being brought before the Roman people on a day appointed and condemned for having killed an ox, in order to humor an impotent concubine of his, who said that she had never tasted tripe, and he was driven into exile, just as though he had killed one of his own peasants. The bull has a proud air, a stern forehead, shaggy ears, and horns which appear always ready, and challenging to the combat. But it is by his four feet that he manifests his threatening anger. As his rage increases, he stands, lashing back his tail every now and then, and throwing up the sand against his belly, being the only animal that excites himself by these means. We have seen them fight at the word of command, and shown as a public spectacle. These bulls whirled about and then fell upon their horns, and at once were up again. Then, at other times, they would lie upon the ground and let themselves be lifted up. They would even stand in a two-horse chariot while moving at a rapid rate, like so many charioteers. The people of Thessaly invented a method of killing bulls by means of a man on horseback, who would ride up to them and seize one of the horns, and so twist their neck. 
Caesar the dictator was the first person who exhibited the spectacle at Rome. Bulls are selected as the very choicest of victims, and are offered up as the most approved sacrifice for appeasing the gods. Of all the animals that have long tails, this is the only one whose tail is not of proportionate length at the moment of birth, and in this animal alone it continues to grow until it reaches its heels. It is on this account that in making choice of a calf for a victim, due care is taken that its tail reaches to the pastor and joint. If it is shorter than this, the sacrifice is not deemed acceptable to the gods. This fact has also been remarked, that calves, which have been carried to the altar on men's shoulders, are not generally acceptable to the gods, and also, if they are lame, or of a species which is not appropriate, or if they struggle to get away from the altar. It was a not uncommon prodigy among the ancients, for an ox to speak. Upon such a fact being announced to the senate, they were in the habit of holding a meeting in the open air. Chapter 71. 46. The Egyptian Apis. In Egypt, an ox is even worshipped as a deity. They call it Apis. It is distinguished by a conspicuous white spot on the right side, in the form of a crescent. There is a knot also under the tongue, which is called cantharus. This ox is not allowed to live beyond a certain number of years. It is then destroyed by being drowned in the fountain of the priest. They then go, amid general mourning, and seek another ox to replace it, and the mourning is continued, with their heads shaved, until such time as they have found one. It is not long, however, at any time, before they meet with a successor. When one has been found, it is brought by the priest to Memphis. There are two temples appropriated to it, which are called Thalami, and to these the people resort to learn the auguries. According as the ox enters the one or the other of these places, the augury is deemed favorable or unfavorable. It gives answers to individuals by taking food from the hand of those who consult it. It turned away from the hand of Germanicus Caesar, and not long after he died. In general, it lives in secret, but when it comes forth in public, the multitudes make way for it, and it is attended by a crowd of boys, singing hymns in honor of it. It appears to be sensible of the adoration thus paid to it, and to court it. These crowds, too, suddenly become inspired, and predict future events. Once in the year, a female is presented to the ox, which likewise has her appropriate marks, although different from those on the male, and it is said that she is always killed the very same day that they find her. There is a spot in the Nile, near Memphis, which, from its figure, they call Fiala. Here they throw into the water a dish of gold, and another of silver, every year upon the days on which they celebrate the birth of Apis. These days are seven in number, and it is a remarkable thing that during this time no one is ever attacked by the crocodile. On the eighth day, however, after the sixth hour, these beasts resume all their former ferocity. Chapter 72, 47. Sheep and their Propagation. Many thanks, too, do we owe to the sheep, both for appeasing the gods and for giving us the use of its fleece. As oxen cultivate the fields which yield food for man, so do sheep are we indebted for the defense of our bodies. The generative power lasts in both sexes from the second to the ninth year, sometimes to the tenth. The lambs produced at the first birth are but small. The season for coupling, and all of them, is from the setting of Arcturus, that is to say, the third day before the Ides of May, to the setting of Aquila, the tenth day before the calends of August. The period of gestation is one hundred and fifty days. The lambs that are produced after this time are feeble. The ancients called those that were born after it cordy. Many persons prefer the lambs that are born in the winter to those of the spring, because it is of much more consequence that they should have gained strength before the summer solstice than before the winter one. Consequently, the sheep is the only animal that is benefited by being born in the middle of winter. It is the nature of the ram to reject the young, and prefer the old ones, and he himself is more serviceable when old, and when deprived of his horns. He is also rendered less violent by having one horn pierced towards the ear. If the right testicle is tied up, the ram will generate females, and if the left, males. The noise of thunder produces abortion in sheep, if they are left alone. To prevent such accidents, they are brought together into flocks, that they may be rendered less timid by being in company. When the northeast wind blows, males are said to be conceived, and when the south wind, females. In this kind of animal, the mouth of the ram is especially looked to, for whatever may be the color of the veins under the tongue, the wool of the young one will be of a similar color. 
if these veins are many in number it will be mottled any change too in their water or drink will render them mottled there are two principal kinds of sheep the covered and the colonic or common sheep the former is the more tender animal but the latter is more nice about its pastures for these covered sheep will feed on brambles even the best coverings for sheep are brought from arabia chapter seventy three forty three the different kinds of wool and their colors the most esteemed wool of all is that of a capulia and that which in italy is called grecian wool in other countries italian the fleeces of Miletus hold the third rank. The Apulian wool is shorter in the hair, and only owes its high character to the cloaks that are made of it. That which comes from the vicinity of Tarentum and Canusium is the most celebrated, and there is a wool from Laodicea, in Asia, of a similar quality. There is no white wool superior to that of the countries bordering on the Patus, nor up to the present day has any wool exceeded the price of 100 sesterces per pound. The sheep are not shorn in all countries. In some places it is still the custom to pull off the wool. There are various colors of wool, so much so, indeed, that we want terms to express them all. Several kinds, which are called native, are found in Spain. Palencia, in the vicinity of the Alps, produces black fleeces of the best quality. Asia, as well as Boetica, the red fleeces, which are called erythrian. Those of Canusium are of a tawny color and those of Tarentum have their peculiar dark tint. All kinds of wool, when not freed from the grease, possess certain medicinal properties. The wool of Istria is much more like hair than wool, and is not suitable for the fabrication of stuffs that have a long nap. So too is that which Silesia and Lusitania finds the most useful for making its checkered cloths. There is a similar wool, too, found about Pisene, in the province of Narbonensis, as also in Egypt. A garment, when it has been worn for some time, is often embroidered with this wool, and will last for a considerable time. The thick, flocky wool has been esteemed for the manufacture of carpets from the very earliest times. It is quite clear, from what we read in Homer, that they were in use in his time. The Gauls embroider them in a different manner from that which is practiced by the Parthians. Wool is compressed also for making a felt, which, if soaked in vinegar, is capable of resisting iron even, and, what is still more, after having gone through the last process, wool will even resist fire. The refuse, too, when taken out of the vat of the scourer, is used for making mattresses, an invention, I fancy, of the Gauls. At all events, it is by Gallic names that we distinguish the different sorts of mattresses at the present day, but I am not well able to say at what period wool began to be employed for this purpose. Our ancestors made use of straw for the purpose of sleeping upon, just as they do at present when in camp. The gossapa has been brought into use in my father's memory, and I myself recollect the amphimala and the long shaggy apron being introduced. But at the present day, the latticlav tunic is beginning to be manufactured in imitation of the gossapa. Black wool will take no color. I shall describe the mode of dyeing the other kinds of wool when speaking of the sea purple or of the nature of various plants. Chapter 74. Different Kinds of Cloths Varro informs us, he himself having been an eyewitness, that in the temple of Sancus the wool was still preserved on the distaff and spindle of Tanaquil, who was also called Caia Cassilia, and he says that the royal wave toga, formerly worn by Servius Tullius, and now the temple of fortune, was made by her. Hence was derived the custom, on the marriage of a young woman, of carrying in the procession a dress distaff and a spindle, with the thread arranged upon it. Tanaquil was the first who wove the straight tunic, such as our young people wear with the white toga. Newly married women also. Waved garments were at first the most esteemed of all, after which those composed of various colors came into vogue. Finistella informs us that togas with a smooth surface as well as the Frixian togas, began to be used in the latter part of the reign of Augustus. Thick stuffs, in the preparation of which the poppy was used, are of more ancient date, being mentioned by the poet Lucilius, in his lines on Torquatus. The pretexta had its origin among the Etrurians. I find the trabia was first worn by the kings. Embroidered garments are mentioned by Homer, and in this class originated the triumphal robes. 
The Phrygians first used the needle for this purpose, and hence this kind of garment obtained the name of Phrygigonian. King Attalus, who also lived in Asia, invented the art of embroidering with gold, from which these garments have been called Attalic. Babylon was very famous for making embroidery in different colors, and hence stuffs of this kind have obtained the name of Babylonian. The method of weaving cloth with more than two threads was invented at Alexandria. These cloths are called palmita. It was in Gaul that they were first divided into checkers. Metellus Scipio, in the accusation which he brought against Cato, stated that even in his time Babylonian covers for couches were selling for 800,000 sesterces, and these of late, in the time of the Emperor Nero, had risen to four millions. The Protexte of Servius Tullius, with which the Statue of Fortune, dedicated by him, was covered, lasted until the death of Sejanus, and it is a remarkable fact that, during a period of 560 years, they had never become tattered, or received injury from moths. I myself have seen the fleece upon the living animal dyed purple, scarlet, and violet, a pound and a half of dye being used for each, just as though they had been produced by nature in this form, to meet the demands of luxury. Chapter 75. The Different Shapes of Sheep. The Mosmon. In the sheep, it is considered a proof of its being of a very fair breed, when the legs are short, and the belly is covered with wool. When this part is bare, they used to be called apici and were looked upon as worthless. The tail of the Syrian sheep is a cubit in length, and it is upon that part that most of the wool is found. It is considered too early to castrate lambs before they are five months old. There is in Spain, and more especially in Corsica, a peculiar kind of animal called the musmon, not very unlike a sheep, but with a fleece which more resembles the hair of the goat than the wool of the sheep. The ancients gave the name of Umbri to the breed between this animal and the sheep, the head of the sheep is the weakest part of all, on which account it is obliged, when it feeds, to turn away from the sun. The animals which are covered with wool are the most stupid of all. When they are afraid to enter any place, if one is only dragged into it by the horns, all the rest will follow. The longest duration of their life is ten years, but in Ethiopia it is thirteen. Goats live in that country eleven years, but in other parts of the world mostly eight years only. Both of these animals require to be covered not more than four times to ensure conception. Chapter 76. 50. Goats and their propagation. The goat occasionally brings forth as many as four at a birth, but this is rarely the case. It is pregnant five months, like the sheep. Goats become barren when very fat. There is little advantage to be derived from their bringing forth before their third year, or after the fourth, when they begin to grow old. They are capable of generating in the seventh month, and while they are still sucking. In both sexes, those that have no horns are considered the most valuable. A single coupling in the day is not sufficient. The second and the following ones are more effectual. They conceive in the month of November, so as to bring forth in the month of March, when the buds are bursting. This is sometimes the case with them when only one year old, and always with those of the second year. But the produce of those which are three years old is the most valuable. They continue to bring forth for a period of eight years. Cold produces abortion. When their eyes are surcharged, the female discharges the blood from the eye by pricking it with the point of a bulrush, and the male with the thorn of a bramble. Mutianus relates an instance of the intelligence of this animal, of which he himself was an eyewitness. Two goats, coming from opposite directions, met on a very narrow bridge, which would not admit of either of them turning round, and in consequence of its great length, they could not safely go backwards, there being no sure footing on account of its narrowness, while at the same time an impetuous torrent was rapidly rushing beneath. Accordingly, one of the animals lay down flat, while the other walked over it. Among the males, those are the most esteemed which have flat noses and long hanging ears, the shoulders being covered with very thick shaggy hair. The mark of the most valuable among the females is the having two folds hanging down the body from under the neck. Some of these animals have no horns, but where there are horns, the age of the animal is denoted by the number of knots on them. Those that have no horns give the most milk. According to Archelaus, they breathe, not through the nose, but the ears, and they are never entirely free from fever, from which circumstance it is probably that they are more animated than sheep, more ardent, and have stronger sexual passions. It is said also that they have the power of seeing by night as well as in the day, for which reason those persons who are called nyctalopes, 
recover the power of seeing in the evening by eating the liver of the he-goat in cilicia and in the vicinity of the certes the inhabitants shear the goat for the purpose of clothing themselves it is said that the she-goats in the pastures will never look at each other at sunset but lie with their backs towards each other while at other times of the day they lie facing each other and in family groups they all have long hair hanging down from the chin which is called by us aruncus if any one of the flock is taken hold of and dragged by this hair all the rest gaze on in stupid astonishment and the same happens when any one of them has eaten of a certain herb their bite is very destructive to trees and they make the olive barren by licking it for which reason they are not sacrificed to minerva end of section twenty five Section 26 of the Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 2 by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 26, Chapter 77 The Hog. The period for coupling the hog last from the return of the west wind to the vernal equinox. The proper age commences in the eighth month, indeed, in some places, in the fourth even, and continues until the eighth year. They bring forth twice in the year, the time of gestation being four months. The number at birth amounts to twenty even, but they cannot rear so large a number. Nigidius informs us, that those which are produced within ten days of the winter solstice are born with teeth. One coupling is sufficient, but it is repeated on account of their extreme liability to abortion, the remedy for which is not to allow coupling the first time the female is in heat, nor until its ears are flaccid and pendant. The males do not generate after they are three years old. When the females become feeble from old age, they receive the males lying down. It is not looked upon as anything portentous when they eat their young. The young of the hog is considered in a state of purity for sacrifice when five days old, the lamb on the seventh day, and the calf on the thirtieth. Corincanius asserts that ruminant animals are not proper for victims until they have two teeth. It has been supposed that when a pig has lost an eye, it will not live long. Otherwise, these animals generally live up to 15 or sometimes 20 years. They sometimes become mad, besides which they are liable to other diseases, especially quinsy and scrofula. It is an indication that the hog is diseased when blood is found at the root of a bristle pulled from its back and when it holds its head on one side while walking. When the female becomes too fat, she has a deficiency of milk. The first litter is always the least numerous. Animals of this kind delight in rolling in the mud. The tail is curled, and it has also been remarked that those are a more acceptable offering to the gods whose tail is turned to the right than those which have it turned to the left. They may be fattened in sixty days, and more especially if they have been kept without food for three days before fattening. The swine is by far the most brutish of all the animals, and it has been said, and not unaptly, that life has been given them in place of salt. And yet it has been known that these animals, when carried away by thieves, have recognized the voice of their keeper, and when a vessel has been under water through the inclination of one of its sides, they have had the sense to go over to the other side. The leader of the herd will even learn to go to market and to different houses in the city. In the wild state also, they have the sense to pass their urine in plashy places, that they may destroy all traces of them and also lighten themselves for flight. The female is spayed, just as is done with the camel. After they have fasted two days, they are suspended by the hind feet, and the orifice of the womb is cut. After this operation, they fatten more quickly. M. Apicius made the discovery that we may employ the same artificial method of increasing the size of the liver of the sow as that of the goose. It consists in cramming them with dried figs, and when they are fat enough, they are drenched with wine mixed with honey, 
and immediately killed. There is no animal that affords a greater variety to the palate of the epicure. All the others have their own peculiar flavor, but the flesh of the hog has nearly fifty different flavors. Hence it is that there are whole pages of regulations made by the censors forbidding the serving up at banquets of the belly, the kernels, the testicles, the womb, and the cheeks. However, notwithstanding all this, the poet Publius, the author of the Mimes, when he ceased to be a slave, is said to have given no entertainment without serving up the belly of a sow, to which he also gave the name of Sumen. Chapter 78. The Wild Boar, who was the first to establish parks for wild animals. The flesh of the wild boar is also much esteemed. Cato, the censor, in his orations, strongly declaimed against the use of the brawn of the wild boar. The animal used to be divided into three portions, the middle part of which was laid by and is called boar's chine. P. Servilius Rulus was the first Roman who served up a whole boar at a banquet. The father of that Rulus, who, in the consulship of Cicero, proposed the agrarian law. So recent is the introduction of a thing which is now in daily use. The analysts have taken notice of such a fact as this, clearly as a hint to us to mend our manners. Seeing that nowadays two or three boars are consumed, not at one entertainment, but as forming the first course only. Fulvius Lupinus was the first Roman who formed parks for the reception of these and other wild animals. He first fed them in the territory of Tarquini. It was not long, however, that imitators were found in N. Luculus and H. Hortensius. The wild sow brings forth once only in the year. The males are very fierce during the rutting time. They fight with each other, having first hardened their sides by rubbing them against the trees and covered themselves with mud. The females, as is the case with animals of every kind, become more fierce just after they have brought forth. The wild boar is not capable of generating before the first year. The wild boar of India has two curved teeth projecting from beneath the muzzle, a cubit in length, and the same number projecting from the forehead like the horns of the young bull. The hair of these animals in a wild state is the color of copper. The others are black. No species whatever of the swine is found in Arabia. Chapter 79. Animals in a half-wild state. In no species is the union with the wild animals so easy as in that of the swine. The produce of such unions was called by the ancients hybrid or half-savage, which appellation has also been transferred to the human race as it was to C. Antonius, the colleague of Cicero, in his consulship. Not only, however, with respect to the hog, but all other animals as well, wherever there is a tame species, there is a corresponding wild one as well, a fact which is equally true with reference to man himself, as is proved by the many races of wild men of which we have already spoken. There is no kind of animal, however, that is divided into a greater number of varieties than the goat. There are the caprea, the rupi capra, or rock goat, and the ibex, an animal of wonderful swiftness, although its head is loaded with immense horns, which bear a strong resemblance to the sheath of a sword. By means of these horns, the animal balances itself when it darts along the rocks, as though it had been hurled from a sling more especially when it wishes to leap from one eminence to another. There are the oranges also, which are said to be the only animals that have the hair the contrary way, the points being turned towards the head. There are the dama also, the pegargus, and the stepsiceros, besides many others which strongly resemble them. The first mentioned of these animals, however, dwell in the Alps, all the others are sent to us from parts beyond sea. Chapter 80. Apes. The different kinds of apes, which approach the nearest to the human figure, are distinguished from each other by the tail. Their shrewdness is quite wonderful. 
it is said that imitating the hunters they will besmear themselves with bird lime and put their feet into shoes which as so many snares have been prepared for them Mushiana says that they have even played at chess having by practice learned to distinguish the different pieces which are made of wax he says that the species which have tails become quite melancholy when the moon is on the wane and that they leap for joy at the time of the new moon, and adore it. Other quadrupeds are also terrified at the eclipses of the heavenly bodies. All the species of apes manifest remarkable affection for their offspring. Females, which have been domesticated and have had young ones, carry them about and shew them to all comers, shew great delight when they are caressed, and appear to understand the kindness thus shewn them. Hence it is that they very often stifle their young with their embraces. The dog's headed ape is of a much fiercer nature, as is the case with the satyr. The calatriki has almost a totally different aspect. It has a beard on the face and a tail which in the first part of it is very bushy. It is said that this animal cannot live except in the climate of Ethiopia, which is its native place. Chapter 81. The Different Species of Hares There are also numerous species of hares. Those in the Alps are white, and it is believed that during the winter they live upon snow for food. At all events, every year, as the snow melts, they acquire a reddish color. It is, moreover, an animal which is capable of existing in the most severe climates. There is also a species of hare in Spain which is called the rabbit. It is extremely prolific and produces famine in the Balearic Islands by destroying the harvests. The young ones, either when cut out from the body of the mother or taken from the breast without having the entrails removed, are considered a most delicate food. They are then called lorises. It is a well-known fact that the inhabitants of the Balearic Islands begged of the late Emperor Augustus the aid of a number of soldiers to prevent the too rapid increase of these animals. The ferret is greatly esteemed for its skill in catching them. It is thrown into the burrows with their numerous outlets which the rabbits form and from which circumstance they derive their name, and as it drives them out they are taken above. Archelaus informs us that in the hair the number of cavernous receptacles in the body for the excrements always equals that of its years, but still the numbers are sometimes found to differ. He says also that the same individual possesses the characteristics of the two sexes, and that it becomes pregnant just as well without the aid of the male. It is a kind provision of nature in making animals which are both harmless and good for food thus prolific. The hare, which is preyed upon by all other animals, is the only one, except the desipus, which is capable of superfetation. While the mother is suckling one of her young, she has another in the womb covered with hair, another without any covering at all, and another which is just beginning to be formed. Attempts have been made to form a kind of stuff of the hair of these animals but it is not so soft as when attached to the skin, and, in consequence of the shortness of the hairs, soon falls to pieces. Chapter 82. Animals which are tamed in part only. Hares are seldom tamed, and yet they cannot properly be called wild animals. Indeed, there are many species of them which are neither tame nor wild, but of a sort of intermediate nature. Of the same kind there are among the winged animals, swallows and bees, and among the sea animals, the dolphin. Many persons have placed that inhabitant of our houses, the mouse, in this class also. An animal which is not to be despised for the portents which it has afforded, even in relation to public events. By gnawing the silver shields at Lenuvium, mice prognosticated the Marcian War and the death of our general Carbo at Clusium by gnawing the latchets with which he fastened his shoes. There are many species of this animal in the territory of Cyrenaica. Some of them, 
with a wide, others with a projecting forehead, and some again with bristling hair like the hedgehog. We are informed by Theophrastus that after the mice had driven the inhabitants of Giara from their island, they even gnawed the iron, which they also do by a kind of natural instinct in the iron forges among the Calibus. In gold mines, too, their stomachs are opened for this purpose, and some of the metal is always to be found there, which they have pilfered. So great a delight do they take in stealing. We learn from our annals also that at the siege of Casilinum, by Hannibal, a mouse was sold for two hundred denarii, and that the person who sold it perished with hunger, while the purchaser survived. To be visited by white mice is considered as indicative of a fortunate event, but our annals are full of instances in which the singing of a mouse has interrupted the auspices. Nigidius informs us that the field mouse conceals itself during winter. This is also said to be the case with the dormouse, which the regulations of the censors and of M. Scarus, the chief of the senate, when he was consul, have banished from our tables no less than shellfish and birds, which are brought forth from a foreign country. The dormouse is also a half-wild animal, and the same person made warrens for them in large castes, who first formed parks for wild boars. In relation to this subject, it has been remarked that dormice will not mate unless they happen to be natives of the same forest and that if those are put together that are brought from different rivers or mountains, they will fight and destroy each other. These animals nourish their parents, when worn out with old age, with a singular degree of affection. This old age of theirs is put an end to by their winter's rest, when they conceal themselves and sleep. They are young again by the summer. The field mouse also enjoys a similar repose. Chapter 83 places in which certain animals are not to be found. It is a remarkable fact that nature has not only assigned different countries to different animals, but that even in the same country it has denied certain species to peculiar localities. In Italy, the dormouse is found in one part only, the Messian forest. In Lycia, the gazelle never passes beyond the mountains which border upon Syria, nor does the wild ass in that vicinity pass over those which divide Cappadocia from Cilicia. On the banks of the Hellespont, the stags never pass into a strange territory, and about Arginusa, they never go beyond Mount Elaphus. Those upon that mountain, too, have cloven ears. In the island of Porosilini, the weasels will not so much as cross a certain road. In Boeotia, the moles, which were introduced at Lebedea, fly from the very soil of that country, while in the neighborhood, at Orchomenus, the very same animals tear up all the fields. We have seen coverlets for beds made of the skins of these creatures, so that our sense of religion does not prevent us from employing these ominous animals for the purposes of luxury. When hares have been brought to Ithaca, they die as soon as ever they touch the shore, and the same is the case with rabbits on the shores of the island of Ebusus. While they abound in the vicinity of Spain, namely, and the Balearic Isles. In Serene, the frogs were formerly dumb, and this species still exists, although croaking ones were carried over there from the continent. At the present day, even, the frogs in the island of Seriphos are dumb but when they are carried to other places, they croak. The same thing is also said to have taken place at Sicanadros, a lake of Thessaly. In Italy, the bite of the shrew mouse is venomous, an animal which is not to be found in any region beyond the Eponymus. In whatever country it exists, it always dies immediately if it goes across the rut made by a wheel. Upon Olympus, a mountain of Macedonia, there are no wolves, nor yet in the Isle of Crete. In this island there are neither foxes, nor bears, nor indeed any kind of baneful animal, with the exception of the phalangium, a species of spider, of which I shall speak in its appropriate place. 
it is a thing still more remarkable that in this island there are no stags except in the district of sidon the same is the case with the wild boar the woodcock and the hedgehog in africa there are neither wild boars stags deer nor bears chapter eighty four animals which injure strangers only as also animals which injure the natives of the country only and where they are found besides this there are certain animals which are harmless to the natives of the country but destroy strangers such are the little serpents at tyrinthus which are said to spring from out of the earth in syria also and especially on the banks of the euphrates the serpents never attack the syrians when they are asleep and even if they happen to bite a native who treads upon them their venom is not felt but to persons of any other country they are extremely hostile and fiercely attack them causing a death attended with great torture on this account the syrians never kill them on the contrary on latmos an island of caria as aristotle tells us strangers are not injured by the scorpions while the natives are killed by them but i must now give an account of other animals as well and of the productions of the earth summary remarkable events narratives and observations seven hundred and eighty seven roman authors quoted mucianus priscillus various flaccus l piso cornelius yellerianus cato the censor Fenestella, Trogus, the Register of the Triumphs, Columella, Virgil, Yaro, Lucilius, Metellus Scipio, Cornelius Celsus, Nigidius, Trebius Niger, Pomponius Mela, Mamilius Sura. Foreign authors quoted King Yuba, Polybius, Herodotus, Antipater, Aristotle, Demetrius the physician, Democritus, Theophrastus, Euanthus, Agriopas, who wrote the Olympiniase, King Hiero, King Attilus, Philometor, Tesias, Durus, Philistus, Architas, Philarchus, Amphilochus of Athens, Anaxapolis, Thessian, Apollodorus of Lemnos, Aristophanes the Milesian, Antigonus the Cumaean, Agathocles of Chios, Apollonius of Pergamus, Aristander of Athens, Thatius of Miletus, Bion of Soli, Chereus the Athenian, Diodorus of Priene, Dion of the Colophonian, Epigenus the Rhodian, Eugon of Thasos, Euphronius of Athens, Hegesias of Maronea, the Menanders of Priene and of Hercule, Menecrates the poet, Androtion who wrote on agriculture, Estrion, who wrote on agriculture, Lysimachus, who wrote on agriculture, Dionysus, who translated Mago, Diophtenes, who made an epitome of the work of Dionysus, King Archelaus, Nicander. End of section 26. Section 27 of the Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 2 by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 27. Book 9. Chapter 1. Why the Largest Animals Are Found in the Sea. We have now given an account of the animals which we call terrestrial, and which live, as it were, in a sort of society with man. Among the remaining ones it is well known that the birds are the smallest. We shall therefore first describe those which inhabit the seas, 
rivers, and standing waters. Among these there are many to be found that exceed in size any of the terrestrial animals even, the evident cause of which is the superabundance of moisture with which they are supplied. Very different is the lot of the winged animals whose life is passed soaring aloft in the air. But in the seas, spread out as they are far and wide, forming an element at once so delicate and so vivifying, and receiving the generating principles from the regions of the air, as they are ever produced by nature, many animals are to be found, and indeed most of those that are of monstrous form. From the fact, no doubt, that these seeds and first principles of being are so utterly conglomerated and so involved, the one with the other, from being whirled to and fro, now by the action of the winds and now by the waves. Hence it is that the vulgar notion may very possibly be true that whatever is produced in any other department of nature is to be found in the sea as well, while at the same time many other productions are there to be found which nowhere else exist. That there are to be found in the sea the forms not only of terrestrial animals, but of inanimate objects even, is easily to be understood by all those who will take the trouble to examine the grape-fish, the sword-fish, the sawfish, and the cucumber-fish, which last so strongly resembles the real cucumber both in colour and in smell. We shall find the less reason, then, to be surprised to find that in so small an object as a shellfish the head of the horse is to be seen protruding from the shell. CHAPTER Two: THE SEA MONSTERS OF THE INDIAN OCEAN but the most numerous and largest of all these animals are those found in the Indian seas, among which are the balene, four jugura in extent, and the pristis, two hundred cubits long. Here also are found crayfish four cubits in length, and in the river Ganges there are to be seen eels three hundred feet long. But at sea it is more especially about the time the solstices that these monsters are to be seen. For then it is that in these regions the whirlwind comes sweeping on, the rains descend, the hurricane comes rushing down, hurled from the mountain heights, while the sea is stirred up from the very bottom, and the monsters are driven from their depths and rolled upwards on the crest of the billow. At other times again there are such vast multitudes of tunnies met with, that the fleet of Alexander the Great was able to make head against them only by facing them in order of battle, just as it would have done an enemy's fleet. Had the ships not done this, but proceeded in a straggling manner, they could not possibly have made their escape. No noises, no sounds, no blows had any effect on these fish. By nothing short of the clash of battle were they to be terrified, and by nothing less than their utter destruction were they overpowered. There is a large peninsula in the Red Sea known by the name of Kadara. As it projects into the deep, it forms a vast gulf, which it took the fleet of King Ptolemy twelve whole days and nights to traverse, by dint of rowing, for not a breath of wind was to be perceived. In the recesses of this becalmed spot, more particularly, the sea monsters attain so vast a size that they are quite unable to move. The commanders of the fleets of Alexander the Great have related that the Gadrasi, who dwell upon the banks of the river Arabis, are in the habit of making the doors of their houses with the jawbones of fishes, and raftering the roofs with their bones, many of which were found as much as forty cubits in length. At this place, too, the sea monsters, just like so many cattle, were in the habit of coming on shore, and after feeding on the roots of shrubs they would return, some of them, which had the heads of horses, asses, and bulls, found a pasture in the crops of grain. CHAPTER three, THE LARGEST ANIMALS THAT ARE FOUND IN EACH OCEAN The largest animals found in the Indian Sea are the Pistrix and the Balena, while of the Gallic Ocean the Physator is the most bulky inhabitant raising itself aloft like some vast column, and as it towers above the sails of ships, belching forth, as it were, a deluge of water. In the ocean of Gades there is a tree with outspread branches so vast that it is supposed that it is for that reason it has never yet entered the straits. There are fish also found there which are called sea-wheels, in consequence of their singular conformation. They are divided by four spokes, the nave being guarded on every side by a couple of eyes. Chapter 4 the forms of the tritons and nereids, the forms of sea elephants. A deputation of persons from Olisipo, that had been sent for the purpose, brought word to the emperor Tiberius that a triton had been both seen and heard in a certain cavern, blowing a conch shell, and of the form under which they are usually represented. Nor yet is the figure generally attributed to the nereids at all a fiction, only in them the portion of the body that resembles the human figure is still rough all over with scales. For one of these creatures was seen upon the same shores, and as it died, its plaintive murmurs were heard even by the inhabitants at a distance. The legatus of Gaul, too, wrote word to the late Emperor Augustus that a considerable number of nereids had been found dead upon the shore. 
I have, too, some distinguished informants of equestrian rank, who state that they themselves once saw in the ocean of Gades a seaman which bore in every part of his body a perfect resemblance to a human being, and that during the night he would climb up into ships, upon which the side of the vessel where he seated himself would instantly sink downward, and if he remained there any considerable time, even go under water. In the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, a subsidence of the ocean left exposed on the shores of an island which faces the province of Lugdunum, as many as three hundred animals or more, all at once, quite marvellous for their varied shapes and enormous size, and no less a number upon the shores of the Santones, among the rest there were elephants and rams, which last, however, had only a white spot to represent horns. Terranius has also left accounts of several nereids, and speaks of the monster that was thrown up on the shore at Gades, the distance between the two fins at the end of the tail of which was sixteen cubits, and its teeth one hundred and twenty in number, the largest being nine, and the smallest six inches in length. M. Scaurus, in his Aedaleship, exhibited at Rome, among other wonderful things, the bones of the monster to which Andromeda was said to have been exposed, and which he had brought from Joppa, a city of Judea. These bones exceeded forty feet in length, and the ribs were higher than those of the Indian elephant, while the backbone was a foot and a half in thickness. CHAPTER V. THE BALENA AND THE ORCA The balena penetrates to our seas even. It is said that they are not to be seen in the ocean of Gades before the winter solstice, and that at periodical seasons they retire and conceal themselves in some calm, capacious bay, in which they take a delight in bringing forth. This fact, however, is known to the orca an animal which is peculiarly hostile to the balena, and the form of which cannot be in any way adequately described, but as an enormous mass of flesh armed with teeth. This animal attacks the balena in its places of retirement, and with its teeth tears its young, or else attacks the females which have just brought forth, and indeed while they are still pregnant, and as they rush upon them it pierces them just as though they had been attacked by the beak of a Liburnian galley. The female balene, devoid of all flexibility, without energy to defend themselves, and overburdened by their weight, weakened, too, by gestation, or else the pains of recent parturition, are well aware that their only resource is to take to flight in the open sea and to range over the whole face of the ocean, while the orcae, on the other hand, do all in their power to meet them in their flight, throw themselves in their way, and kill them either cooped up in a narrow passage, or else drive them on a shoal, or dash them to pieces against the rocks. When these battles are witnessed, it appears just as though the sea were infuriate against itself. Not a breath of wind is there to be felt in the bay, and yet the waves by their pantings and their repeated blows are heaved aloft in a way which no whirlwind could affect. An orca has been seen even in the port of Ostia, where it was attacked by the Emperor Claudius. It was while he was constructing the harbour there that this orca came, attracted by some hides which, having been brought from Gaul, had happened to fall overboard there. By feeding upon these for several days it had quite glutted itself, having made for itself a channel in the shoaly water. Here, however, the sand was thrown up by the action of the wind to such an extent that the creature found it quite impossible to turn round, and while in the act of pursuing its prey it was propelled by the waves towards the shore, so that its back came to be perceived above the level of the water, very much resembling in appearance the keel of a vessel turned bottom upwards. Upon this Caesar ordered a great number of nets to be extended at the mouth of the harbour, from shore to shore, while he himself went there with his praetorian cohorts, and so afforded a spectacle to the Roman people, for boats assailed the monster while the soldiers on board showered lances upon it. I myself saw one of the boats sunk by the water which the animal, as it respired, showered down upon it. CHAPTER six: WHETHER FISHES RESPIRE, AND WHETHER THEY SLEEP Balene have the mouth and the forehead, and hence it is that as they swim on the surface of the water they discharge vast showers of water in the air. It is universally agreed, however, that they respire, as do a very few other animals in the sea which have lungs among the internal viscera, for without lungs it is generally supposed that no animal can breathe. Those two who are of this opinion are of opinion also that no fishes that have gills are so constituted as to inhale and exhale alternately nor, in fact, many other kinds of animals even, which are entirely destitute of gills. This, I find, was the opinion of Aristotle, who by his learned researches on the subject has induced many others to be of the same way of thinking. I shall not, however, conceal the fact that I for one do not by any means at once subscribe to this opinion, for it is very possible, if such be the will of nature, that there may be other organs fitted for the purposes of respiration, and acting in the place of lungs, just as in many animals a different liquid altogether takes the place of blood. 
and who, in fact, can find any ground for surprise that the breath of life can penetrate the waters of the deep, when he sees that it is even exhaled from them? And when we find, too, that it can even enter the very depths of the earth, an element of so much greater density, a thing that is proved by the case of animals which always live underground, the mole, for instance. There are other weighty reasons as well, which induce me to be of opinion that all aquatic animals respire, conformably to their natural organization. For in the first place, there has been often remarked in fishes a certain degree of anhelation during the heat of summer, and at other times again a kind of leisurely gaping, as it were. And then, besides, we have the admission of those who are of the contrary opinion that fishes do sleep, but what possibility is there of sleeping without respiring as well? And again we see their breath disengaged in bubbles which rise to the surface, and the influence, too, of the moon makes even the very shells grow in bulk. But the most convincing reason of all is the undoubted fact that fishes have the power of hearing and of smelling, two senses for the operation of both of which the air is a necessary vehicle for by smell we understand nothing else than air being charged with certain particles. However, let every person form his own opinion on these subjects, just in such way as he may think best. Neither the balena nor the dolphin has any gills. Both of these animals respire through vent holes which communicate with the lungs. In the balena they are on the forehead, and in the dolphin on the back. Sea calves, too, which we call phoque, breathe and sleep upon dry land. Sea tortoises also, of which we shall have more to say hereafter. End of section 27。Section 28 of the Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 28. Chapter 7. Dolphins. The swiftest, not only of the sea animals, but of all animals whatever, is the dolphin. He is more rapid in his movements than a bird, more instantaneous than the flight of an arrow, and were it not for the fact that his mouth is situate much below his muzzle, almost indeed in the middle of the belly not a fish would be able to escape his pursuit but nature in her prudence has thrown certain impediments in his way for unless he turns and throws himself on his back he can seize nothing and it is this circumstance more especially that gives proof of his extraordinary swiftness for if pressed by hunger he will follow a fish as it flies down to the very bottom of the water and then, after holding his breath thus long, will dart again to the surface to respire, with the speed of an arrow discharged from a bow. And often, on such occasions, he is known to leap out of the water with such a bound as to fly right over the sails of a ship. Dolphins generally go in couples. The females bring forth their young in the tenth month, during the summer season, sometimes two in number. They suckle their young at the teat like the balena, and even carry them during the weakness of infancy, in addition to which, long after they are grown up, they accompany them, so great is their affection for their progeny. The young ones grow very speedily, and in ten years are supposed to arrive at their full size. The dolphin lives thirty years, a fact that has been ascertained from cutting marks on the tail by way of experiment. It conceals itself for thirty days at about the rising of the dog-star, and hides itself so effectually that it is not known whither it goes, a thing that is more surprising still if it is unable to respire under water. Dolphins are in the habit of darting upon the shore, but for some reason or other it is not known what. They do not die the moment that they touch the dry land, but will die much more speedily if the vent hole is closed. The tongue, contrary to the nature of aquatic animals in general, is movable, being short and broad, not much unlike that of the pig. Instead of a voice, they emit a moaning sound similar to that made by a human being. The back is arched, and the nose turned up. For this reason it is that they all recognize, in a most surprising manner, the name of Simo, 
and prefer to be called by that rather than by any other. Chapter 8. Human Beings Who Have Been Beloved by Dolphins The dolphin is an animal not only friendly to men, but a lover of music as well. He is charmed by melodious concerts, and more especially by the notes of the water organ. He does not dread men, as though a stranger to him, but comes to meet ships, leaps and bounds to and fro, vies with them in swiftness, and passes them even when in full sail. In the reign of the late Emperor Augustus, a dolphin which had been carried to the Lucrine Lake conceived a most wonderful affection for the child of a certain poor man, who was in the habit of going that way from Baie to Puteoli, to school, and who used to stop there in the middle of the day, call him by his name of Simo, and would often entice him to the banks of the lake with pieces of bread which he carried for the purpose. I should really have felt ashamed to mention this, had not the incident been stated in writing in the works of Messinus, Fabianus, Flavius Alpheus, and many others. At whatever hour of the day he might happen to be called by the boy, and although hidden and out of sight at the bottom of the water, he would instantly fly to the surface, and after feeding from his hand, would present his back for him to mount, taking care to conceal the spiny projection of his fins in their sheath, as it were. And so, sportively taking him up on his back, he would carry him over a wide expanse of sea to the school at Pureoli, and in a similar manner bring him back again. This happened for several years, until at last the boy happened to fall ill of some malady and died. The dolphin, however, still came to the spot as usual, with a sorrowful air, and manifesting every sign of deep affliction, until at last, a thing of which no one felt the slightest doubt, he died purely of sorrow and regret. Within these few years also, another at Hippo Diaritis, on the coast of Africa, in a similar manner used to receive his food from the hands of various persons, presenting himself for their caresses, sport about among the swimmers, and carry them on his back. On being rubbed with unguents by Flavianus, the then proconsul of Africa, he was lulled to sleep, as it appeared, by the sensation of an odor so new to him, and floated about, just as though he had been dead. For some months after this, he carefully avoided all intercourse with men, just as though he had received some affront or other. But at the end of that time he returned, and afforded just the same wonderful scenes as before. At last, the vexations that were caused them by having to entertain so many influential men who came to see this sight, compelled the people of Hippo to put the animal to death. Before this, there was a similar story told of a child at the city of Yasis, for whom a dolphin was long observed to have conceived a most ardent affection, until at last, as the animal was eagerly follow him as he was making for the shore, it was carried by the tide on the sands, and there expired. Alexander the Great appointed this boy high priest of Neptune at Babylon, interpreting this extraordinary attachment as a convincing proof of the favor of that divinity. Hegesidemus has also informed us that in the same city of Yasus there was another boy also, Hermias by name, who in a similar manner used to traverse the sea on a dolphin's back, but that on one occasion a tempest suddenly arising, he lost his life and was brought back dead, upon which the dolphin, who thus admitted that he had been the cause of his death, would not return to the sea, but lay down upon the dry land and there expired. Theophrastus informs us that the very same thing happened at Naupactus also, nor, in fact, is there any limit to similar instances. The Amphilochians and the Tarentines have similar stories also about children and dolphins, and all these give an air of credibility to the one that is told of Arian, the famous performer on the lyre. The mariners being on the point of throwing him into the sea for the purpose of taking possession of the money he had earned, he prevailed upon them to allow him one more song, accompanied with the music of his lyre. The melody attracted numbers of dolphins around the ship, and, upon throwing himself into the sea, 
he was taken up by one of them and borne in safety to the shore of the promontory of Tenerem. Chapter 9. Places where dolphins help men to fish. There is, in the province of Gallia Narbonensis, and in the territory of Nemosus, a lake known by the name of Latera, where dolphins fish in company with men. At the narrow outlet of this lake, at stated seasons of the year, innumerable multitudes of mullets make their way into the sea, taking advantage of the turn of the tide. Hence it is that it is quite impossible to employ nets sufficiently strong to bear so vast a weight, even though the fish had not the instinctive shrewdness to watch their opportunity. By a similar instinct, the fish immediately make with all speed towards the deep water which is found in a gulf in that vicinity, and hasten to escape from the only spot that is at all convenient for spreading the nets. As soon as ever the fishermen perceive this, all the people, for great multitudes resort thither, being well aware of the proper time, and especially desirous of sharing in the amusement, shout as loud as they can, and summon Simo to the scene of action. The dolphins very quickly understand that they are in requisition, as a north-east wind speedily carries the sound to their retreats, though a south one would somewhat retard it by carrying it in an opposite direction. Even then, however, sooner than you could have possibly supposed, there are the dolphins in all readiness to assist. They are seen approaching in all haste in battle array, and immediately taking up their position when the engagement is about to take place, they cut off all escape to the open sea, and drive the terrified fish into shallow water. The fishermen then throw their nets, holding them up at the sides with forks, though the mullets, with inconceivable agility, instantly leap over them, while the dolphins, on the other hand, are waiting in readiness to receive them, and content themselves for the present with killing them only, postponing all thoughts of eating till after they have secured the victory. The battle walks us hot apace, and the dolphins, pressing on with the greatest vigor, readily allow themselves to be enclosed in the nets, but in order that the fact of their being thus enclosed may not urge the enemy to find additional means of flight, they glide along so stealthily among the boats and nets, or else the swimmers, as not to leave them any opening for escape. By leaping, which at other times is their most favorite amusement, not one among them attempts to make its escape, unless, indeed, the nets are purposely lowered for it, and the instant that it has come out, it continues the battle, as it were, up to the very ramparts. At last, when the capture is now completed, they devour those among the fish which they have killed. But being well aware that they have given too active an assistance to be repaid with only one day's reward, they take care to wait there till the following day, when they are filled not only with fish, but bread crumbs soaked in wine as well. Chapter 10. Other Wonderful Things Relating to Dolphins The account which Musianus gives of a similar mode of fishing in the Yasian Gulf differs from the preceding one in the fact that there the dolphins make their appearance of their own accord and do not require to be called. They receive their share from the hands of the people, each boat having its own particular associate among the dolphins, and this although the fishing is carried on at night-time by the light of torches. Dolphins also form among themselves a sort of general community, one of them having been captured by a king of Caria and chained up in the harbor, great multitudes of dolphins assembled at the spot, and with signs of sorrow which could not be misunderstood, appealed to the sympathies of the people, until at last the king ordered it to be released. The young dolphins also are always attended by a larger one, who acts as a guardian to them, and before now they have been seen carrying off the body of one which had died, that it might not be devoured by the sea monsters. Chapter 11. The Tercio There is a fish called the Tercio, which bears a strong resemblance to the dolphin. It differs from it, however, in a certain air of sadness, and is wanting in its peculiar vivacity. 
This animal most resembles the dogfish, however, in the shape and dangerous powers of the muzzle. Chapter 12. Turtles, the various kinds of turtles and how they are caught. The Indian Sea produces turtles of such vast size that with the shell of a single animal they are able to roof a habitable cottage, and among the islands of the Red Sea the navigation is mostly carried on in boats formed of these shells. They are to be caught in many ways, but they are generally taken when they have come up to the surface of the water just before midday, a season at which they experience great delight in floating on the calm surface with the back entirely out of the water. Here the delightful sensations which attend a free respiration beguile them to such a degree and render them so utterly regardless of their safety that their shell becomes dried up by the heat of the sun, so much so, indeed, that they are unable to descend, and having to float against their will, become an easy prey to the fishermen. It is said also that they leave the water at night for the purpose of feeding, and eat with such avidity as to quite glut themselves, upon which they become weary, and the moment that, on their return in the morning, they reach the sea, they fall asleep on the surface of the water. The noise of their snoring betrays them, upon which the fishermen stealthily swim towards the animals, three to each turtle. Two of them, in a moment, throw it on its back, while a third slings a noose around it, as it lies face upwards, and then some more men, who are ready on shore, draw it to land. In the Phoenician Sea they are taken without the slightest difficulty, and, at stated periods of the year, come of their own accord to the river Eleutherus in immense numbers. The turtle has no teeth, but the edge of the mouth is sharp, the upper part shutting down over the lower just like the lid of a box. In the sea it lives upon shellfish, and such is the strength of its jaws that it is able to break stones even, when on shore it feeds upon herbage. The female turtle lays eggs like those of birds, one hundred in number. These she buries on the dry land, and covering them over with earth, pats it down with her breast, and then, having thus rendered it smooth, sits on them during the night. The young are hatched in the course of a year. Some persons are of opinion that they hatch their eggs by means of the eyes, by merely looking at them, and that the female refuses to have any intercourse with the male until he has placed a wisp of straw upon her back. The troglodytae have turtles with horns, which resemble the branches of a lyre. They are large but movable, and assist the animal like so many oars while swimming. The name of this fine but rarely found turtle is Kellian, for the rocks, from the sharpness of their points, frighten away the Kellonophagi, while the troglodytae, whose shores these animals frequent, worship them as sacred. There are some land turtles also, the shells of which, used for the purposes of art, are thence called by the name of Kersine. They are found in the deserts of Africa, in the parts where the score-head sands are more especially destitute of water, and subsist, it is believed, upon the moisture of the dews. No other animal is to be found there. Chapter 13 who first invented the art of cutting tortoiseshell? Carvilius Pollio, a man of prodigal habits and ingenious in inventing the refinement of luxury, was the first to cut the shell of the tortoise into laminae and to veneer beds and cabinets with it. Chapter 14. Distribution of aquatic animals into various species. The integuments of the aquatic animals are many in number, some are covered with a hide and hair, as the sea-calf and hippopotamus, for instance. Others, again, with a hide only, as the dolphin. Others, again, with a shell, as the turtle. Others, with a coat as hard as a stone, like the oyster and other shellfish. Others, with a crust, such as the crayfish. Others, with a crust and spines, like the sea urchin. Others, with scales, as fishes in general others with a rough skin as the squatina, the skin of which is used for polishing wood and ivory, others with a soft skin like the murena, and others with none at all like the polypus. 
Chapter 15. Those which are covered with hair or have none, and how they bring forth. Sea calves or phoque. Those aquatic animals which are covered with hair are viviparous, such, for instance, as the pristis, the balina, and the sea calf. This last brings forth its young on land, and like the sheep, produces an afterbirth. In coupling, they adhere after the manner of the canine species. The female sometimes produces even more than two, and rears her young at the breast. She does not take them down to the sea until the twelfth day, and after that time makes them become used to it by degrees. These animals are killed with the greatest difficulty unless the head is cut off at once. They make a noise which sounds like lowing, whence their name of sea-calf. They are susceptible, however, of training, and with their voice, as well as by gestures, can be taught to salute the public. When called by their name, they answer with a discordant kind of grunt. No animal has a deeper sleep than this. On dry land it creeps along as though on feet, by the aid of what it uses as fins when in the sea. Its skin, even when separated from the body, is said to retain a certain sensitive sympathy with the sea, in that the reflux of the tide, the hair on it always rises upright. In addition to which, it is said that there is in the right fin a certain superfluous influence, and that, if placed under the head, it induces sleep. There are only two animals without hair that are viviparous, the dolphin and the viper. Chapter 16. How many kinds of fish there are. There are seventy-four species of fishes, exclusive of those that are covered with crusts, the kinds of which are thirty in number. We shall on other occasions speak of each individually, but for the present we shall treat only of the nature of the more remarkable ones. End of section 28. Section 29 of the Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ted Garvin. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 29. Chapter 17. Which of the fishes are of the largest size? Tunnies are among the most remarkable for their size. We have found one weighing as much as fifteen talents, the breadth of its tail being fifteen cubits and a palm. In some of the rivers, also, there are fish of no less size, such, for instance, as the Silurus of the Nile, the Isaacs Isis of the Rhenus, and the Atlas of the Padus, which, naturally of an inactive nature, sometimes grow so fat as to weigh a thousand pounds, and when taken with a hook, attached to a chain, requires a yoke of oxen to draw it on land. An extremely small fish, which is known as the clupea, attaches itself, with a wonderful tenacity, to a certain vein in the throat of the atlas, and destroys it by its bite. The silurus carries devastation with it wherever it goes, attacks every living creature, and often drags beneath the water horses as they swim. It is also remarkable that in the Minas, a river of Germany, a fish that bears a very strong resemblance to the sea pig requires to be drawn out of the water by a yoke of oxen, and in the Danube it is taken with large hooks of iron. In the Borosthenes also there is said to be a fish of enormous size, the flesh of which has no bones or spines in it, and is remarkable for its sweetness. In the Ganges, a river of India, there is a fish found which they call the platanista. It has the muzzle and the tail of the dolphin, and measures sixteen cubits in length. Stadius Sabosus says, a thing that is marvelous in no small degree, that in the same river there are fishes found, called worms. These have two gills, and are sixty cubits in length. They are of an azure color, and have received their name from their peculiar conformation. These fish, he says, are of such enormous strength, that with their teeth they seize hold of the trunks of elephant that come to drink, and so drag them into the water. Chapter 18. Tunnies, Cordilla, and Pelamates, and the various parts of them that are salted, Melandria, 
apelecta, and sibium. The male tunny has no ventral fin. These fish enter the exine in large bodies from the main sea, in the spring, and will spawn nowhere else. The young ones, which in autumn accompany the females to the open sea, are known as cordela. In the spring, they are called the pelamides, from pelos, the Greek for mud, and after they are a year old, thinny. When this fish is cut up into pieces, the neck, the belly, and the throat are the most esteemed parts, but they must be eaten only when they are quite fresh, and even then they cause severe fits of flatulence. The other parts, with the flesh entire, are preserved in salt. Those pieces, which bear a resemblance to an oaken board, have thence received the name of melandria. The least esteemed among these parts are those which are the nearest to the tail, because they have no fat upon them, while those parts are considered the most delicate, which lie nearest the neck. In other fishes, however, the parts about the tail have the most nutriment in them. The pelamides are cut up into small sections, known as apelecti, and these again are divided into cubical pieces, which are thence called kibium. Chapter 19. The Arias and the Scomber. All kinds of fish grow with remarkable rapidity, and more especially those in Yuxine, the reason of which is the vast number of rivers which discharge their fresh water into it. One fish, the growth of which is quite perceptible, day by day, is known as the amium. This fish and the pelamides, together with the tunnies, enter the Yuxine in shoals, for the purpose of obtaining a sweeter nutriment, each under the command of its own leader. But first of all, the scomber appears, which is of a sulfurous tint when in the water, but when out of it resembles other fish in color. The saltwater preserves of Spain are filled with these last fish, but the tunnies do not consort with them. Chapter 20. Fishes which are never found in the Euxine, those which enter it and return. The oxine, however, is never entered by any animal that is noxious to fish, with the exception of the sea calf and the small dolphin. On entering, the tunnies range along the shores to the right, and on departing, keep to those on the left. This is supposed to arise from the fact that they have better sight with the right eye, their powers of vision with either being naturally very limited. In the channel of the Thracian Bosphorus, by which the Propontis is connected with the oxine, at the narrowest part of the straits which separate Europe from Asia, there is, near Chalcedon, on the Asiatic side, a rock of remarkable whiteness, the whole of which could be seen from the bottom of the sea at the surface. Alarmed at the sudden appearance of this rock, the tunnies always hasten in great numbers, and with headlong impetuosity, towards the promontory of Byzantium, which stands exactly opposite to it, and from this circumstance has received the name of the Golden Horn. Hence it is that all the fishing is at Byzantium, to the great loss of Chalcedon, although it is only separated from it by a channel a mile in width. They wait, however, for the blowing of the north wind to leave the Euxine with a favorable tide, and are never taken until they have entered the harbor of Byzantium. These fish do not move about in winter, in whatever place they may happen to be surprised by it, there they pass the winter till the time of the equinox, manifesting a wonderful degree of delight. They will often accompany a vessel in full sail, and may be seen from the poop following it for hours, and a distance of several miles. If a fish spear even is thrown at them ever so many times, they are not in the slightest degree alarmed at it. Some writers call the tunnies which follow ships in this manner by the name of Pompili. Many fishes pass the summer in the Propontis, and do not enter the Oxine, such, for instance, as the sole, while on the other hand the turbot enters it. The sepia is not found in the sea, although the loligo is. Among the rockfish, the sea thrust and the sea blackbird are wanting, as also purples, though oysters abound here. All these, however, pass the winter in the Aegean Sea, and of those which enter the Oxane, the only ones that do not return are the trichiae. It will be as well to use the Greek names which most of them bear, saying that to the same species different countries have given different appellations. These last, however, are the only ones that enter the river Ister, and passing along its subterraneous passages, make their way from it to the Adriatic, and this is the reason why they are to be seen descending into the Exene Sea, but never in the act of returning from it. The time for taking tunnies is, from the rising of the Virgiliae to the setting of Arcturus, throughout the rest of the winter season, 
they lie concealed at the bottom of deep creeks unless they are induced to come out by the warmth of the weather or the full moon these fish fatten to such an extraordinary degree as to burst the longest period of their life is two years chapter twenty one why fishes leap above the surface of the water there is a little animal in appearance like a scorpion and of the size of a spider this creature by means of its sting attaches itself below the fin to the tiny and the fish known as the swordfish and which often exceeds the dolphin in magnitude and causes it such excruciating pain that it will often leap on board of a ship even fish will also do the same at other times when in dread of the violence of other fish and mullets more especially which are of such extraordinary swiftness that they will sometimes leap over a ship if lying crosswise chapter twenty two that auguries are derived from fishes auguries are also derived from this department of nature and fishes afford presages of coming events while augustus was walking on the seashore during the time of the sicilian war a fish leapt out of the sea and fell at his feet the diviners who were consulted stated that this was a proof that those would fall beneath the feet of caesar who at that moment were in possession of the seas it was just at this time that sextus pompeius had adopted neptune as his father so elated was he with the successes by sea chapter twenty three what kinds of fishes have no males the females of fishes are larger in size than the males and in some kinds there are no males at all as in the erythini and the chani for all of these that are taken are found to be full of eggs nearly all kinds of fish that are covered with scales are gregarious they are most easily taken before sunrise for then more particularly their powers of seeing are defective they sleep during the night and when the weather is clear are able to see just as well then as during the day it is said also that it greatly tends to promote their capture to drag the bottom of the water and that by so doing more are taken at the second haul than at the first they are especially fond of the taste of oil and find nutriment in gentle showers of rain indeed the very reeds even although they are produced in swamps will not grow to maturity without the aid of rain in addition to this we find that wherever fishes remain constantly in the same water if it is not renewed they will die chapter twenty four fishes which have a stone in the head those which keep themselves concealed during winter and those which are not taken in winter except upon stated days all fish have a presentiment of a rigorous winter but more especially those which are supposed to have a stone in the head the lupus for instance the chromis the skyena and the fragus when the weather has been very severe many fish are taken in a state of blindness hence it is that during these months they lie concealed in holes in the same manner as land animals as we have already mentioned and more especially the hippurus and the coracinus which are never taken during the winter except only on a few stated days which are always the same the same with the murina also and the orphus the conger the perch and all the rockfish it is said that during the winter the torpedo the seta and the sole conceal themselves in the earth or rather i should say in excavations made by them at the bottom of the sea end of section twenty nine section thirty of the natural history volume two this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 30. Chapter 25. Fishes which conceal themselves during the summer. Those which are influenced by the stars. Other fishes, again, are unable to bear the heat of summer, and lie concealed during the sixty days of the hottest weather of midsummer, such, for instance, as the glaucus, the acellus, and the dorade. Among the river fish, the solurus is affected by the rising of the dog star, and at other times it is always sent to sleep by thunder. The same is also believed to be the case with the sea fish called cyprinus. In addition to this, the whole sea is sensible of the rising of this star, a thing which is more especially to be observed in the Bosporus, for there seaweeds and fish are seen floating on the surface, all of which have been thrown up from the bottom. 
Chapter Twenty Six The Mullet One singular propensity of the mullet has afforded a subject for laughter. When it is frightened, it hides its head and fancies that the whole of its body is concealed. Their salacious propensities render them so unguarded that in Phoenicia and in the province of Gallia Narbonensis, at the time of coupling, a male, being taken out of the preserves, is fastened to a long line which is passed through his mouth and gills. He is then let go in the sea, after which he is drawn back again by the line upon which the females will follow him to the very water's edge. And so, on the other hand, the male will follow the female during the spawning season. CHAPTER Twenty Seven, THE ASSIPENSER Among the ancients the assipenser was esteemed the most noble fish of all. It is the only one that has the scales turned towards the head, and in a contrary direction to that in which it swims. At the present day, however, it is held in no esteem, which I am the more surprised at, it being so very rarely found. Some writers call this fish the elops. CHAPTER Twenty Eight, THE LUPUS, ACELLUS at a later period they set the highest value on the lupus and the ocellus, as we learn from Cornelius Nepos, and the poet Liberius, the author of the Mimes. The most approved kinds of the lupus are those which have the name of lanate, or woolly, in consequence of the extreme whiteness and softness of the flesh. Of the ocellus there are two sorts, the calarius, which is the smallest, and the bacchus, which is only taken in deep water, and is hence much preferred to the former. On the other hand, among the varieties of the lupus, those are the most esteemed, which are taken in rivers. CHAPTER Twenty Nine, THE SCARUS, THE MUSTELLA At the present day the first place is given to the scarus, the only fish that is said to ruminate, and to feed on grass and not on other fish. It is mostly found in the Carpathian Sea and never of its own accord passes lectum, a promontory of Troas. Optatus Elipertius, the commander of the fleet under the emperor Claudius, had this fish brought from that locality, and dispersed in various places off the coast between Ostia and the districts of Campania. During five years the greatest care was taken that those which were caught should be returned to the sea but since then they have always been found in great abundance off the shores of Italy, where formerly there were none to be taken. Thus has gluttony introduced these fish to be a dainty within its reach, and added a new inhabitant to the seas, so that we ought to feel no surprise that foreign birds breed at Rome. The fish that is next in estimation for the table is the mustella, but that is valued only for its liver. A singular thing to tell of, the lake of Brigantia, in Raetia, lying in the midst of the Alps, produces them to rival even those of the sea. CHAPTER Thirty, THE VARIOUS KINDS OF MULLETS AND THE SARGUS THAT ATTENDS THEM Of the remaining fish that are held in any degree of esteem, the mullet is the most highly valued as well as the most abundant of all. It is of only a moderate size, rarely exceeds two pounds in weight, and will never grow beyond that weight in preserves or fish-ponds. These fish are only to be found in the northern ocean, exceeding two pounds in weight, and even there in none but the more westerly parts. As for the other kinds, the various species are numerous. Some live upon seaweed, while others feed on the oyster, slime, and the flesh of other fish. The more distinctive mark is a forked beard that projects beneath the lower lip. The lutarius, or mud mullet, is held in the lowest esteem of all. This last is always accompanied by another fish known as the sargus, and where the mullet stirs up the mud the other finds aliment for its own sustenance. The mullet that is found on the coast is not highly esteemed, and the most esteemed of all have a strong flavor of shellfish. Fenestella is of opinion that this fish received its name of mullet mullus, from its resemblance to the color of the red or mullet-colored shoes. The mullet spawns three times a year. At all events, the fry makes its appearance that number of times. The masters in gastronomy inform us that the mullet, while dying, assumes a variety of colors and a succession of shades, and that the hue of the red scales, growing paler and paler, 
gradually changes, more especially if it is looked at and closed in glass. Monsieur Apicius, a man who displayed a remarkable degree of ingenuity in everything relating to luxury, was of opinion that it was a most excellent plan to let the mullet die in the pickle known as the garum of the Allies, for we find that even this has found a surname, and he proposed a prize for any one who should invent a new sauce made from the liver of this fish. I find it much easier to relate this fact than to state who it was that gained the prize. CHAPTER Thirty One, ENORMOUS PRICES OF SOME FISH Asinius Seller, a man of consular rank, and remarkable for his prodigal expenditure on this fish, bought one at Rome, during the reign of Caius, at the price of eight thousand sesterces. A reflection upon such a fact as this will at once lead us to turn our thoughts to those who, making loud complaints against luxury, have lamented that a single cook cost more money to buy than a horse while at the present day a cook is only to be obtained for the same sum that a triumph would cost, and a fish is only to be purchased at what was formerly the price for a cook. Indeed, there is hardly any living being held in higher esteem than the man who understands how, in the most scientific fashion, to get rid of his master's property. Licinius Mucianus relates that in the Red Sea there was caught a mullet eighty pounds in weight, what a price would have been paid for it by our epicures, if it had only been found off the shores in the vicinity of our city! CHAPTER Thirty Two, THAT THE SAME KINDS ARE NOT EVERYWHERE EQUALLY ESTEEMED. There is this also in the nature of fish, that some are more highly esteemed in one place, and some in another, such, for instance, as the Carassinus in Egypt, the Zeus, also called the Faber, at Gades, the Salpa, in the vicinity of Ebusus, which is considered elsewhere an unclean fish, and can nowhere be thoroughly cooked wherever found without being first beaten with a stick. In Aquitania, again, the river salmon is preferred to all the fish that swim in the sea. CHAPTER Thirty Three, GILLS AND SCALES Some fishes have numerous gills, others again single ones, others double. It is by means of these that they discharge the water that has entered the mouth. A sign of old age is the hardness of the scales, which are not alike in all. There are two lakes of Italy at the foot of the Alps called Larius and Verbenus, in which there are to be seen every year at the rising of the Virgili a fish remarkable for the number of their scales and the exceeding sharpness of them, strongly resembling hobnails in appearance. These fish, however, are only to be seen during that month, and no longer. CHAPTER Thirty Four, FISHES WHICH HAVE A VOICE, FISHES WITHOUT GILLS Arcadia produces a wonder in its fish called Exocetus, from the fact that it comes ashore to sleep. In the neighborhood of the river Clitorius, this fish is said to be gifted with powers of speech, and to have no gills. By some writers it is called the Adonis. CHAPTER Thirty Five. FISHES WHICH COME ON LAND, THE PROPER TIME FOR CATCHING FISH. THOSE FISH, WHICH ARE ALSO KNOWN BY THE NAME OF SEA MICE, AS WELL AS THE POLYPI AND THE MURENA, ARE IN THE HABIT OF COMING ASHORE. BESIDES WHICH, THERE IS IN THE RIVERS OF INDIA ONE KIND THAT DOES THIS, AND THEN LEAPS BACK AGAIN INTO THE WATER, FOR THEY ARE FOUND TO PASS OVER INTO STANDING WATERS AND STREAMS. MOST FISHES HAVE AN EVIDENT INSTINCT WHICH TEACHES THEM WHERE TO SPAWN IN SAFETY as in such places there are no enemies found to devour their young, while at the same time the waves are much less violent. It will be still more a matter of surprise to find that they thus have an appreciation of cause and effect, and understand the regular recurrence of periods, when we reflect how few persons there are that know that the most favorable time for taking fish is while the sun is passing through the sign of Pisces. CHAPTER Thirty Six classification of fishes according to the shape of the body. Some sea fish are flat, such, for instance, as the rhombus, the sole, and the sea sparrow, which last only differs from the rhombus in the lateral position of the body. The rhombus lies with the right side upwards, while in the sea sparrow the left side is uppermost. Some sea fish, again, are long, as the morena and the conger. CHAPTER Thirty Seven, THE FINS OF FISH AND THEIR MODE OF SWIMMING 
Hence it is that there is a difference also in the fins of fish which have been given them to serve in place of feet, none having more than four, some two only, and others none. It is in Lake Fusinus only that there is a fish found that has eight fins for swimming. Those fishes which are long and slimy have only two at most, such, for instance, as eels and congers. Others, again, have none, such as the murena, which is also without gills. All these fish make their way in the sea by an undulatory motion of the body, just as serpents do on land. On dry land, also, they are able to crawl along, and hence those of this nature are more long-lived than the others. Some of the flat fish, also, have no fins, the pastinaceae, for instance, for these swim broadwise. Those, also, which are known as the soft fish, such as the polypi, for their feet, serve them instead of fins. End of section 30. Recording by Bill Borst. Section 31 of the Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 2 by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 31. Book 9, Chapter 38. Eels. Eels live eight years. They are able to survive out of water as much as six days when a northeast wind blows, but when the south wind prevails, not so many. In winter they cannot live if they are in very shallow water, nor yet if the water is troubled. Hence it is that they are taken, more especially, about the rising of the Vergiliae, when the two rivers are mostly in a turbid state. These animals seek their food at night. They are the only fish the bodies of which, when dead, do not float upon the surface. There is a lake called Banacus, in the territory of Verona in Italy, through which the river, Minis through which the river Mincius flows. At the part of it whence this river issues, once a year, and mostly in the month of October, the lake is troubled, evidently by the constellations of autumn, and the eels are heaped together by the waves, and rolled on by them in such astonishing multitudes that single masses of them, containing more than a thousand in number, are often taken in the chambers, which are formed in the bed of the river for that purpose. CHAPTER Thirty Nine, THE MORENA The morena brings forth every month, while all the other fishes spawn only at stated periods. The eggs of this fish increase with the greatest rapidity. It is a vulgar belief that the morena comes on shore, and is there impregnated by intercourse with serpents. Aristotle calls the male, which impregnates the female, by the name of Zemiris, and says that there is a difference between them, the morena being spotted and weakly, while the Zemiris is all of one color and hardy, and has teeth which project beyond the mouth. In northern Gaul all the morena have on the right jaw seven spots which bear a resemblance to the constellation of the Septentriones, and are of a gold color shining as long as the animal is alive, but disappearing as soon as it is dead. Vadius Polio, a Roman of equestrian rank and one of the friends of the late Emperor Augustus, found a method of exercising his cruelty by means of this animal, for he caused such slaves as had been condemned by him to be thrown into preserves filled with morene, not that the land animals would not have fully sufficed for this purpose, but because he could not see a man so aptly torn to pieces all at once by any other kind of animal. It is said that these fish are driven to madness by the taste of vinegar. Their skin is exceedingly thin, while that of the eel, on the other hand, is much thicker. Various informs us that formerly the children of the Roman citizens, while wearing the pretexta, were flogged with eel-skins, and that for this reason no pecuniary penalty could by law be inflicted upon them. CHAPTER Forty: VARIOUS KINDS OF FLATFISH There is another kind of flatfish which, instead of bones, has cartilage, such, for instance, as the raya, the pastanea, the squatina, the torpedo, and those which under their respective Greek names are known as the ox, the lamia, the eagle, and the frog. In this number also the squally ought to be included, though they are not flatfish. Aristotle was the first to call these fish by the one generic name of selake, which he has given them. We, however, have no mode of distinguishing them, unless, indeed, we choose to call them the cartilaginous fishes. All these fish are carnivorous and feed lying on their backs, just as dolphins do, as already noticed. While the other fishes, too, are oviparous, this one kind, with the exception of that known as the sea-frog, is viviparous, like the cetacea. Chapter 41. 
the echinaeus and its uses in enchantments there is a very small fish that is in the habit of living among the rocks and is known as the echinaeus it is believed that when this has attached itself to the keel of a ship its progress is impeded and that it is from this circumstance that it takes its name for this reason also it has a disgraceful repute as being employed in love filters and for the purpose of retarding judgments and legal proceedings evil properties which are only compensated by a single merit that it possesses it is good for staying fluxes of the womb in pregnant women and preserves the fetus up to birth it is never used however for food aristotle is of opinion that this fish has feet so strong is the resemblance by reason of the form and position of the fins musianius speaks of a murex of larger size than the purple with a head that is neither rough nor round and the shell of which is single and falls in folds on either side he tells us also that some of these creatures once attached themselves to a ship freighted with children of noble birth who were being sent by periander for the purpose of being castrated and that they stopped its course in full sail and he further says that the shellfish which did this service are duly honored in the temple of venus at Cnidos. Trebius Niger says that this fish is a foot in length, and that it can retard the course of vessels five fingers in thickness, besides which it has another peculiar property. When preserved in salt and applied, it is able to draw up gold which has fallen into a well, however deep it may happen to be. Chapter 42. Fishes which change their color. The mena changes its white color, and in summer becomes swarthy. The physis also changes its color, and while at other times it is white, in spring it is parti-colored. This last is the only fish that builds itself a nest. It makes it of seaweed, and there deposits its eggs. Chapter 43. Fishes which fly above the water. The sea swallow. The fish that shines in the night. The horned fish. The sea dragon. The sea swallow, being able to fly, bears a strong resemblance to the bird of that name. The sea kite, too, flies as well. There is a fish that comes up to the surface of the sea, known from the following circumstance as the lantern fish, thrusting from its mouth a tongue that shines like fire. It emits a most brilliant light on calm nights. Another fish, which from its horns has received its name, raises them nearly a foot and a half above the surface of the water. The sea dragon, again, if caught and thrown on the sand, works out a hole for itself with its muzzle, with the most wonderful celerity. Chapter 44. Fishes which have no blood fishes known as soft fish the varieties of fish which we shall now mention are those which have no blood there are three kinds first those which are known as soft next those which have thin crusts and lastly those which are enclosed in hard shells the soft fish are the loligo the sapia the polypus and others of a similar nature these last have the head between the feet and the belly and have all of them eight feet in the sapia and the loliga, two of these feet are very long and rough, and by means of these they lift the food to their mouth, and attach themselves to places in the sea, as though with an anchor. The others act as so many arms, by means of which they seize their prey. Chapter 45. The sapia, the loligo, the scallop. The loligo is also able to dart above the surface of the water, and the scallop does the same, just like an arrow, as it were. In the sapia, the male is parti-colored, blacker than the female, and more courageous. If the female is struck with a fish-spear, the male comes to her aid. But the female, the instant the male is struck, takes to flight. Both of them, as soon as ever they find themselves in danger of being caught, discharge a kind of ink, which with them is in place of blood, and thus, darkening the water, take to flight. Chapter 46. The Polypus. There are numerous kinds of polypi. The land polypus is larger than that of the sea. They all of them use their arms as feet and hands, and in coupling they employ the tail, which is forked and sharp. The polypus has a sort of passage in the back, by which it lets in and discharges water, and which it shifts from side to side, sometimes carrying it on the right and sometimes on the left. It swims obliquely with the head on one side, which is of surprising hardness while the animal is alive, being puffed out with air. In addition to this, they have cavities dispersed throughout the claws, by means of which, through suction, they can adhere to objects, which they hold with the head upwards so tightly that they cannot be torn away. They cannot attach themselves, however, to the bottom of the sea, and their retentive powers are weaker in the larger ones. These are the only soft fish that come on dry land, and then only where the surface is rugged. A smooth surface they will not come near. They feed upon the flesh of shellfish, the shells of which they can easily break in the embrace of their arms. 
Hence it is that their retreat may be easily detected by the pieces of shell which lie before it. Although in other respects this is looked upon as a remarkably stupid kind of animal, so much so that it will swim towards the hand of a man, to a certain extent in its own domestic matters it manifests considerable intelligence. It carries its prey to its home, and after eating all the flesh, throws out the debris, and then pursues such small fish as may chance to swim towards them. It also changes its color according to the aspect of the place where it is, and more especially when it is alarmed. The notion is entirely unfounded that it gnaws its own arms, for it is from the congers that this mischance befalls it, but it is no other than true that its arms shoot forth again like the tail in the colotus and the lizard. Chapter 47 The Nautilus or Sailing Polypus Among the most remarkable curiosities is the animal which has the name of Nautilus, or as some people call it, the Pompilos. Lying with the head upwards, it rises to the surface of the water, raising itself little by little, while by means of a certain conduit in its body it discharges all the water, and this being got rid of, like so much bilge water as it were, it finds no difficulty in sailing along. Then, extending backwards its two front arms, it stretches out between them a membrane of marvellous thinness, which acts as a sail spread out to the wind, while with the rest of its arms it paddles along below, steering itself with its tail in the middle which acts as a rudder. Thus does it make its way along the deep, mimicking the appearance of a light Liburnian bark, while, if anything chances to cause it alarm, in an instant it draws in the water and sinks to the bottom. Chapter 48. The Various Kinds of Polypi, Their Shrewdness. Belonging to the genus of polypi is the animal known as the ozena, being so called from the peculiarly strong smell exhaled by the head, in consequence of which, the murene pursue it with the greatest eagerness. The polypi keep themselves concealed for two months in the year. They do not live beyond two years, and always die of consumption, the females even sooner, and mostly after bringing forth. I must not omit here the observations which L. Lucullus, the proconsul of Betica, made with reference to the polypus, and which Trebius Niger, one of his suite, has published. He says that it is remarkably fond of shellfish, and that these, the moment that they feel themselves touched by it, close their valves and cut off the feelers of the polypus, thus making a meal at the expense of the plunderer. Shellfish are destitute of sight, and indeed all other sensations but those which warn them of hunger and the approach of danger. Hence it is that the polypus lies in ambush till the fish opens its shell, immediately upon which it places within it a small pebble, taking care at the same time to keep it from touching the body of the animal, lest by making some movement it should chance to eject it. Having made itself thus secure, it attacks its prey, and draws out the flesh, while the other tries to contract itself, but all in vain in consequence of the separation of the shell, thus affected by the insertion of the wedge. So great is the instinctive shrewdness in animals that are otherwise quite remarkable for their lumpish stupidity. In addition to the above, the same author states that there is not an animal in existence that is more dangerous for its powers of destroying a human being when in the water. Embracing his body, it counteracts his struggles, and draws him under with its feelers and its numerous suckers, when, as often is the case, it happens to make an attack upon a shipwrecked mariner or a child. If, however, the animal is turned over, it loses all its power, for when it is thrown upon the back, the arms open of themselves. The other particulars, which the same author has given, appear still more closely to border upon the marvellous. At Cartea, in the preserves there, a polypus was in the habit of coming from the sea to the pickling tubs that were left open, and devouring the fish laid in salt there, for it is quite astonishing how eagerly all sea animals follow even the very smell of salted condiments, so much so that it is for this reason that the fishermen take care to rub the inside of the wicker fish kipes with them. At last, by its repeated thefts and immoderate depredations, it drew down upon itself the wrath of the keepers of the works. Palisades were placed before them, but these the polypus managed to get over by the aid of a tree, and it was only caught at last by calling in the assistance of trained dogs, which surrounded it at night, as it was returning to its prey, upon which the keepers, awakened by the noise, were struck with alarm at the novelty of the sight presented. First of all, the size of the polypus was enormous beyond all conception, and then it was covered all over with dried brine and exhaled a most dreadful stench. Who could have expected to find a polypus there, or could have recognized it as such under these circumstances? They really thought that they were joining battle with some monster, 
for at one instant it would drive off the dogs by its horrible fumes and lash at them with the extremities of its feelers, while at another it would strike them with its stronger arms, giving blows with so many clubs as it were, and it was only with the greatest difficulty that it could be dispatched with the aid of a considerable number of three-pronged fish spears. The head of this animal was shown to Lucullus. It was in size as large as a cask of fifteen amphorae, and had a beard, to use the expression of Trabius himself, which could hardly be encircled with both arms, full of knots, like those upon a club, and thirty feet in length. The suckers, or calicules, as large as an urn, resembled a basin in shape, while the teeth again were of a corresponding largeness. Its remains, which were carefully preserved as a curiosity, weighed seven hundred pounds. The same author also informs us that specimens of the sapia and the loligo have been thrown up on the same shores of a size fully as large. In our own seas the loligo is sometimes found five cubits in length, and the sapia two. These animals do not live beyond two years. Chapter 49. The Sailing Nauplius. Mucianus also relates that he had seen in the Propontis another curious resemblance to a ship in full sail. There is a shellfish, he says, with a keel just like that of the vessel which we know by the name of Acatium, with the poop curving inwards and a prow with the beak attached. In this shellfish there lies concealed also an animal known as the Nauplius, which bears a strong resemblance to the sapia and only adopts the shellfish as the companion of its pastimes. There are two modes, he says, which it adopts in sailing. When the sea is calm, the voyager hangs down its arms and strikes the water with a pair of oars, as it were, but if, on the other hand, the wind invites, it extends them, employing them by way of a helm, and turning the mouth of the shell to the wind. The pleasure experienced by the shellfish is that of carrying the other, while the amusement of the Nauplius consists in steering, and thus at the same moment is an instinctive joy felt by these two creatures, devoid as they are of all sense, unless indeed a natural antipathy to man, for it is a well-known fact that to see them thus sailing along is a bad omen, and that it is portentous of misfortune to those who witness it. End of section 31 Section 32 of The Natural History, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 32, Book 9, Chapters 50 to 53. Chapter 50. Sea Animals Which Are Enclosed with a Crust. The Crayfish. The crayfish, which belongs to that class of animals which is destitute of blood, is protected by a brittle crust. This creature keeps itself concealed for five months, and the same is the case with crabs, which disappear for the same period. At the beginning of spring, however, they, both of them, after the manner of snakes, throw off old age and renew their coverings. While other animals swim on the water, crayfish float with a kind of action like creeping. They move onwards, if there is nothing to alarm them, in a straight line, extending on each side their horns, which are rounded at the point by a ball peculiar to them. But, on the other hand, the moment they are alarmed, they straighten these horns and proceed with a sidelong motion. They also use these horns when fighting with each other. The crayfish is the only animal that has the flesh in a pulpy state, and not firm and solid, unless it is cooked alive in boiling water. The crayfish frequents rocky places, the crab spots which present a soft surface. In winter they both choose such parts of the shore as are exposed to the heat of the sun, and in summer they withdraw to the shady recesses of deep inlets of the sea. All fish of this kind suffer from the cold of winter, but become fat during autumn and spring, and more particularly during the full moon, for the warmth of that luminary as it shines in the night renders the temperature of the weather more moderate. Chapter 51. The various kinds of crabs, the pinotheres, the sea urchin, cockles, and scallops. There are various kinds of crabs, known as carabi, astazi, mai, paguri, heracleotisi, lions, and others of less note. The carabus differs from other crabs in having a tail, in Phoenicia, they are called hippoi, or horses, being of such extraordinary swiftness that it is impossible to overtake them. 
Crabs are long-lived and have eight feet, all of which are bent obliquely. In the female, the first foot is double, in the male, single. Besides which, the animal has two claws with indented pincers. The upper part only of these four feet is movable, the lower being immovable. The right claw is the largest in the maw. Sometimes they assemble together in large bodies, but as they are unable to cross the mouth of the Euxine, they turn back again and go round by land, and the road by which they travel is to be seen all beaten down with their footmarks. The smallest crab of any is that known as the Pinotheres, and hence it is peculiarly exposed to danger. Its shrewdness, however, is evinced by its concealing itself in the shell of the oyster, and as it grows larger it removes to those of a larger size. Crabs, when alarmed, go backwards as swiftly as when moving forwards. They fight with one another like rams butting at each other with their horns. They have a mode of curing themselves of the bites of serpents. It is said that while the sun is passing through the sign of cancer, the dead bodies of the crabs, which are lying thrown up on the shore, are transformed into serpents. To the same class also belongs the sea urchin, which has spines in place of feet. Its mode of moving along is to roll like a ball, hence it is that these animals are often found with their prickles rubbed off. Those among them, which have the longest spines of all, are known by the name of a kind of metro, while at the same time their body is the very smallest. They are not all of them of the same glassy color. In the vicinity of Tyrone they are white, with very short spines. The eggs of all of them are bitter and are five in number. The mouth is situate in the middle of the body and faces the earth. It is said that these creatures foreknow the approach of a storm at sea, and that they take up little stones with which they cover themselves, and so provide a sort of ballast against their volubility, for they are very unwilling by rolling along to wear away their prickles. As soon as seafaring persons observe this, they at once moor their ship with several anchors. To the same genus also belong both land and water snails which thrust the body forth from their abode and extend or contract two horns as it were they are without eyes and have therefore to feel their way by means of these horns sea scallops are considered to belong to the same class which also conceal themselves during severe frosts and great heats the onkis too which shine in the dark like fire and in the mouth even while being eaten chapter fifty two various kinds of shellfish let us now pass on to the murex and various kinds of shellfish which have a stronger shell and in which nature in her sportive mood has displayed a great variety so many are the various hues of their tints so numerous are their shapes flat concave long crescent shaped rounded into a globe cut through into a semi-globe arched in the back smooth rough indented streaked the upper part spirally wreathed, the edge projecting in a sharp point, the edge wreathed outwards or else folding inwards, and then, too, there are the various distinctions of raid shells, long-haired shells, wavy-haired shells, channeled shells, pectinated shells, imbricated shells, reticulated shells, shells with lines oblique or rectilinear, thick-set shells, expanded shells, tortuous shells, shells the valves of which are united by one small knot shells which are held together all along one side shells which are open as if in the very act of applauding and shells which wind resembling a conch the fish of this class known as the shells of venus are able to navigate the surface of the deep and presenting to the wind their concave side catch the breeze and sail along on the surface of the sea scallops are also able to leap and fly above the surface of the water and they sometimes employ their shell by way of a bark. Chapter 53. What numerous appliances of luxury are found in the sea. But why mention such trifles as these when I am sensible that no greater inroads have been made upon our morals, and no more rapid advances have been made by luxury, than those effected through the medium of shellfish? Of all the elements that exist, the sea is the one that costs the dearest to the belly seeing that it provides so many kinds of meats, so many dishes, so many exquisite flavors derived from fish, all of which are valued in proportion to the danger undergone by those who have caught them. 
But still, how insignificant is all this when we come to think of our purple, our azure, and our pearls. It was not enough, forsooth, for the spoils of the sea to be thrust down the gullet, but they must be employed as well to adorn the hands, the ears, the head, the whole body, in fact, and that of the men pretty nearly as much as the women. What has the sea to do with our clothes? What is there in common between waves and billows and a sheep's fleece? This one element ought not to receive us, according to ordinary notions, except in a state of nakedness. Let there be ever so strong an alliance between it and the belly, on the score of gluttony, still what can it possibly have to do with the back? It is not enough, forsooth, that we are fed upon what is acquired by perils, but we must be clothed, too, in a similar way. So true it is, that for all the wants of the body, that which is sought at the expense of human life, is sure to please us the most. End of section 32 Recording by Catherine Section 33 of the Natural History, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine the Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder, translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 33, Book 9, Chapters 54 to 59. Chapter 54. Pearls, How They Are Produced, and Where. The first rank, then, and the very highest position among all valuables belongs to the pearl. It is the Indian Ocean that principally sends them to us, and thus have they, amid those monsters so frightful and so huge which we have already described, to cross so many seas and to traverse such lengthened tracts of land scorched by the ardent rays of a burning sun. And then, too, by the Indians themselves, they have to be sought in certain islands and those but very few in number. The most productive of pearls is the island of Tobrobini, and that of Stoides, as already mentioned in the description of the world. Perimula, also a promontory of India. But those are most highly valued which are found in the vicinity of Arabia and the Persian Gulf, which forms a part of the Red Sea. The origin and production of the shellfish is not very different from that of the shell of the oyster. When the genial season of the year exercises its influence on the animal, it is said that, yawning, as it were, it opens its shell and so receives a kind of dew, by means of which it becomes impregnated and that at length it gives birth after many struggles to the burden of its shell in the shape of pearls which vary according to the quality of the dew if this has been in a perfectly pure state when it flowed into the shell then the pearl produced is white and brilliant but if it was turbid then the pearl is of a clouded color also if the sky should happen to have been lowering when it was generated the pearl will be of a pallid color from all which it is quite evident that the quality of the pearl depends much more upon a calm state of the heavens than of the sea and hence it is that it contracts a cloudy hue or a limpid appearance according to the degree of serenity of the sky in the morning. If again the fish is satiated in a reasonable time, then the pearl produced increases rapidly in size. If it should happen to lighten at the time, the animal shuts its shell, and the pearl is diminished in size in proportion to the fast that the animal has to endure. But if, in addition to this, it should thunder, as well, then it becomes alarmed, and closing the shell in an instant produces what is known as phasma or a pearl bubble filled with air and bearing a resemblance to a pearl but in appearance only as it is quite empty and devoid of body these bubbles are formed by the abortion of the shellfish those which are produced in a perfectly healthy state consist of numerous layers so that they may be looked upon not inappropriately as similar in conformation to the callosities on the body of an animal and they should therefore be cleaned by experienced hands it is wonderful, however, that they should be influenced thus pleasurably by the state of the heavens, seeing that by the action of the sun the pearls are turned of a red color and lose all their whiteness, just like the human body. Hence it is that those which keep their whiteness the best are the Pelagiae, or main sea pearls, which lie at too great a depth to be reached by the sun's rays. And yet these even turn yellow with age, grow dull and wrinkled, and it is only in their youth that they possess the brilliancy which is so highly esteemed in them. When old, too, the coat grows thick and they adhere to the shell, from which they can only be separated with the assistance of a file. Those pearls, which have one surface flat and the other spherical, opposite to the plain side, are for that reason called tympania, or tambour pearls. I have seen pearls still adhering to the shell, for which reason the shells were used as boxes for onguents. 
In addition to these facts, we may remark that the pearl is soft in the water, but that it grows hard the instant it is taken out. Chapter 55. How Pearls Are Found The fish, as soon as ever it perceives the hand, shuts its shell and covers up its treasures, being well aware that it is for them that it is sought. And if it happens to catch the hand, it cuts it off with the sharp edge of the shell, and no punishment is there that could be more justly inflicted. There are other penalties added as well, seeing that the greater part of these pearls are only to be found among rocks and crags, while on the other hand those which lie out in the main sea are generally accompanied by sea-dogs. And yet for all this the women will not banish these gems from their ears. Some writers say that these animals live in communities just like swarms of bees, each of them being governed by one remarkable for its size and its venerable old age, while at the same time it is possessed of marvellous skill in taking all due precautions against danger. The divers, they say, take a special care to find these, and once they are taken, the others stray to and fro and are easily caught in their nets. We learn also that as soon as they are taken, they are placed under a thick layer of salt and earthenware vessels. As the flesh is gradually consumed, certain knots which form the pearls are disengaged from their bodies and fall to the bottom of the vessel. Chapter 56. The Various Kinds of Pearls There is no doubt that pearls wear with use, and will change their color if neglected. All their merit consists in their whiteness, large size, roundness, polish, and weight, qualities which are not easily to be found united in the same, so much so indeed that no two pearls are ever found perfectly alike, and it was from this circumstance, no doubt, that our Roman luxury first gave them the name of Unio, or the unique gem, for a similar name is not given them by the Greeks, nor indeed among the barbarians by whom they are found. Are they called anything else but Margariti? Even in the very whiteness of the pearl there is a great difference to be observed. Those are of a much clearer water that are found in the Red Sea, while the Indian pearl resembles in tint the scales of the mirror stone, but exceeds all the others in size. The color that is most highly prized of all is that of those which are thence called alum-colored pearls. Long pearls also have their peculiar value. Those are called alenchi, which are of a long tapering shape, resembling our alabaster boxes in form and ending in a full bulb. Our ladies quite glory in having these suspended from their fingers, or two or three of them dangling from their ears. For the purpose of ministering to these luxurious tastes, there are various names and wearisome refinements which have been devised by profuseness and prodigality. For after inventing these earrings, they have given them the name of crotalia, or castanet pendants, as though quite delighted even with the rattling of the pearls as they knock against each other. And now, at the present day, the poorer classes are even affecting them, as people are in the habit of saying that a pearl worn by a woman in public is as good as a lictor walking before her. Nay, even more than this, they put them on their feet, and that not only on the laces of their sandals, but all over the shoes. It is not enough to wear pearls, but they must tread upon them and walk with them under foot as well. Pearls used formerly to be found in our sea, but more frequently about the Thracian Bosporus. They were of a red color and small, and enclosed in a shellfish known by the name of Maes. In Arcanania there is a shellfish called Pina, which produces pearls, and from this it is quite evident that it is not one kind of fish only that produces them. Juba states also that on the shores of Arabia there is a shellfish which resembles a notched comb, and covered all over with hair like a sea urchin, and that the pearl lies embedded in its flesh, in appearance bearing a strong resemblance to a hailstone. No such shellfish, however, as these are ever brought to Rome, nor yet are any pearls of value found in Arcanania, being shapeless, rough, and of a marble hue. Those are better which are found in the vicinity of Actium, but still they are small, which is the case also with those found on the coast of Mauritania. Alexander Polyhister and Sudanese are of opinion that as they grow old, their tints gradually fade. Chapter 57. Remarkable Facts Connected with Pearls. Their Nature. It is quite clear that the interior of the pearl is solid, as no fall is able to break it. Pearls are not always found in the middle of the body of the animal, but sometimes in one place and sometimes another. Indeed, I have seen some which lay at the edge of the shell, just as though in the very act of coming forth, and in some fishes as many as four or five. Up to the present time, very few have been found which exceeded half an ounce in weight by more than one scruple. It is a well-ascertained fact that in Britannia pearls are found, though small and of a bad color, for the deified Julius Caesar wished it to be distinctly understood that the breastplate which he dedicated to Venus Genetrix in her temple was made of British pearls. Chapter 58. 
instances of the use of pearls i once saw lolia paulina the wife of the emperor caius it was not at any public festival or any solemn ceremonial but only at an ordinary wedding entertainment covered with emeralds and pearls which shone in alternate layers upon her head in her hair in her wreaths in her ears upon her neck in her bracelets and on her fingers and the value of which amounted in all to forty millions of sesterces indeed she was prepared at once to prove the fact by showing the receipts and acquittances nor were these any presents made by a prodigal potentate but treasures which had descended to her from her grandfather and obtained by the spoliation of the provinces such are the fruits of plunder and extortion it was for this reason that m lolius was held so infamous all over the east for the presents which he extorted from the kings the result of which was that he was denied the friendship of caius caesar and took poison and all this was done i say that his granddaughter might be seen by the glare of lamps covered all over with jewels to the amount of forty millions of sesterces now let a person only picture to himself on the one hand what was the value of the habits worn by curious or fabricious in their triumphs let him picture to himself the objects displayed to the public on their triumphal litters and then on the other hand let him think upon this lolia this one bit of a woman the head of an empire taking her place at table thus attired would he not much rather that the conquerors had been torn from their very chariots than that they had conquered for such a result as this nor indeed are these the most supreme evidences of luxury there were formerly two pearls the largest that had been ever seen in the whole world cleopatra the last of the queens of egypt was in possession of them both they having come to her by descent from the kings of the east when antony had been sated by her day after day with the most exquisite banquets this queenly courtesan inflated with vanity and disdainful arrogance affected to treat all this sumptuousness and all these vast preparations with the greatest contempt upon which antony inquired what there was that could possibly be added to such extraordinary magnificence to this she made answer that on a single entertainment she would expend ten millions of sesterces antony was extremely desirous to learn how that could be done but looked upon it as a thing quite impossible and a wager was the result on the following day upon which the matter was to be decided in order that she might not lose the wager she had an entertainment set before antony magnificent in every respect though no better than his usual repast upon this antony choked her and inquired what was the amount expended upon it to which she made answer that the banquet which he then beheld was only a trifling appendage to the real banquet and that she alone would consume at the meal to the ascertained value of that amount she herself would swallow the ten millions of sesterces and so ordered the second course to be served in obedience to her instructions the servants placed before her a single vessel which was filled with vinegar a liquid the sharpness and strength of which is able to dissolve pearls at this moment she was wearing in her ears those choicest and most rare and unique productions of nature and while antony was waiting to see what she was going to do taking one of them from out of her ear she threw it into the vinegar and directly it was melted swallowed it lucius plancus who had been named umpire in the wager placed his hand upon the other at the very instant that she was making preparations to dissolve it in a similar manner and declared that antony had lost an omen which in the result was fully confirmed the fame of the second pearl is equal to that which attends its fellow after the queen who had thus come off victorious on so important a question had been seized it was cut asunder in order that this the other half of the entertainment might serve as pendants for the ears of venus in the pantheon at rome chapter fifty nine how pearls first came into use at rome antony and cleopatra however will not bear away the palm of prodigality in this respect and will be stripped of even this boast in the annals of luxury for before their time clodius the son of the tragic actor esopus had done the same at rome having been left by his father heir to his ample wealth and possessions let not antony then be too proud for all his trumpery since he can hardly stand in comparison with an actor one too who had no wager to induce him a thing which adds to the regal munificence of the act but was merely desirous of trying by way of glorification to his palate what was the taste of pearls as he found it to be wonderfully pleasing that he might not be the only one to know it he had a pearl set before each of his guests for him to swallow after the surrender of alexandria pearls came into common and indeed universal use at rome but they first began to be used about the time of scylla though but of small size and of little value 
Fenestella says, in this, however, it is quite evident that he is mistaken, for Elias Stilo tells us that it was in the time of the Jugurthine War that the name of Unio was first given to pearls of remarkable size. End of section 33. Recording by Catherine. Section 34 of The Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bianca. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 34. Chapter 60. The Nature of the Murex and the Purple. And yet, pearls may be looked upon as pretty nearly a possession of everlasting duration. They descend from a man to his heir, and they are alienated from one to another, just like any landed estate. But the colors that are extracted from the murex and the purple fade from hour to hour, and yet luxury, which has similarly acted as a mother to them, has set upon them prices almost equal to those of pearls. Purples live mostly seven years. Like the murex, they keep themselves in concealment for thirty days about the time of the rising of the dog star. In the spring season, they unite in large bodies and by rubbing against each other, produce a vicious spittle from which a kind of wax is formed. The murex does the same. But the purple has that exquisite juice which is so greatly sought after for the purpose of dyeing cloth, situate in the middle of the throat. This secretion consists of a tiny drop contained in a white vein, from which the precious liquid used for dyeing is distilled, being of a tint of a rose somewhat inclining to black. The rest of the body is entirely destitute of this juice. It is a great point to take the fish alive, for when it dies, it spits out its juice. From the larger ones, it is extracted after taking off the shell, but the small fish are crushed alive, together with the shells, upon which they eject this secretion. In Asia, the best purple is that of Tyre, in Africa that of Menix, and the parts of Gatulia that border on the ocean, and in Europe that of Laconia. It is for this color that the fasces and the axes of Rome make way in the crowd. It is this that asserts the majesty of childhood. It is this that distinguishes the senator from the man of equestrian rank. By persons arrayed in this color are prayers addressed to propitiate the gods. On every garment it sheds a luster, and in triumphal vestment it is to be seen mingled with gold. Let us be prepared, then, to excuse this frantic passion for purple, even though at the same time we are compelled to inquire why it is that such a high value has been set upon the produce of this shellfish, seeing that, while in the dye, the smell of it is offensive, and the color itself is harsh, of a greenish hue, and strongly resembling that of the sea when in a tempestuous state. The tongue of the purple is a finger in length, and by means of this it finds subsistence. By piercing other shellfish, so hard is the point of it. They die in fresh water, and in places where rivers discharge themselves into the sea. Otherwise, when taken, they will live as long as fifty days on their saliva. All shellfish grow very fast, and purples more especially. They come to their full size at the end of a year. Chapter 61 the different kinds of purples. Were I at this point to pass on to other subjects, luxury no doubt would think itself defrauded of its due, and so accuse me of negligence. I must therefore make my way into the very workshops even, so that, just as among articles of food the various kinds and qualities of corn are known, all those who place the enjoyment of life in these luxuries may have a still better acquaintance with the objects for which they live. There are two kinds of fish that produce the purple color. The elements in both are the same. The combinations only are different. The smaller fish is that which is called the buccinum, from its resemblance to the conch by which the sound of the buccinus or trumpet is produced, 
and to this circumstance it owes its name. The opening in it is round, with an incision in the margin. The other fish is known as the purpura, or purple, and has a grooved and projecting muzzle, which, being tubulated on one side in the interior, forms a passage for the tongue, besides which the shell is studded with points up to the very apex, which are mostly seven in number and disposed in a circle. These are not found on the buccinum, though both of them have as many spirals as they are years old. The buccinum attaches itself only to crags and is gathered about rocky places. Purples also have another name, that of Pelagiae. There are numerous kinds of them, which differ only in their element and place of abode. There is the mud purple, which is nurtured upon putrid mud, and the seaweed purple, which feeds on seaweed, both of which are held in the very lowest esteem. A better kind is the reef purple, which is collected on the reefs or out at sea. Still, however, the color extracted from this is too light and thin. Then again, there is the variety known as the pebble purple, so called from the pebbles of the sea, and wonderfully well adapted for dyeing. And, better than any of them, that known by the name of Dialutensis, because of the various natures of the soil on which it feeds. Purples are taken with a kind of osier kype of small size and with large meshes. These are cast into the sea and in them cockles are put as a bait, that close the shell in an instant and snap at an object, just as we see mussels do. Though half dead, these animals, as soon as ever they are returned to the sea, come to life again and open their shells with avidity, upon which the purples seek them and commence the attack by protruding their tongues. The cockles, on the other hand, the moment they feel themselves pricked, shut their shells and hold fast the object that has wounded them. In this way, victims to their greediness, they are drawn up to the surface, hanging by the tongue. Chapter 62 how wools are dyed with the juices of the purple. The most favorable season for taking these fish is after the rising of the dog star, or else before spring. For when they have once discharged their waxy secretion, their juices have no consistency. This, however, is a fact unknown in the dyers' workshops, although it is a point of primary importance. After it is taken, the vein is extracted, which we have previously spoken of, to which it is requisite to add salt, a sextarius about to every hundred pounds of juice. It is sufficient to leave them to steep for a period of three days, and no more, for the fresher they are, the greater virtue there is in the liquor. It is then set to boil in vessels of tin, and every hundred amphorae ought to be boiled down to five hundred pounds of dye, by the application of a moderate heat for which purpose the vessel is placed at the end of a long funnel, which communicates with the furnace. While thus boiling, the liquor is skimmed from time to time, and with it the flesh, which necessarily adheres to the veins. About the tenth day, generally, the whole contents of the cauldron are in a liquefied state, upon which a fleece, from which the grease has been cleansed, is plunged into it by way of making trial, but until such time as the color is found to satisfy the wishes of those preparing it, the liquor is still kept on the boil. The tint that inclines to red is looked upon as inferior to that which is of a blackish hue. The wool is left to lie in soak for five hours, and then, after carding it, it is thrown in again, until it has fully imbibed the color. The juice of the buccinum is considered very inferior if employed by itself, as it is found to discharge its color, but when used in conjunction with that of the Pelagiae, it blends with it very well, gives a bright luster to its color, which is otherwise too dark, and imparts the shining crimson hue of the Kermes berry, a tint that is particularly valued. By the admixture of their respective virtues, these colors are thus heightened or rendered somber by the aid of one another. The proper proportions for mixing are, for 50 pounds of wool, 200 pounds of juice of the buccinum and 111 of juice of the pelagiae. From this combination is produced the admirable tint known as 
amethyst color. To produce the Tyrian hue, the wool is soaked in the juice of the Pelagia while the mixture is in an uncooked and raw state, after which its tint is changed by being dipped in the juice of the Buckingham. It is considered of the best quality when it has exactly the color of clotted blood, and is of a blackish hue to the sight, but of a shining appearance when held up to the light. Hence it is that we find Homer speaking of purple blood. Chapter 63 When purple was first used at Rome, when the laticlae vestment and the pretexta were first worn. I find that, from the very first, purple has been in use at Rome, but that Romulus employed it for the Trebia. As to the toga pretexta and the laticlae vestment, it is a fact well ascertained that Tullus Hostilius was the first king who made use of them, and that after the conquest of the Etruscans, Cornelius Nepos, who died in the reign of the late Emperor Augustus, has left the following remarks. In the days of my youth, says he, the violet purple was in favor, a pound of which used to sell at one hundred denarii. And not long after, the Tarentine red was all the fashion. This last was succeeded by the Tyrian Daibafa, which could not be bought for even one thousand denarii per pound. P. Lentulus Spinter, the curial edile, was the first who used the Daibafa for the pretexta, and he was greatly censured for it. Whereas nowadays, says he, who is there that does not have purple hangings to his banqueting couches even? This Swinter was edile in the consulship of Cicero, and in the year from the building of the city, 691. Daibafa was the name given to textures that had been doubly dyed, and these were looked upon as a mighty piece of costly extravagance, while now, at the present day, nearly all the purple cloths that are reckoned of any account are dyed in a similar manner. Chapter 64 Fabrics called conciliated. Fabrics that are called conciliated are subjected to the same process in all other respects, but without any admixture of the juice of the buccinum, in addition to which, the liquid is mixed with water and human urine in equal parts, one half only of the proportion of dye being used for the same quantity of wool. From this mixture, a full color is not obtained, but that pale tint, which is so highly esteemed, and the clearer it is, the less of it the wool has imbibed. The prices of these dyes vary in proportion to the quantity produced by the various shores. Still, however, those who are in the habit of paying enormous prices for them may as well be informed that on no occasion ought the juice of the Pelagiae to exceed fifty, and that of the Buckingham one hundred sesterces for one hundred pounds. Chapter 65 The Amethyst, the Tyrian, the Hiskinian, and the Crimson Tints But no sooner have we finished with one branch of this subject, than we have to begin upon another, for we find that it is made quite a matter of sport to create expense, and not only this, but the sport must be doubled by making new mixtures and combinations, and falsifying over again what was a falsification of the works of nature already, such, for instance, as staining tortoise shell, alloying gold with silver for the purpose of making electrum, and then adding copper to the mixture to make Corinthian metal. It was not sufficient to have borrowed from a precious stone the name of amethyst for a dye, but when we have obtained this color, we must drench it over again with Tyrian tints, so that we may have an upstart name, compounded of both, and at the same moment a twofold display of luxury. For as soon as ever people have succeeded in obtaining the conciliated color, they immediately begin to think that it will do better as a state of transition to the Tyrian use. There can be little doubt that this invention is due to some artist who happened to change his mind and alter a tint with which he was not pleased. Hence, a system has taken its rise, and spirits, 
ever on the rack for creating wonders, had transformed what was originally a blunder into something quite desirable. While at the same time, a double path has been pointed out to luxury, in thus making one color carry another, and thereby become, as they say, softer and more mellow. And what is even more than this, human ingenuity has even learned to mingle with these dyes the productions of the earth, and to steep in Tyrian purple fabrics already dyed crimson with the berry of the kermis, in order to produce the Hiskinian tint. The kermis of Galatia, a red berry, which we shall mention when we come to speak of the productions of the earth, is the most esteemed of all, except, perhaps, the one that grows in the vicinity of Amorita, in Lusitania. However, to make an end, once and for all, of my description of these precious dyes, I shall remark that the color yielded by this grain, when a year old, is of a pallid hue, and that if it is more than four years old, it is quickly discharged. Hence, we find that its energies are not developed either when it is too young, or when old. I have now abundantly treated of an art, by means of which men, just as much as women, have an idea that their appearance may be set off to the greatest possible advantage. Chapter 66 The Pinna and the Pinotheres Belonging to the shellfish tribe, there is the Pinna also. It is found in slimy spots, always lying upright and never without a companion, which some writers call the Pinotheres and others again Pinophylax, being a small kind of shrimp or else a parasitical crab. The pinna, which is destitute of sight, opens its shell and in doing so exposes its body within to the attacks of the small fish, which immediately rush upon it and finding that they can do so with impunity, become bolder and bolder, till at last they quite fill the shell. The pinotheres, looking out for the opportunity, gives notice to the pinna at the critical moment by a gentle bite, upon which the other instantly closes its shell, and so kills whatever it has caught there, after which it divides the spoil with its companion. Chapter 67 The sensitiveness of water animals, the torpedo, the pastinaca, the scolopendra, the glanis, and the ramfish. Upon reflecting on such facts as these, I am the more inclined to wonder at the circumstance that some persons have been found who were of the opinion that the water animals are devoid of all sense. The torpedo is very well aware of the extent of its own powers, and that too, although it experiences no benumbing effect from them itself. Lying concealed in the mud, it awaits the approach of the fish and, at the moment that they are swimming above in supposed security, communicates the shock and instantly darts upon them. There is no delicate morsel in existence that is preferred to the liver of this fish. And no less wonderful, too, is the shrewdness manifested by the sea frog, which is known by us as the fisher. Stirring up the mud, it protrudes from the surface two little horns, which project from beneath the eyes and so attracts the small fish which are sporting around it, until at last they approach so close that it is able to seize them. In a similar manner, too, the squatina and the rhombus conceal themselves, but extend their fins, which, as they move to and fro, resemble little worms. The ray also does the same. The pastinaca, too, lies lurking in ambush, and pierces the fish as they pass with the sting with which it is armed. Another proof of instinctive shrewdness is the fact that although the ray is the very slowest of all the fish in its movements, it is found with a mullet in its belly, which is the swiftest of them all. The scolopendra, which bears a strong resemblance to the land insect, which we call a centipede, if it chances to swallow a hook, will vomit forth all its intestines, until it has disengaged itself, after which it will suck them in again. The sea fox, too, when exposed to a similar peril, goes on swallowing the line until it meets with the weak part of it, and then, with its teeth, 
snaps it asunder with the greatest ease. The fish called the glanis is more cautious. It bites at the hooks from behind and does not swallow them, but only strips them of the bait. The sea ram commits its ravages just like a wary robber. At one time it will lurk in the shadow of some large vessel that is lying out at sea and wait for anyone who may be tempted to swim, while at another it will raise its head from the surface of the water survey the fishermen's boats and then slyly swim towards them and sink them end of section 34 recording by bianca in utrecht the netherlands november 2011section 35 of the natural history volume 2 this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 35, Book 9, Chapters 68 to 78. Chapter 68, Bodies which have a third nature that of the animal and vegetable combined, the sea nettle. Indeed, for my own part, I am strongly of opinion that there is sense existing in those bodies which have the nature of neither animals nor vegetables, but a third which partakes of them both, sea nettles and sponges, I mean. The sea nettle wanders to and fro by night, and at night changes its locality. These creatures are by nature a sort of fleshy branch, and are nurtured upon flesh. They have the power of producing an itching, smarting pain, just like that caused by the nettle found on land. For the purpose of seeking its prey, it contracts and stiffens itself to the utmost possible extent, and then, as a small fish swims past, it will suddenly spread out its branches, and so seize and devour it. At another time, it will assume the appearance of being quite withered away, and let itself be tossed to and fro by the waves like a piece of seaweed, until it happens to touch a fish. The moment it does so, the fish goes to rub itself against a rock, to get rid of the itching, immediately upon which the nettle pounces upon it. By night, also, it is on the lookout for scallops and sea urchins. When it perceives a hand approaching it, it instantly changes its color and contracts itself. When touched, it produces a burning sensation, and if ever so short a time is afforded, makes its escape. Its mouth is situate, it is said, at the root or lower part, and the excrements are discharged by a small canal situated above. Chapter 69. Sponges. The various kinds of them, and where they are produced. Proofs that they are gifted with life by nature. We find three kinds of sponges mentioned. The first are thick, very hard and rough, and are called tragi. The second are thick, and much softer, and are called mani. Of the third, being fine and of a closer texture, tents for sores are made. This last is known as Achillium. All of these sponges grow on rocks and feed upon shell and other fish and slime. It would appear that these creatures too have some intelligence, for as soon as ever they feel the hand about to tear them off, they contract themselves and are separated with much greater difficulty. They do the same also when the waves buffet them to and fro. The small shells that are found in them clearly show that they live upon food. About to Rhone, it is even said that they will survive after they have been detached, and that they grow again from the roots which have been left adhering to the rock. They leave a color similar to that of blood upon the rock from which they have been detached, and those more especially which are produced in the Syrtes of Africa. The manos is the one that grows to the largest size, but the softest of all are those found in the vicinity of Lycia, where the sea is deep and calm. They are more particularly soft, while those which are found in the Hellespont are rough, and those in the vicinity of Malaya coarse. When lying in places exposed to the sun, they become putrid. Hence, it is that those which are found in deep water are the best. While they are alive, they are of the same blackish color that they are when saturated with water. They adhere to the rock not by one part only, nor yet by the whole body, and within them there are a number of empty tubes, generally four or five in number, by means of which, it is thought, they take their food. There are other tubes also, but these are closed at the upper extremity, and a sort of membrane is supposed to be spread beneath the roots by which they adhere. It is well known that sponges are very long-lived. 
The most inferior kind of all are those which are called ecclesia, because it is impossible to clean them. These have large tubes, while the other parts of them are thick and coarse. Chapter 70 Dogfish Vast numbers of dogfish infest the seas in the vicinity of the sponges, to the great peril of those who dive for them. These persons say that a sort of dense cloud gradually thickens over their heads, bearing the resemblance of some kind of animal like a flatfish, and that pressing downward upon them, it prevents them from returning to the surface. It is for this reason that they carry stilettos with them, which are very sharp at the point and attached to them by strings, for if they did not pierce the object with the help of these, it could not be got rid of. This, however, is entirely the result, in my opinion, of the darkness and their own fears, for no person has ever yet been able to find, among living creatures, the fish cloud or the fish fog, the name which they give to this enemy of theirs. The divers, however, have terrible combats with the dogfish, which attack with avidity the groin, the heels, and all the whiter parts of the body. The only means of ensuring safety is to go boldly to meet them, and so, by taking the initiative, strike them with alarm. For, in fact, this animal is just as frightened at man as man is at it, and they are on quite an equal footing when beneath the water. But the moment the diver has reached the surface, the danger is much more imminent for he loses the power of boldly meeting his adversary while he is endeavouring to make his way out of the water, and his only chance of safety is in his companions who draw him along by a cord that is fastened under his shoulders. And while he is engaging with the enemy, he keeps pulling this cord with his left hand, according as there may be any sign of immediate peril, while with the right he wields the stiletto which he is using in his defence. At first they draw him along at a moderate pace, but as soon as ever they have got him close to the ship, if they do not whip him out in an instant with the greatest possible celerity, they see him snapped asunder, and many a time, too, the diver, even when already drawn out, is dragged from their hands through neglecting to aid the efforts of those who are assisting him by rolling up his body in the shape of a ball. The others, it is true, are in the meantime brandishing their pronged fish spears, but the monster has the craftiness to place himself beneath the ship, and so wage the warfare in safety. Consequently, every possible care is taken by the divers to look out for the approach of this enemy. It is the surest sign of safety to see flatfish, which never frequent the spots where these noxious monsters are found, and it is for this reason that the divers call them sacred. Chapter 71 Fishes which are enclosed in a stony shell Sea animals which have no sensation Other animals which live in the mud Those animals, however, it must be admitted, which lie enclosed in a stony shell, have no sensation whatever, such as the oyster, for instance. Many, again, have the same nature as vegetables, such as the holothoria, the pulmones, and the sea stars. Indeed, I may say that there is no land production which has not its like in the sea. No, not even those insects which frequent our public houses in summer and are so troublesome with their nimble leaps, nor yet those which more especially make the human hair their place of refuge for these are often drawn up in a mass collected around the bait. This, too, is supposed to be the reason why the sleep of fish is sometimes so troubled in the night. Upon some fish, indeed, these animals breed as parasites. Among these we find the fish known as the chalices. Chapter 72 Venomous Sea Animals Nor yet are dire and venomous substances found wanting in the sea such, for instance, as the sea hare of the Indian seas, which is even poisonous by the very touch, and immediately produces vomiting and disarrangement of the stomach. In our seas, it has the appearance of a shapeless mass, and only resembles the hare in color. In India, it resembles it in its larger size and in its hair, which is only somewhat coarser. There it is never taken alive. An equally deadly animal is the sea spider which is especially dangerous, for a sting which it has on the back. But there is nothing that is more to be dreaded than the sting which protrudes from the tail of the trigon, by our people known as the pastanaka, a weapon five inches in length. Fixing this in the root of a tree, the fish is able to kill it. It can pierce armor, too, just as though with an arrow, and to the strength of iron it adds all the corrosive qualities of poison. Chapter 73 the maladies of fishes. We do not find it stated that all kinds of fishes are subject to epizootic diseases, like other animals of a wild nature. 
but it is evidently the fact that individuals among them are attacked by maladies from the emaciated appearance that many present while at the same moment others of the same species are taken quite remarkable for their fatness chapter seventy four the generation of fishes the curiosity and wonder which have been excited in mankind by this subject will not allow me any longer to defer giving an account of the generation of these animals fishes couple by rubbing their bellies against one another an operation however that is performed with such extraordinary celerity as to escape the sight dolphins also and other animals of the cetaceous kind couple in a similar manner though the time occupied in doing so is somewhat longer the female fish at the season for coupling follows the male and strikes against its belly with its muzzle while the male in its turn when the female is about to spawn follows it and devours the eggs but with them the simple act of coupling is not sufficient for the purposes of reproduction it is necessary for the male to pass among the eggs which the female has produced in order to sprinkle them with its vitalizing fluid this does not however reach all the eggs out of so vast a multitude indeed if it did the seas and lakes would soon be filled seeing that each female produces these eggs in quantities innumerable the eggs of fishes grow in the sea some of them with the greatest rapidity those of the murena for instance others again somewhat more slowly those among the flatfishes whose tails or stings are not in the way as well as those of the turtle kind couple the one upon the other the polypus by attaching one of its feelers to the nostrils of the female the sepia and lolligo by means of the tongue uniting the arms they then swim contrary ways these last also bring forth at the mouth the polypi however couple with the head downwards toward the ground while the rest of the soft fish couple backwards in the same manner as the dog crayfish and shrimps do the same and crabs employ the mouth frogs leap the one upon the other the male with its fore feet clasping the armpits of the female and with its hinder ones the haunches the female produces tiny pieces of black flesh which are known by the name of gerini and are only to be distinguished by the eyes and tail very soon however the feet are developed and the tail becoming bifurcate forms the hind legs it is a most singular thing that after a life of six months duration frogs melt away into slime though no one ever sees how it is done after which they come to life again in the water during the spring just as they were before this is effected by some occult operation of nature and happens regularly every year mussels also and scallops are produced in the sand by the spontaneous operations of nature and those which have a harder shell such as the murex and the purple are formed from a viscous fluid like saliva just as gnats are produced from the liquids turned sour and the fish called the apua from the foam of the sea when warm after the fall of a shower those fish again which are covered with a stony coat such as the oyster are produced from mud in a putrid state or else from the foam that has collected around ships which have been lying for a long time in the same position about posts driven into the earth and more especially around logs of wood it has been discovered of late years in the oyster beds that the animal discharges an impregnating liquid which has the appearance of milk eels again rub themselves against rocks upon which the particles which they thus scrape from off their bodies come to life such being their only means of reproduction the various kinds of fishes do not couple out of their own kind with the exception of the squatina and the ray the fish that is produced from the union of these two resembles a ray in the forepart and bears a name among the greeks compounded of the two certain animals are produced only at certain seasons of the year both in water and on the land such for instance as scallops snails and leeches in the spring which also disappear at stated periods among fishes the wolf-fish and the trichias bring forth twice in the year as also do all kinds of rock-fish the mullet and the chalcis thrice in the year the cyprinus six times the scorpina twice and the sargus in spring and autumn among the flat-fish the squatina brings forth twice a year being the only one that does so at the setting of the virgilie in the autumn most fish spawn in the three months of april may and june the salpa brings forth in the autumn the sargus the torpedo and the squalus about the time of the autumnal equinox the soft fishes bring forth in spring the sepia every month in the year its eggs adhere together with a kind of black glutinous substance in appearance like a bunch of grapes and the male is very careful to go among them and breathe upon them as otherwise they would be barren 
the polypi couple in winter and produce eggs in the spring twisted in spiral clusters in a similar manner to the tendrils of the vine and so remarkably prolific are they that when the animal is killed in a state of pregnancy the cavities of the head are quite unable to contain the multitude of eggs enclosed therein they bring forth these eggs at the fiftieth day but in consequence of the vast number of them great multitudes perish crayfish and other sea animals with a thinner crust lay their eggs one upon the other and then sit upon them the female polypus sometimes sits upon its eggs and at other times closes the entrance of its retreat by spreading out its feelers interlaced like a net the sepia brings forth on dry land among reeds or such seaweed as it may find growing there and hatches its eggs on the fifteenth day the loligo produces its eggs out at sea clustered together like those of the sepia the purple the murex and other fishes of the same kind bring forth in the spring sea urchins have their eggs at full moon during the winter sea snails also are produced during the winter season chapter seventy five fishes which are both oviparous and viviparous the torpedo is known to have as many as eighty young ones it produces within itself very soft eggs which it then transfers to another place in the uterus and from that part ejects them the same is the case with all those fish to which we have given the name of cartilaginous hence it is that these alone of all the fishes are at once viviparous and oviparous the male salurus is the only fish among them all that watches the eggs after they are brought forth often for as long a period as fifty days that they may not be devoured by other fish the females of other kinds bring forth their eggs in the course of three days if the male has only touched them chapter seventy six fishes the belly of which opens in spawning and then closes again the sea needle or the baloney is the only fish in which the multitude of its eggs in spawning causes the belly to open asunder but immediately after it has brought forth the wound heals again a thing which it is said is the case with the blind worm as well the sea mouse digs a hole in the earth deposits its eggs there and then covers them up on the thirtieth day it opens the hole and leads its young to the water chapter seventy seven fishes which have a womb those which impregnate themselves the fishes called the erythenus and the chani are said to have a womb and those which by the greeks are called trochi it is said impregnate themselves the young of all aquatic animals are without sight at their birth chapter seventy eight the longest lives known amongst fishes we have lately heard of a remarkable instance of length of life in fish posilipum is the name of a villa in campania not far from neapolis here as we learn from the works of m aeneas seneca a fish is known to have died sixty years after it had been placed in the preserves of caesar by vidius polio while others of the same kind and its equals in age were living at the time that he wrote this mention of fish preserves reminds me that i ought to mention a few more particulars connected with this subject before we leave the aquatic animals end of section thirty five recording by catherine Section 36 of the Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Mattingly. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 36. Chapter 79 the first person that formed artificial oyster beds. The first person who formed artificial oyster beds was Sergius Orata, who established them at Baiae in the time of L. Crassus, the orator, just before the Marsic War. This was done by him not for the gratification of gluttony, but of avarice, as he contrived to make a large income by this exercise of his ingenuity. He was the first, too, to invent hanging baths, and after buying villas and trimming them up, he would, every now and then, sell them again. He, too, was the first to adjudge the preeminence for delicacy of flavour to the oysters of Lake Lucrinus, for every kind of aquatic animal is superior in one place to what it is in another. Thus, for instance, the wolf-fish of the river Tiber is the best that is caught between the two bridges, and the turbot of Ravenna is the most esteemed. The Morena of Sicily, the Elops of Rhodes, 
the same too as to the other kinds, not to go through all the items of the culinary catalogue. The British shores had not as yet sent their supplies at the time when Orata thus ennobled the Lucrine oyster. At a later period, however, it was thought worth while to fetch oysters all the way from Brundisium at the very extremity of Italy, and in order that there might exist no rivalry between the two flavours, a plan has been more recently hit upon of feeding the oysters of Brundisium in Lake Lucrinus, famished as they must naturally be after so long a journey. Chapter 80. Who was the first inventor of preserves for other fish? In the same age also, Licinius Murena was the first to form preserves for other fish, and his example was soon followed by the noble families of the Philippi and the Hortensii. Lucullus had a mountain pierced near Naples at a greater outlay even than that which had been expended on his villa, and here he formed a channel and admitted the sea to his preserves. It is for this reason that Pompeius Magnus gave him the name of Xerxes in a toga. After his death, the fish and his preserves were sold for the sum of four million sesterces. Chapter 81. Who invented preserves for Morenae? C. Hyrus was the first person who formed preserves for the Morena, and it was he who lent six thousand of these fishes for the triumphal banquets of Caesar the Dictator, on which occasion he had them duly weighed as he declined to receive the value of them in money or any other commodity. His villa, which was of a very humble character in the interior, sold for four millions of sesterces, in consequence of the valuable nature of the stock-ponds there. Next after this there arose a passion for individual fish. At Bauli, in the territory of Baiae, the orator Hortensius had some fish preserves, in which there was a murena to which he became so much attached as to be supposed to have wept on hearing of its death. It was at the same villa that Antonia, the wife of Drusus, placed earrings upon a morena which she had become fond of, the report of which singular circumstance attracted many visitors to the place. Chapter 82. Who invented preserves for sea snails? Fulvius Lupinus first formed preserves for sea snails in the territory of Tarquinii, shortly before the civil war between Caesar and Pompeius Magnus. He also carefully distinguished them by their several species, separating them from one another. The white ones were those that are produced in the district of Riati. Those of Illyria were remarkable for the largeness of their size, while those from Africa were the most prolific. Those, however, from the promontory of the sun were the most esteemed of all. For the purpose also of fattening them, he invented a mixture of boiled wine, spelt meal, and other substances so that fattened periwinkles even became quite an object of gastronomy, and the art of breeding them was brought to such a pitch of perfection that the shell of a single animal would hold as much as eighty quadrantes. This we learn from M. Taro. Chapter 83. Land Fishes Besides these, there are still some wonderful kinds of fishes which we find mentioned by Theophrastus. He says that when the waters subside, which have been admitted for the purpose of irrigation in the vicinity of Babylon, there are certain fish which remain in such holes as may contain water. From these they come forth for the purpose of feeding, moving along with their fins by the aid of a rapid movement of the tail. If pursued, he says, they retreat to their holes, and when they have reached them will turn round and make a stand. The head is like that of the sea-frog, while the other parts are similar to those of the gobio, and they have gills like other fish. He says also that in the vicinity of Heraclea and Cromna, and about the river Lycus, as well as in many parts of the Euxine, there is one kind of fish which frequents the waters near the banks of the rivers, and makes holes for itself, in which it lives, even when the water retires and the bed of the river is dry. For which reason these fishes have to be dug out of the ground, and only show by the movement of the body that they are still alive. He says also that in the vicinity of the same Heraclea where the river Lycus ebbs, the eggs are left in the mud, and that the fish on being produced from these go forth to seek their food by means of a sort of fluttering motion, their gills being but very small, in consequence of which they are not in need of water. 
For this reason it is that eels also can live so long out of water, and that their eggs come to maturity on dry land like those of the sea tortoise. In the same regions also of the Euxine, he says, various kinds of fishes are overtaken by the ice, the gobio more particularly, and that they only betray signs of life by moving when they have warmth applied by the saucepan. All these things, however, though very remarkable, still admit of some explanation. He tells us also that in Paphlagonia land fishes are dug up that are most excellent eating. These, he says, are found in deep holes or spots where there is no standing water whatever, and he expresses his surprise at their being thus produced without any contact with moisture, stating it as his opinion that there is some innate virtue in these holes, similar to that of wells, as if indeed fishes really were to be found in wells. However this may be, these facts at all events render the life of the mole underground less a matter of surprise unless perhaps these fishes mentioned by Theophrastus are similar in nature to the earthworm. Chapter 84. The Mice of the Nile But all these things, singular as they are, are rendered credible by a marvel which exceeds them all at the time of the inundation of the Nile. For the moment that it subsides, little mice are found, the first rudiments of which have been formed by the generative powers of the waters and the earth. In one part of the body they are already alive, while in that which is of later formation they are still composed of earth. Chapter 85. How the fish called the Antheus is taken. Nor would it be right to admit what is said about the fish called Antheus, and which I find is looked upon as true by most writers. I have already mentioned the Chelidonii, certain islands off the coast of Asia. They are situate off a promontory there, in the midst of a sea full of crags and reefs. These parts are much frequented by this fish, which is very speedily taken by the employment of a single method of catching it. A fisherman pushes out a little boat, dressed in a colour resembling that of his boat, and every day for several days together, at the same hour, he sails over the same space, while doing which he throws a quantity of bait into the sea. Whatever is thrown from the boat is an object of suspicion to the fish, who keep at a distance from what causes them so much alarm. But after this has been repeated a considerable number of times, one of the fish, reassured by becoming habituated to the scene, at last snaps at the bait. The movements of this one are watched with the greatest care and attention, for in it are centred all the hopes of the fishermen, as it is to be the means of securing them their prey. Nor indeed is it difficult to recognise it, seeing that for some days it is the only one that ventures to come near the bait. At last, however, it finds some others to follow its example, and by degrees it is better and better attended, till at last it brings with it shoals innumerable. The older ones, at length becoming quite accustomed to the fisherman, easily recognise him, and will even take food from his hands. Upon this the man throws out a little way beyond the tips of his fingers a hook concealed in a bait, and smuggles them out one by one, rather than catches them, standing in the shadow of the boat and whipping them out of the water with a slight jerk, that the others may not perceive it, while another fisherman is ready inside to receive them upon pieces of cloth, in order that no floundering about or other noise may scare the others away. It is of importance to know which has been the betrayer of the others, and not to take it, otherwise the shoal will take to flight and appear no more for the future. There is a story that a fisherman, having quarrelled once with his mate, threw out a hook to one of these leading fishes, which he easily recognised, and so captured it with a malicious intent. The fish, however, was recognised in the market by the other fisherman, against whom he had conceived this malice who accordingly brought an action against him for damages, and, as Mucianus adds, he was condemned to pay them on the hearing of the case. These anthesi, it is said, when they see one of their number taken with a hook, cut the line with the serrated spines which they have on the back, the one that is held fast, stretching it out as much as it can to enable them to cut it. But among the sargi, the fish itself that is held fast, rubs the line asunder against the rocks. Chapter 86. Sea Stars 
In addition to what I have already stated, I find that authors, distinguished for their wisdom, express surprise at finding a star in the sea, for such, in fact, is the form of the animal, which has but very little flesh within, and nothing but a hard skin without. It is said that in this fish there is such a fiery heat that it scorches everything it meets within the sea, and instantaneously digests its food. By what experiments all this came to be known, I cannot so easily say, but I am about to make mention of one fact which is more remarkable still, and which we have the opportunity of testing by every day's experience. CHAPTER 87 THE MARVELLOUS PROPERTIES OF THE DACTYLUS Belonging also to the class of shellfish is the dactylus, a fish so called from its strong resemblance to the human nails. It is the property of these fish to shine brightly in the dark when all other lights are removed, and the more moisture they have, the brighter is the light they emit. In the mouth, even, when they are being eaten, they give forth their light, and the same too when in the hands, the very drops, in fact, that fall from them on the ground or on the clothes, are of the same nature. Hence it is beyond doubt that it is a liquid that possesses this peculiar property, which even in a solid body would be a ground for considerable surprise. CHAPTER 88 the antipathies and sympathies that exist between aquatic animals. There are also marvellous instances to be found of antipathies and sympathies existing between them. The mullet and the wolf-fish are animated with a mutual hatred, and so too the conger and the morena gnaw each other's tails. The crayfish has so great a dread of the polypus that if it sees it near it expires in an instant. The conger dreads the crayfish while again the conger tears the body of the polypus. Ligidius informs us that the wolf-fish gnaws the tail of the mullet, and yet that during certain months they are on terms of friendship. All those, however, which thus lose their tails survive their misfortune. On the other hand, in addition to those which we have already mentioned as going in company together, an instance of friendship is found between the balina and the musculus. For, as the eyebrows of the former are very heavy, they sometimes fall over its eyes, and quite close them by their ponderousness, upon which the muscular swims before, and points out the shallow places which are likely to prove inconvenient to its vast bulk, thus serving it in the stead of eyes. We shall now have to speak of the nature of the birds. End of section 36 Section 37 of the Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 37. Book 10. The Natural History of Birds Chapter 1 1. The Ostrich The history of the birds follows next, the very largest of which, and indeed almost approaching to the nature of quadrupeds, is the ostrich of Africa or Ethiopia. This bird exceeds in height a man sitting on horseback, and can surpass him in swiftness as wings have been given to aid it in running. In other respects, ostriches cannot be considered as birds, and do not raise themselves from the earth. They have cloven talons, very similar to the hoof of the stag. With these they fight, and they also employ them in seizing stones for the purpose of throwing at those who pursue them. They have the marvelous property of being able to digest every substance without distinction, but their stupidity is no less remarkable. For although the rest of their body is so large, they imagine, when they have thrust their head and neck into a bush, that the whole of the body is concealed. Their eggs are prized on account of their large size, and are employed as vessels for certain purposes, while the feathers of the wing and tail are used as ornaments for the crest and helmet of the warrior. CHAPTER two, two, THE PHOENIX Ethiopia and India more especially produce birds of diversified plumage, and such as quite surpass all description. In the front rank of these is the phoenix, that famous bird of Arabia. 
though I am not quite sure that its existence is not all a fable. It is said that there is only one in existence in the whole world, and that that one has not been seen very often. We are told that this bird is the size of an eagle and has a brilliant golden plumage around the neck while the rest of the body is of a purple color except the tail which is azure with long feathers intermingled of a roseate hue the throat is adorned with a crest and the head with a tuft of feathers the first roman who described this bird and who has done so with the greatest exactness was the senator menelius so famous for his learning which he owed too to the instructions of no teacher he tells us that no person has ever seen this bird eat, that in Arabia it is looked upon as sacred to the sun, that it lives five hundred and forty years, that when it becomes old it builds a nest of cassia and sprigs of incense, which it fills with perfumes, and then lays its body down upon them to die, that from its bones and marrow there springs at first a sort of small worm, which in time changes into a little bird that the first thing that it does is to perform the obsequies of its predecessor and to carry the nest entire to the city of the sun near panchaya and there deposit it upon the altar of that divinity the same manilius states also that the revolution of the great year is completed with the life of this bird and that then a new cycle comes round again with the same characteristics as the former one in the seasons and the appearance of the stars and he says that this begins about midday of the day on which the sun enters the sign of aries he also tells us that when he wrote to the above effect in the consulship of p licinius and cineus cornelius it was the two hundred and fifteenth year of the said revolution cornelius valerianus says that the phoenix took its flight from arabia into egypt in the consulship of q plotius and sextus papinius this bird was brought to rome in the censorship of the emperor claudius being the year from the building of the city eight hundred and it was exposed to the public view in the commission this fact is attested by the public annals but there is no one that doubts that it was a fictitious phoenix only chapter three three the different kinds of eagles of all the birds with which we are acquainted the eagle is looked upon as the most noble and the most remarkable for its strength there are six different kinds the one called melanados by the greeks and valeria in our language the least in size of them all but the most remarkable for its strength is of a blackish color it is the only one among all the eagles that feeds its young for the others, as we shall mention just now, drive them away. It is the only one, too, that has neither cry nor murmur. It is an inhabitant of the mountains. The second kind is the Pygargus, an inhabitant of the cities and plains, and distinguished by the whiteness of its tail. The third is the Morphnos, which Homer also called the Persnos, while others again call it the Plangus and the Anataria. It is the second in size and strength, and dwells in the vicinity of lakes. Feminoe, who was styled the daughter of Apollo, has stated that this eagle has teeth, but that it has neither voice nor tongue. She says also that it is the blackest of all the eagles, and has a longer tail than the rest. Boeus is of the same opinion. This eagle has the instinct to break the shell of the tortoise by letting it fall from aloft, a circumstance which caused the death of the poet Aeschylus. An oracle, it is said, had predicted his death on that day by the fall of a house, upon which he took the precaution of trusting himself only under the canopy of the heavens. The fourth kind of eagle is the Percnopterus, also called the Oropelargus. It has much the appearance of the vulture, with remarkably small wings, while the rest of the body is larger than the others but it is of a timid and degenerate nature, so much so that even a raven can beat it. It is always famishing and ravenous, and has a plaintive murmuring cry. It is the only one among the eagles that will carry off the dead carcass. The others settle on the spot where they have killed their prey. The character of this species causes the fifth one to be known by the distinctive name of Nesios, 
as being the genuine eagle and the only one of untainted lineage it is of moderate size of rather reddish color and rarely to be met with the halitus is the last and is remarkable for its bright and piercing eye it poises itself aloft and the moment it catches sight of a fish in the sea below pounces headlong upon it and cleaving the water with its breast carries off its prey the eagle which we have mentioned as forming the third species pursues the aquatic birds in the vicinity of standing waters in order to make their escape they plunge into the water every now and then until at length they are overtaken by lassitude and sleep upon which the eagle immediately seizes them the contest that takes place is really a sight worthy to be seen the bird makes for the shore to seek a refuge and especially if there should happen to be a bed of reeds there while in the meantime the eagle endeavors to drive it away with repeated blows of its wings and tumbles into the water in its attempts to seize it while it is standing on the shore its shadow is seen by the bird which immediately dives beneath and then making its way in an opposite direction emerges at some point at which it thinks it is the least likely to be looked for this is the reason why these birds swim in flocks for when in large numbers they are in no danger from the enemy as by dashing up the spray with their wings they blind him again it often happens that the eagle is not able to carry the bird aloft on account of its weight and in consequence they both of them sink together the heliatus and this one only beats its young ones while in an unfledged state with its wings and forces them from time to time to look steadily upon the rays of the sun and if it sees either of them wink or even its eye water it throws it headlong out of the nest as being spurious and degenerate while on the other hand it rears the one whose gaze remains fixed and steady the haliatus is not a species of itself but is an eagle of mixed breed hence their produce are of the species known as the ossifrage from which again is produced the smaller vulture while this in its turn produces the large vulture which however is quite barren some writers add to the above a seventh kind which they call the bearded eagle the tuscans however call it the ossifrage chapter four the natural characteristics of the eagle the first three and the fifth class of eagles employ in the construction of their airy the stone aetites by some known as gangetis which is employed also for many remedial purposes and is proof against the action of fire this stone has the quality also in a matter of being pregnant for when shaken another stone is heard to rattle within just as though it were enclosed in its womb it has no medical properties however except immediately after it has been taken from the nest eagles build among rocks and trees they lay three eggs and generally hatch but two young ones though occasionally as many as three have been seen being wary of the trouble of rearing both they drive one of them from the nest for just at this time the providential foresight of nature has denied them a sufficiency of food thereby using due precaution that the young of all the other animals should not become their prey during this period also their talons become reversed and their feathers grow white from continued hunger so that it is not to be wondered at that they take a dislike to their young the ossifrage however a kindred species takes charge of the young ones thus rejected and rears them with its own but the parent bird still pursues them with hostility even when grown up and drives them away as being its rivals in rapine and indeed under any circumstances one pair of eagles requires a very considerable space of ground to forage over in order to find sufficient sustenance for which reason it is that they mark out by boundaries their respective allotments and seek their prey in succession to one another they do not immediately carry off their prey but first deposit it on the ground and it is only after they have tested its weight that they fly away with it they die but not of old age nor yet of sickness or of hunger but the upper part of the beak grows to such an extent and becomes so curved that they are unable to open it they take the wing and begin upon the labors of the chase at midday 
sitting in idleness during the hours of the morning until such time as the places of public resort are filled with people the feathers of the eagle if mixed with those of other birds will consume them it is said that this is the only bird that has never been killed by lightning hence it is that usage has pronounced it to be the armor-bearer of jove chapter five four when the eagle was first used as the standard of the roman legions caius marius in his second consulship assigned the eagle exclusively to the roman legions before that period it had only held the first rank there being four others as well the wolf the minotaur the horse and the wild boar each of which preceded a single division some few years before his time it had begun to be the custom to carry the eagle only into battle the other standards being left behind in camp marius however abolished the rest of them entirely since then it has been remarked that hardly ever has a roman legion encamped for the winter without a pair of eagles making their appearance at the spot the first and second species of eagle not only prey upon the whole of the smaller quadrupeds, but will attack deer even. Rolling in the dust, the eagle covers its body all over with it, and then perching on the antlers of the animal, shakes the dust into its eyes, while at the same time it beats it on the head with its wings, until the creature at last precipitates itself down on the rocks. Nor indeed is this one enemy sufficient for it. It has still more terrible combats with the dragon, and the issue is much more doubtful, although the battle is fought in the air. The dragon seeks the eggs of the eagle with a mischievous avidity, while the eagle in return carries it off whenever it happens to see it. Upon these occasions the dragon coils itself about the wings of the bird in multiplied folds, until at last they fall to the earth together. Chapter 6. 5. An eagle which precipitated itself on the funeral pile of a girl. There is a very famous story about an eagle at the city of Cestus. Having been reared by a little girl, it used to testify its gratitude for her kindness, first by bringing her birds and in due time various kinds of prey. At last she died, upon which the bird threw itself on the lighted pile and was consumed with her body. In memory of this event, the inhabitants raised upon the spot what they called a heroic monument in honor of Jupiter and the damsel the eagle being a bird consecrated to that divinity. Chapter 7. 6. The Vulture. Of the vultures, the black ones are the strongest. No person has yet found a vulture's nest. Hence, it is that there are, are some who have thought, though erroneously, that these birds come from the opposite hemisphere. The fact is that they build their nest upon the very highest rocks. Their young ones, indeed, are often to be seen, being generally two in number. Umbricius, the most skillful among the orispuses of our time, says that the vulture lays thirteen eggs, and that with one of these eggs it purifies the others and its nest, and then throws it away. He states also that they hover about for three days over the spot where carcasses are about to be found. Chapter 8. 7. The birds called Sangualis and Immusulus. There has been considerable argument among the Roman augurs about the birds known as the Sangualis and the Immusulus. Some persons are of opinion that the Immusulus is the young of the vulture, and the Sangualis that of the ossifrage. Masurius says that the Sangualis is the same as the ossifrage, and that the Immusulus is the young of the eagle, before the tail begins to turn white. Some persons have asserted that these birds have not been seen at Rome since the time of the augur Musius. For my part, I think it much more likely that, amid that general heedlessness as to all knowledge, which has of late prevailed, no notice has been taken of them. Chapter 9. 8. Hawks. The Buteo. We find no less than sixteen kinds of hawks mentioned. Among these are the Aegithus, which is lame of one leg, and is looked upon as the most favorable omen for the augurs on the occasion of a marriage, or in matters connected with property in the shape of cattle. The triochus, also, so called from the number of its testicles, and to which Femenoi has assigned the first rank in augury. This last is by the Romans known as the buteo. 
Indeed, there is a family that has taken its surname from it, from the circumstances of this bird having given a favorable omen by settling upon the ship of one of them when he held a command. The Greeks call one Epileus, the only one, indeed, that is seen at all seasons of the year, the others taking their departure in the winter. The various kinds are distinguished by the avidity with which they seize their prey, for while some will only pounce on a bird while on the ground, others will only seize it while hovering round the trees, others again while it is perched aloft, and others while it is flying in mid-air. Hence it is that pigeons, on seeing them, are aware of the nature of the danger to which they are exposed, and either settle on the ground or else fly upwards, instinctively protecting themselves by taking due precautions against their natural propensities. The hawks of the whole of Masaicilia breed in Cern, an island of Africa lying in the ocean, and none of the kinds that are accustomed to those parts will breed anywhere else. Chapter 10 in what places hawks and men pursue the chase in company with each other. In the part of Thrace, which lies above Amphipolis, men and hawks go in pursuit of prey in a sort of partnership, as it were. For while the men drive the birds from out of the woods and the reed beds, the hawks bring them down as they fly. And after they have taken the game, the fowlers share it with them. It has been said that when sent aloft, they will pick out the birds that are wanted, and what, when the opportune moment for taking them has come, they invite the fowler to seize the opportunity by their cries and their peculiar mode of flying. The sea wolves, too, in the palace Maeotis, do something of a very similar nature, but if they do not receive their fair share from the fishermen, they will tear their nets as they lie extended. Hawks will not eat the heart of a bird. The night hawk is called Sibindus. It is rarely found even in the woods, and in the daytime its sight is not good. It wages war to the death with the eagle, and they are often to be found clasped in each other's talons. Chapter 11. 9. The only bird that is killed by those of its own kind, a bird that lays only one egg. The cuckoo seems to be but another form of the hawk which at a certain season of the year changes its shape, it being the fact that during this period no other hawks are to be seen except perhaps for a few days only. The cuckoo, too, itself is only seen for a short period in the summer and does not make its appearance after. It is the only one among the hawks that has not hooked talons. Neither is it like the rest of them in the head or indeed in any other respect except the color only while in the beak it bears a stronger resemblance to the pigeon. In addition to this, it is devoured by the hawk, if they chance at any time to meet. This being the only one among the whole race of birds that is preyed upon by those of its own kind. It changes its voice also with its appearance, comes out in the spring and goes into retirement at the rising of the dog star. It always lays its eggs in the nest of another bird, and that of the ring dove more especially. Mostly a single egg, a thing that is the case with no other bird. Sometimes, however, but very rarely, it is known to lay two. It is supposed that the reason for its thus substituting its young ones is the fact that it is aware how greatly it is hated by the other birds, for even the smallest of them will attack it. Hence it is that it thinks its own race will stand no chance of being perpetuated unless it contrives to deceive them, and for this reason builds no nest of its own, and besides this, it is a very timid animal. In the meantime, the female bird sitting on her nest is rearing a superstitious and spurious progeny, while the young cuckoo, which is naturally craving and greedy, snatches away all the food from the other young ones and by doing so grows plump and sleek, and quite gains the affections of his foster mother, who takes a great pleasure in his fine appearance, and is quite surprised that she has become the mother of so handsome an offspring. In comparison with him, she discards her own young as so many strangers, until at last, when the young cuckoo is now able to take the wing, he finishes by devouring her. For sweetness of the flesh, there is not a bird in existence to be compared to the cuckoo at this season. 
Chapter 12 10. The Kite The kite, which belongs to the same genus, is distinguished from the rest of the hawks by its larger size. It has been remarked of this bird, extremely ravenous as it is, and always craving, that it has never been known to seize any food either from among funeral oblations or from the altar of Jupiter at Olympia. Nor yet, in fact, does it ever seize any of the consecrated viands from the hands of those who are carrying them, except where some misfortune is presaged for the town that is offering the sacrifice. These birds seem to have taught man the art of steering. From the motion of the tail, nature pointing out by their movements in the air, the method required for navigating the deep. Kites also disappear during the winter months, but do not take their departure before the swallow. It is said also that after the summer solstice they are troubled with the gout. End of section 37《ヒストリー・ヴォリューム2》This is a LibriVox recording. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Natural History》Volume 2 by Pliny the Elder, translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 38. Chapter 13. The Classification of Birds. The first distinctive characteristic among birds is that which bears reference more especially to their feet. They have either hooked talons or else toes, or else again they belong to the web-footed class, geese for instance, and most of the aquatic birds. Those which have hooked talons feed for the most part upon nothing but flesh. Chapter 14. Crows, birds of ill omen, at what seasons they are not inauspicious. Crows, again, have another kind of food. Nuts being too hard for their beak to break, the crow flies to a great height, and then lets them fall again and again upon the stones or tiles beneath, until at last the shell is cracked, after which the bird is able to open them. This is a bird with a very ill-omened garrulity, though it has been highly praised by some. It is observed that from the rising of the constellation Arcturus until the arrival of the swallow, it is but rarely to be seen about the sacred groves and temples of Minerva, in some places indeed not at all, Athens, for instance. In addition to these facts, it is the only one that continues to feed its young for some time after they have begun to fly. The crow is most inauspicious at the time of incubation, or in other words, just after the summer solstice. Chapter 15. The Raven. All the other birds of the same kind drive their young ones from the nest and compel them to fly. The raven, for instance, which not only feeds on flesh, but even drives its young, when able to fly to a still greater distance. Hence it is that in small hamlets there are never more than two pairs to be found, and in the neighborhood of Cranon, in Thessaly, never more than one, the parents always quitting the spot to give place to their offspring. There have been some differences observed between this and the bird last mentioned. Ravens breed during the summer solstice, and continue in bad health for sixty days being afflicted with a continual thirst, more particularly, before the ripening of the fig in autumn, while on the other hand the crow is attacked by disease after that period. The raven lays at most but five eggs. It is a vulgar belief that they couple, or else lay, by means of the beak, and that consequently, if a pregnant woman happens to eat a raven's egg, she will be delivered by the mouth. It is also believed that if the eggs are even so much as brought beneath the roof, a difficult labor will be the consequence. Aristotle denies it, and assures us in all good faith that there is no more truth in this than in the same story about the ibis in Egypt. He says that it is nothing else but that same sort of billing that is so often seen in pigeons. Ravens are the only birds that seem to have any comprehension of the meaning of their auspices, for when the guests of Medus were assassinated, they all took their departure from Peloponnesus and the region of Attica. They are the very worst omen when they swallow their voice as if they were being choked. Chapter 16. The Horned Owl. The birds of the night also have crooked talons, such as the owlet, the horned owl, and the screech owl, for instance, the sight of all of which is defective in the daytime. The horned owl is especially funereal, and is greatly abhorred in all auspices of a public nature. It inhabits deserted places, and not only desolate spots, but those of a frightful and inaccessible nature. 
the monster of the night, its voice is heard not with any tuneful note, but emitting a sort of shriek. Hence it is that it is looked upon as a direful omen to see it in a city, or even so much as in the daytime. I know, however, for a fact, that it is not portentous of evil when it settles on the top of a private house. It cannot fly whither it wishes in a straight line, but is always carried along by a sidelong movement. A horned owl entered the very sanctuary of the capital in the consulship of Sextus Palpilius Hister and L. Padanius, in consequence of which Rome was purified on the knowns of March in that year. Chapter 17. Birds, the race of which is extinct, or of which all knowledge has been lost. An inauspicious bird also is that known as the incendiary, on account of which we find in the annals the city has had to be repeatedly purified as, for instance, in the consulship of L. Cassius and C. Marius, in which year also it was purified in consequence of a horned owl being seen. What kind of bird this incendiary bird was we do not find stated, nor is it known by tradition. Some persons explain the term this way. They say that the name incendiary was applied to every bird that was seen carrying a burning coal from the pyre or altar, while others, again, call such bird a spinternix, though I never yet found any person who said that they knew what kind of bird this spinternix was. I find also that the people of our time are ignorant what bird it was that was called by the ancients a clivia. Some persons say it was a clamatory, others again that it was a prohibitory bird. We also find a bird mentioned by Nigidius as the subis, which breaks the eggs of the eagle. In addition to the above there are many other kinds that are described in the Etruscan ritual, but which no one now living has ever seen. It is surprising that these birds are no longer in existence, since we find that even those kinds abound among which the gluttony of man commits such ravages. Chapter 18. Birds which are born with the tail first. Among foreigners a person called Hylas is thought to have written the best treatise on the subject of augury. He informs us that the owlet, the horned owl, the woodpecker which makes holes in the trees, the trigon and the crow, are produced from the egg with the tail first. For the egg, being turned upside down through the weight of the head of the chick, presents the wrong end to be warmed by the mother as she sits upon it. CHAPTER nineteen: THE OWLET The owlet shows considerable shrewdness in its engagements with other birds, for when surrounded by too great a number it throws itself on its back, and so, resisting with its feet, and rolling up its body into a mass, defends itself with the beak and talons, until the hawk, attracted by a certain natural affinity, comes to its assistance and takes its share in the combat. Nigidius says that the incubation of the owlet lasts sixty days during the winter, and that it has nine different notes. CHAPTER Twenty, THE WOODPECKER OF MARS There are some small birds also which have hooked talons. The woodpecker, for example, surnamed of Mars, of considerable importance in the auspices. To this kind belong the birds which make holes in trees and climb stealthily up them like cats. Mounting with the head upwards, they tap against the bark and learn by the sound whether or not their food lies beneath. They are the only birds that hatch their young in the hollows of trees. It is a common belief that if a shepherd drives a wedge into their holes, they apply a certain kind of herb immediately upon which it falls out. Trebius informs us that if a nail or wedge is driven with ever so much force into a tree in which these birds have made a nest, it will instantly fly out, the tree making a loud cracking noise the moment that the bird has lighted upon the nail or wedge. These birds have held the first rank in auguries in Latium since the time of the king who has given them their name. One of the presages that was given by them I cannot pass over in silence. A woodpecker came and lighted upon the head of Elias Tubero, the city praetor, when sitting on his tribunal dispensing justice in the forum, and showed such tameness as to allow itself to be taken with the hand, upon which the augurs declared that if it was let go, the state was menaced with danger, but if killed, disaster would befall the praetor. In an instant he tore the bird to pieces, and before long the omen was fulfilled. CHAPTER Twenty One: BIRDS WHICH HAVE HOOKED TALONS Many birds of this kind feed also on acorns and fruit, but only those which are not carnivorous, with the exception of the kite, though when it feeds on anything but flesh it is a bird of ill omen. The birds which have hooked talons are never gregarious, each one seeks its prey by itself. They nearly all of them soar to a great height, with the exception of the birds of the night, and more especially those of larger size. They all have large wings and a small body. 
They walk with difficulty and rarely settle upon stones, being prevented from doing so by the curved shape of their talons. Chapter 22. The Peacock. We shall now speak of the second class of birds, which is divided into two kinds, those which give omens by their note, and those which afford presages by their flight. The variation of the note in the one, and the relative size in the other, constitute the differences between them. These last, therefore, shall be treated of first, and the peacock shall have precedence of all the rest, as much for its singular beauty as its superior instinct, and the vanity it displays. When it hears itself praised, the bird spreads out its gorgeous colors, and especially if the sun happens to be shining at the time, because then they are seen in all their radiance and to better advantage. At the same time, spreading out its tail in the form of a shell, it throws the reflection upon the other feathers, which shine all the more brilliantly when a shadow is cast upon them. Then, at another moment, it will contract all the eyes depicted on its feather in a single mass, manifesting great delight in having them admired by the spectator. The peacock loses its tail every year at the fall of the leaf, and a new one shoots forth in its place at the flower season. Between these periods, the bird is abashed and moping, and seeks retired spots. The peacock lives twenty-five years, and begins to show its colors in the third. By some authors it is stated that this bird is not only a vain creature, but of a spiteful disposition also, just in the same way that they attribute bashfulness to the goose. The characteristics, however, which they have thus ascribed to these birds, appear to me to be utterly unfounded. CHAPTER Twenty Three, Who was the first to kill the peacock for food? Who first taught the art of cramming them? The orator Hortensius was the first Roman who had the peacock killed for table. It was on the occasion of the banquet given by him on his inauguration in the college of the priesthood. M. Aufidius Lorco was the first who taught the art of fattening them about the time of the last war with the pirates. From this source of profit he acquired an income of sixty thousand sesterces. Chapter 24. The Dunghill Cock Next after the peacock, the animal that acts as our watchman by night, and which nature has produced for the purpose of arousing mortals to their labor, and dispelling their slumbers, shows itself most actuated by feelings of vanity. The cock knows how to distinguish the stars, and marks the different periods of the day, every three hours, by his note. These animals go to roost with the setting of the sun, and at the fourth watch of the camp recall man to his cares and toils. They do not allow the rising of the sun to creep upon us unawares, but by their note proclaim the coming day, and they prelude their crowing by clapping their sides with their wings. They exercise a rigorous sway over the other birds of their kind, and in every place where they are kept hold the supreme command. This, however, is only obtained after repeated battles among themselves, as they are well aware that they have weapons on their legs, produced for that very purpose, as it were and the contest often ends in the death of both of the combatants at the same moment. If, on the other hand, one of them obtains the mastery, he instantly, by his note, proclaims himself the conqueror, and testifies by his crowing that he has been victorious, while his conquered opponent silently slinks away, and, though with a very bad grace, submits to servitude. And with equal pride does the throng of the poultry-yard strut along, with head uplifted and the crest erect. These two are the only ones among the winged race that repeatedly look up to the heavens, with a tail, which in its drooping shape resembles that of a sickle raised aloft. And so it is that these birds inspire terror even in the lion, the most courageous of all animals. Some of these birds, too, are reared for nothing but warfare and perpetual combats, and have even shed a luster thereby on their native places, Rhodes and Tanagra. The next rank is considered to belong to those of Melus and Chalcis, Hence it is not without very good reason that the consular purple of Rome pays these birds such singular honors. It is from the feeding of these creatures that the omens by fowls are derived. It is these that regulate day by day the movements of our magistrates, and open or shut to them their own houses, as the case may be. It is these that give an impulse to the fasces of the Roman magistracy, or withhold them. It is these that command battles or forbid them, and furnish auspices for victories to be gained in every part of the world. It is these that hold supreme rule over those who are themselves the rulers of the earth, and whose entrails and fibres are as pleasing to the gods as the first spoils of victory. Their note, when heard at an unusual hour or in the evening, has also its peculiar presages, for on one occasion, by crowing the whole night through for several nights, they presage to the Boeotians that famous victory which they gained over the Lacedaemonians, 
such in fact being the interpretation that was put upon it by way of prognostic, as this bird, when conquered, is never known to crow. Chapter 25. How Cocks Are Castrated. A Cock That Once Spoke. When castrated, cocks cease to crow. This operation is performed two different ways. Either the loins of the animal are seared with a red-hot iron, or else the lower part of the legs. After which, the wound is covered up with potter's clay. This way, they are fattened much more easily. At Pergamus, there is every year a public show of fights of gamecocks, just as in other places we have those of gladiators. We find it stated in the Roman annals that in the consulship of M. Lepidus and Q. Catullus, a dunghill cock spoke at the farmhouse of Galerius, the only occasion, in fact, that I know of. Chapter 26. The Goose. The goose also keeps a vigilant guard, a fact which is well attested by the defense of the capital at a moment when, by the silence of the dogs, the commonwealth had been betrayed. For which reason it is that the censors always, the first thing of all, attend to the farming out of the feeding of the sacred geese. What is still more, too, there is a love story about this animal. At Aegeum one is said to have conceived a passion for a beautiful boy, a native of Olenos, and another for Glaus, a damsel who was a lute-player to King Ptolemy for whom at the same time a ram is said also to have conceived a passion. One might almost be tempted to think that these creatures have an appreciation of wisdom, for it is said that one of them was the constant companion of the philosopher Lacides, and would never leave him either in public or when at the bath by night or day. Chapter 27. Who first taught us to use the liver of the goose for food? Our people, however, are more wise, for they only esteem the goose for the goodness of its liver. When they are crammed, this grows to a very large size, and on being taken from the animal is made still larger by being soaked in honeyed milk. And indeed, it is not without good reason that it is a matter of debate, who at first was, that discovered so great a delicacy, whether in fact it was Scipio Metellus, a man of consular dignity, or M. Seus, a contemporary of his, and a Roman of equestrian rank. However, a thing about which there is no dispute, it was Messalinus Cotta, the son of the orator Messala, who first discovered the art of roasting the webbed feet of the goose and of cooking them in a ragout with cock's combs. For I shall faithfully award each culinary palm to such as I shall find deserving of it. It is a wonderful fact in relation to this bird that it comes on foot all the way from the country of the Morini to Rome. Those that are tired are placed in the front rank, while the rest, taught by a natural instinct to move in a compact body, drive them on. A second income, too, is also to be derived from the feathers of the white goose. In some places this animal is plucked twice a year, upon which the feathers quickly grow again. Those are the softest which lie nearest to the body, and those that come from Germany are the most esteemed. The geese there are white, but of small size, and are called gante. The price paid for their feathers is five denarii per pound. It is from this fruitful source that we have repeated charges brought against the commanders of our auxiliaries, who were in the habit of detaching whole cohorts from the posts where they ought to be on guard in pursuit of these birds. Indeed, we have come to such a pitch of effeminacy that nowadays not even the men can think of lying down without the aid of the goose feathers by way of pillow. Chapter 28 Of the Comagenian Medicament The part of Syria, which is called Comagene, has discovered another invention also. The fat of the goose is enclosed with some cinnamon in a brazen vessel and then covered with a thick layer of snow. Under the influence of the excessive cold it becomes macerated and fit for use as a medicament, remarkable for its properties. From the country which produces it, it is known to us as comagenum. Chapter 29. The Canapolix, the Canaros, the Tetrao, and the Otis. To the goose genus belong also the Canapolix and the Canaros, a little smaller than the common goose, and which forms the most exquisite of all the dainties that Britannia provides for the table. The tetrao is remarkable for the luster of its plumage and its extreme darkness, while the eyelids are of a scarlet color. Another species of this last bird exceeds the vulture in size, and is of a similar color to it, and indeed there is no bird with the exception of the ostrich, the body of which is of a greater weight, for to such a size it does it grow that it becomes incapable of moving and allows itself to be taken on the ground. The Alps and the regions of the north produce these birds, but when kept in aviaries they lose their fine flavor, and by retaining their breath will die of mere vexation. 
Next to these, in size, are the birds which in Spain they call the Tarda, and in Greece the Otis. They are looked upon, however, as very inferior food. The marrow, when disengaged from the bones, immediately emits a most noisome smell. CHAPTER Thirty: CRANES By the departure of the cranes, which, as we have already stated, were in the habit of waging war with them, the nation of the pygmies now enjoys a respite. The tracts over which they travel must be immense if we only consider that they come all the way from the eastern sea. These birds agree by common consent at what moment they shall set out, fly aloft to look out afar, select a leader for them to follow, and have sentinels duly posted in the rear, which relieve each other by turns, utter loud cries, and with their voice keep the whole flight in proper array. During the night also they place sentinels on guard, each of which holds a little stone in its claw. If the bird should happen to fall asleep, the claw becomes relaxed, and the stone falls to the ground, and so convicts it of neglect. The rest sleep in the meanwhile, with the head beneath the wing, standing first on one leg and then on the other. The leader looks out with neck erect and gives warning when required. These birds, when tamed, are very frolicsome, and even when alone will describe a sort of circle as they move along with their clumsy gait. It is a well-known fact that these birds, when about to fly over the Yuxine, first of all repair to the narrowest part of it that lies between the two promontories of Cryomatopon and Carambus, and then ballast themselves with coarse sand. When they have arrived midway in the passage they throw away the stones from out of their claws, and as soon as they reach the mainland discharge the sand by the throat. Cornelius Nepos, who died in the reign of the late Emperor Augustus, after stating that thrushes had been fattened for the first time shortly before that period, has added that storks were more esteemed as food than cranes, whereas at the present day this last bird is one of those that are held in the very highest esteem, while no one will so much as touch the other. End of section 38「Section 39 of the Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Mattingly. The Natural History, Volume 2 by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 39. Chapter 33 foreign birds which visit us, the quail, the glottis, the cycramus, and the otus. Having spoken of the emigration of these birds over sea and land, I cannot allow myself to defer mentioning some other birds of smaller size which have the same natural instinct, although in the case of those which I have already mentioned, their very size and strength would almost seem to invite them to such habits. The quail, which always arrives among us even before the crane, is a small bird, and when it has once arrived, more generally keeps to the ground than flies aloft. These birds fly also in a manner to those I have already spoken of, and not without considerable danger to mariners when they come near the surface of the earth, for it often happens that they settle on the sails of a ship, and that too always in the night, the consequence of which is that the vessel often sinks. These birds pursue their course along a tract of country with certain resting places. When the south wind is blowing, they will not fly, as that wind is always humid and apt to weigh them down. Still, however, it is an object with them to get a breeze to assist them in their flight, the body being so light and their strength so very limited. Hence it is that we hear them make that murmuring noise as they fly, it being extorted from them by fatigue. It is for this reason also that they take to flight more especially when the north wind is blowing, having the autigometra for their leader. The first of them that approaches the earth is generally snapped up by the hawk. When they are about to return from these parts, they always invite other birds to join their company, and the glottis, otus, and chicramus, yielding to their persuasions, take their departure along with them. The glottis protrudes a tongue of remarkable length, from which circumstance it derives its name. At first it is quite pleased with the journey, and sets out with the greatest ardour. Very soon, however, when it begins to feel the fatigues of the flight, it is overtaken by regret, while at the same time it is equally as loath to return alone as to accompany the others. Its travels, however, never last more than a single day, 
for at the very first resting place they come to, it deserts. Here, too, it finds other birds which have been left behind in a similar manner in the preceding year. The same takes place with other birds day after day. The Chychromus, however, is much more persevering, and is quite in a hurry to arrive at the land which is its destination. Hence it is that it arouses the quails in the night, and reminds them that they ought to be on the road. The Otis is a smaller bird than the horned owl, though larger than the owlet. It has feathers projecting like ears, whence its name. Some persons call it in the Latin language the Asio. In general it is a bird fond of mimicking, a great parasite, and in some measure a dancer as well. Like the owlet it is taken without any difficulty, for while one person occupies its attention, another goes behind and catches it. If the wind, by its contrary blasts, should begin to prevent the onward progress of the flight, the birds immediately take up small stones, or else fill their throats with sand, and so to contrive to ballast themselves as they fly. The seeds of a certain venomous plant are most highly esteemed by the quails as food, for which reason it is that they have been banished from our tables, in addition to which a great repugnance is manifested to eating their flesh on account of the epilepsy, to which alone of all animals, with the exception of man, the quail is subject. Chapter 34. Swallows. The swallow, the only bird that is carnivorous among those which have not hooked talons, takes its departure also during the winter months, but it only goes to neighbouring countries seeking sunny retreats there on the mountain sides. Sometimes they have been found in such spots bare and quite unfledged. This bird, it is said, will not enter a house in Thebes, because that city has been captured so frequently, nor will it approach the country of the busy eye on account of the crimes committed there by Terius. Caecini of Volterrae, a member of the equestrian order, and the owner of several chariots, used to have swallows caught, and then carried them with him to Aomi. Upon gaining a victory, he would send the news by them to his friends, for, after staining them the colour of the party that had gained the day, he would let them go immediately, upon which they would make their way to the nests they had previously occupied. Fabius Pictor also relates in his annals that when a Roman garrison was being besieged by the Ligurians, a swallow which had been taken from its young ones was brought to him, in order that he might give them notice, by the number of knots on a string tied to its leg, on what day succour would arrive, and a sortie might be made with advantage. Chapter 35. Birds which take their departure from us, and whither they go. The thrush, the blackbird, and the starling. Birds which lose their feathers during their retirement, the turtle dove and the ring dove. The flight of starlings and swallows. In a similar manner also, the blackbird, the thrush, and the starling take their departure to neighbouring countries. But they do not lose their feathers, nor yet conceal themselves, as they are often to be seen in places where they seek their food during the winter. Hence it is that in winter more especially, the thrush is so often to be seen in Germany. It is, however, a well-ascertained fact that the turtle-dove conceals itself and loses its feathers. The ring-dove also takes its departure and with these two it is a matter of doubt whither they go. It is a peculiarity of the starlings to fly in troops, as it were, and then to wheel round in a globular mass like a ball, the central troop acting as a pivot for the rest. Swallows are the only birds that have a sinuous flight of remarkable velocity, for which reason it is that they are not exposed to the attacks of other birds of prey. These two, in fine, are the only birds that take their food solely on the wing. Chapter 36. Birds which remain with us throughout the year. Birds which remain with us only six or three months. Whitwolves and hoopoes. The time during which birds show themselves differs very considerably. Some remain with us all the year round, the pigeon for instance. Some for six months, such as the swallow, and some again for three months only, as the thrush, the turtle dove, and those which take their departure the moment they have reared their young the Whitwall and the Hoopoe, for instance. Chapter 37. The Memnonides. There are some authors who say that every year certain birds fly from Ethiopia to Ilium, and have a combat at the tomb of Memnon there, from which circumstance they have received from them the name of Memnonides, or birds of Memnon. Cremutius states it also as a fact, ascertained by himself, 
that they do the same every fifth year in Ethiopia, around the palace of Memnon. Chapter 38. The Meliagrides. In a similar manner also, the birds called Meliagrides fight in Boeotia. They are a species of African poultry, having a hump on the back which is covered with a mottled plumage. These are the latest among the foreign birds that have been received at our tables on account of their disagreeable smell. The tomb, however, of Meliaga has rendered them famous. Chapter 39. The Seleucides. These birds are called Seleucides, which are sent by Jupiter at the prayers offered up to him by the inhabitants of Mount Cassius, when the locusts are ravaging their crops of corn. Whence they come, or whither they go, has never yet been ascertained, as in fact they are never to be seen but when the people stand in need of their aid. Chapter 40. The Ibis. The Egyptians also invoke their Ibis against the incursions of serpents, and the people of Elis, their god Myagros, when the vast multitudes of flies are bringing pestilence among them, the flies die immediately the propitiatory sacrifice has been made to this god. Chapter 41. Places in which certain birds are never found. With reference to the departure of birds, the owlet too is said to lie concealed for a few days. No birds of this last kind are to be found in the island of Crete, and if any are imported thither, they immediately die. Indeed, this is a remarkable distinction made by nature, for she denies to certain places, as it were, certain kinds of fruits and shrubs, and of animals as well. It is singular that when introduced into these localities, they will be no longer productive, but die immediately they are thus transplanted. What can it be that is thus fatal to the increase of one particular species, or whence this envy manifested against them by nature? What, too, are the limits that have been marked out for the birds on the face of the earth? Rhodes possesses no eagles. In Italy, beyond the Padus, there is, near the Alps, a lake known by the name of Larius, beautifully situate amid a country covered with shrubs, and yet this lake is never visited by storks, nor indeed are they ever known to come within eight miles of it while on the other hand, in the neighbouring territory of the Insubris, there are immense flocks of magpies and jackdaws, the only bird that is guilty of stealing gold and silver, a very singular propensity. It is said that in the territory of Tarentum, the woodpecker of Mars is never found. It is only lately, too, and that bird very rarely, that various kinds of pies have begun to be seen in the districts that lie between the Apennines and the city birds which are known by the name of Varii and are remarkable for the length of the tail. It is a peculiarity of this bird that it becomes bald every year at the time of sowing rape. The partridge does not fly beyond the frontiers of Boeotia into Attica, nor does any bird in the island in the Euxine in which Achilles was buried enter the temple there consecrated to him. In the territory of Fidonae, in the vicinity of the city, the storks have no young, nor do they build nests, but vast numbers of ring-doves arrive from beyond the sea every year in the district of Volterrae. At Rome neither flies nor dogs ever enter the temple of Hercules in the cattle market. There are numerous other instances of a similar nature in reference to all kinds of animals, which from time to time I feel myself prompted by prudent considerations to omit, lest I should only weary the reader. Theophrastus, for example, relates that even pigeons as well as peacocks and ravens have been introduced from other parts into Asia, as also croaking frogs into Cyrenaica. Chapter 42. The various kinds of birds which afford omens by their note, birds which change their colour and their voice. There is another remarkable fact, too, relative to the birds which give omens by their note. They generally change their colour and voice at a certain season of the year, and suddenly become quite altered in appearance, a thing that, among the larger birds, happens with the crane only, which grows black in its old age. From black the blackbird changes to a reddish colour, sings in summer, chatters in winter, and about the summer solstice loses its voice. When a year old the beak also assumes the appearance of ivory. This, however, is the case only with the male. In the summer the thrush is mottled about the neck, but in the winter it becomes of one uniform colour all over. Chapter 43. The Nightingale The song of the nightingale is to be heard without intermission for fifteen days and nights continuously, when the foliage is thickening as it bursts from the bud. 
a bird which deserves our admiration in no slight degree. First of all, what a powerful voice in so small a body, its note how long and how well sustained. And then, too, it is the only bird the notes of which are modulated in accordance with the strict rules of musical science. At one moment, as it sustains its breath, it will prolong its note, and then at another will vary it with different inflections, then again it will break into distinct chirrups or pour forth an endless series of roulades. Then it will warble to itself while taking breath, or else disguise its voice in an instant, while sometimes again it will twitter to itself, now with a full note and now with a grave, now again sharp, now with a broken note, and now with a prolonged one. Sometimes, again, when it thinks fit, it will break out into quavers and will run through in succession alto, tenor, and bass. In a word, in so tiny a throat is to be found all the melody that the ingenuity of man has ever discovered through the medium of the invention of the most exquisite flute, so much so that there can be no doubt it was an infallible presage of his future sweetness as a poet when one of these creatures perched and sang on the infant lips of the poet Stesichorus. That there may remain no doubt that there is a certain degree of art in its performances, we may here remark that every bird has a number of notes peculiar to itself, for they do not all of them have the same, but each certain melodies of its own. They vie with one another, and the spirit with which they contend is evident to all. The one that is vanquished often dies in the contest, and will rather yield its life than its song. The younger birds are listening in the meantime, and receive the lesson in song from which they are to profit. The learner hearkens with the greatest attention, and repeats what it has heard, and then they are silent by turns. This is understood to be the correction of an error on the part of the scholar, and a sort of reproof, as it were, on the part of the teacher. Hence it is that nightingales fetch as high a price as slaves, and indeed sometimes more, than used formerly to be paid for a man in a suit of armour. I know that on one occasion six thousand sesterces were paid for a nightingale, a white one it is true, a thing that is hardly ever to be seen, to be made a present of to Agrippina, the wife of the Emperor Claudius. A nightingale has been often seen that will sing at command, and take alternate parts with the music that accompanies it. Men too have been found who could imitate its note with such exactness that it would be impossible to tell the difference by merely putting water in a reed held crosswise and then blowing into it, a longuette being first inserted for the purpose of breaking the sound and rendering it more shrill. But these modulations, so clever and so artistic, begin gradually to cease at the end of the fifteen days, not that you can say, however, that the bird is either fatigued or tired of singing, but as the heat increases, its voice becomes altogether changed and possesses no longer either modulation or variety of note. Its colour too becomes changed, and at last, throughout the winter, it totally disappears. The tongue of the nightingale is not pointed at the tip as in other birds. It lays at the beginning of the spring six eggs at the most. Chapter 44. The Milano Corypheus, the Erichtharchus, and the Phenicurus. The change is different that takes place in the Ficedula, for this bird changes its shape as well as its colour. Ficedula is the name by which it is called in autumn, but not after that period, for then it is called Melanocorypheus. In the same manner, too, the Erythacus of the winter is the Phenicurus of the summer. The hoopoe also, according to the poet Aeschylus, changes its form. It is a bird that feeds upon filth of all kinds, and is remarkable for its twisted topknot, which it can contract or elevate at pleasure along the top of the head. Chapter 45. The Cananthi, the Chlorion, the Blackbird, and the Ibis. The Ananthi, too, is a bird that has stated days for its retreat. At the rising of Sirius it conceals itself, and at the setting of that star comes forth from its retreat. And this it does, a most singular thing, exactly upon both those days. The Chlorion also, the body of which is yellow all over, is not seen in the winter, but comes out about the summer solstice. The blackbird is found in the vicinity of Kylini in Arcadia, with white plumage, a thing that is the case nowhere else. The Ibis, in the neighbourhood of Pelusium, only is black, while in all other places it is white. Chapter 46. The Times of Incubation of Birds The birds that have a note, with the exception of those previously mentioned, 
do not by any chance produce their young before the vernal or after the autumnal equinox. As to the broods produced before the summer solstice, it is very doubtful if they will survive, but those hatched after it thrive well. Chapter 47. The Halcyones. The Halcyon Days that are favourable to navigation. It is for this that the Halcyon is more especially remarkable. The seas, and all those who sail upon their surface, well know the days of its incubation. This bird is a little larger than a sparrow, and the greater part of its body is of an azure blue colour, with only an intermixture of white and purple in some of the larger feathers, while the neck is long and slender. There is one kind that is remarkable for its larger size and its note. The smaller ones are heard singing in the reed beds. It is a thing of very rare occurrence to see a halcyon, and then it is only about the time of the setting of the Virgiliae and the summer and winter solstices when one is sometimes to be seen to hover about a ship, and then immediately disappear. They hatch their young at the time of the winter solstice, from which circumstance those days are known as the Halcyon days. During this period the sea is calm and navigable, the Sicilian sea in particular. They make their nest during the seven days before the winter solstice, and sit the same number of days after. Their nests are truly wonderful. They are the shape of a ball slightly elongated, have a very narrow mouth, and bear a strong resemblance to a large sponge. It is impossible to cut them asunder with iron, and they are only to be broken with a strong blow, upon which they separate, just like foam of the sea when dried up. It has never yet been discovered of what material they are made. Some persons think that they are formed of sharp fish bones, as it is on fish that these birds live. They enter rivers also, their eggs are five in number. Chapter 48. Other Kinds of Aquatic Birds The sea mew also builds its nest in rocks, and the diver in trees as well. These birds produce three eggs at the very most. The sea mew in summer, the diver at the beginning of spring. Chapter 49. Instinctive cleverness displayed by birds in the construction of their nests. The wonderful works of the swallow, the bank swallow. The form of the nest built by the halcyon reminds me also of the instinctive cleverness displayed by other birds, and indeed in no respect is the ingenuity of birds more deserving of our admiration. The swallow builds its nest of mud and strengthens it with straws. If mud happens to fail, it soaks itself with a quantity of water which it then shakes from off its feathers into the dust. It lines the inside of the nest with soft feathers and wool to keep the eggs warm and in order that the nest may not be hard and rough to its young when hatched. It divides the food among its offspring with the most rigid justice, giving it first to one and then to another. With a remarkable notion of cleanliness, it throws out of the nest the ordure of the young ones, and when they have grown a little older, teaches them how to turn round and let it fall outside the nest. There is another kind of swallow also that frequents the fields and the country. Its nest is of a different shape, though the same materials, but it rarely builds it against houses. The nest has its mouth turned straight upwards, and the entrance to it is long and narrow, while the body is very capacious. It is quite wonderful what skill is displayed in the formation of it, for the purpose of concealing the young ones, and of presenting a soft surface for them to lie upon. At the Heracleotic mouth of the Nile in Egypt, the swallows present an insuperable obstacle to the inroads of that river in the embankment which is formed by their nests in one continuous line nearly a stadium in length, a thing that could not possibly have been effected by the agency of man. In Egypt too, near the city of Coptos, there is an island sacred to Isis. In the early days of spring the swallows strengthened the angular corner of this island with chaff and straw, thus fortifying it in order that the river may not sweep it away. This work they persevere in for three days and nights together, with such unremitting labour that it is a well-known fact that many of them die with their exertions. This too is a toil which recurs regularly for them every year. There is again a third kind of swallow, which makes holes in the banks of rivers to serve for its nest. The young of these birds, reduced to ashes, are a good specific against mortal maladies of the throat, and tend to cure many other diseases of the human body. These birds do not build nests, and they take care to migrate a good many days before, if it so happens that the rise of the river is about to reach their holes. 
End of section 39. Section 40 of The Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder, translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 40. Chapter 50. The Acanthalus and Other Birds. Belonging to the genus of birds known as the Vitipare, there is one whose nest is formed of dried moss, and is in shape so exactly like a ball that it is impossible to discover the mouth of it. The bird also that is known as the Acanthalus makes its nest of a similar shape, and interweaves it with pieces of flax. The nest of one of the woodpeckers, very much like a cup in shape, is suspended by a twig from the end of the branch of a tree, so that no quadruped may be able to reach it. It is strongly asserted that the whitwall sleeps suspended by its feet because it fancies that by doing so it is in greater safety. A thing, indeed, that is well known of them all is the fact that in a spirit of foresight they select the projecting branches of trees that are sufficiently strong for the purpose of supporting their nests and then arch them over to protect them from the rain or else shield them by means of the thickness of the foliage. In Arabia there is a bird known as the cinnamogalus. It builds its nest with sprigs of cinnamon, and the natives knock them down with arrows loaded with lead in order to sell them. In Scythia there is a bird the size of the otis, which produces two young ones always, in a hair skin suspended from the top branches of a tree. Pies, when they have observed a person steadily gazing at their nest, will immediately remove their eggs to another place. This is said to be accomplished in a truly wonderful manner by such birds as have not toes adapted for holding and removing their eggs. They lay a twig upon two eggs, and then solder them to it by means of a glutinous matter secreted from their body, after which they pass their neck between the eggs, and so forming an equipose, convey them to another place. Chapter 51 The Murats Partridges No less, too, is the shrewdness displayed by those birds which make their nests upon the ground because, from the extreme weight of their body, they are unable to fly aloft. There is a bird known as the Merops, which feeds its parents in their retreat. The color of the plumage on the inside is pale, and azure without, while it is of a somewhat reddish hue at the extremity of the wings. This bird builds its nest in a hole which it digs to the depth of six feet. Partridges fortify their retreat so well with thorns and shrubs that it is effectually protected against beasts of prey. They make a soft bed for their eggs by burying them in the dust, but do not hatch them where they are laid, that no suspicion may arise from the fact of their being seen repeatedly about the same spot. They carry them away to some other place. The females also conceal themselves from their mates, in order that they may not be delayed in the process of incubation, as the males, in consequence of the warmth of their passions, are apt to break the eggs. The males, thus deprived of females, fall to fighting among themselves, and it is said that the one that is conquered is treated as a female by the other. Trogus Pompeius tells us that quails and dunghill cocks sometimes do the same, and adds that wild partridges, when newly caught or when beaten by the others, are trodden promiscuously by the tame ones. Through the very pugnacity thus inspired by the strength of their passions, these birds are often taken, as the leader of the whole covey frequently advances to fight with the decoy bird of the fowler. As soon as he is taken, another and then another will advance, all of which are caught in their turn. The females, again, are caught about the pairing season, for then they will come forward to quarrel with the female decoy bird of the fowler, and so drive her away. Indeed, in no other animal is there any such susceptibility in the sexual feelings. If the female only stands opposite to the male, while the wind is blowing from that direction, she will become impregnated, and during this time she is in the state of the greatest excitement, the beak being wide open and the tongue thrust out, the female will conceive also from the action of the air, as the male flies above her, and very often from only hearing his voice. Indeed, to such a degree does passion get the better of her affection for her offspring, that although at the moment she is sitting furtively and in concealment, she will, if she perceives the female decoy bird of the fowler approaching her mate, 
call him back and summon him away from the other and voluntarily submit to his advances indeed these birds are often carried away by such frantic madness that they will settle being quite blinded by fear upon the very head of the fowler if he happens to move in the direction of the nest the female bird that is sitting will run and throw herself before his feet pretending to be over heavy or else weak in the loins and then suddenly running or flying for a short distance before him will fall down as though she had a wing broken or else her feet just as he is about to catch her she will then take another fly and so keep baffling him in his hopes until she has led him to a considerable distance from her nest as soon as she is rid of her fears and free from all maternal disquietude she will throw herself upon her back in some furrow seizing a clod of earth with her claws and cover herself all over it is supposed that the life of the partridge extends to sixteen years chapter fifty two pigeons next to the partridge it is in the pigeon that similar tenacities are to be seen in the same respect but then chastity is especially observed by it and promiscuous intercourse is a thing quite unknown although inhabiting a domicile in common with others they will none of them violate the laws of conjugal fidelity not one will desert its nest unless it is either widower or widow although too the males are very imperious and sometimes even extremely exacting the females put up with it for in fact the males sometimes suspect them of infidelity though by nature they are incapable of it on such occasions the throat of the male seems quite choked with indignation and he inflicts severe blows with the beak and then afterwards to make some atonement he falls to billing and by way of pressing his amorous solicitations sidles around and around the female with his feet they both of them manifest an equal degree of affection for their offspring indeed it is not infrequently that this is a ground for correction in consequence of the female being too slow in going to her young when the female is sitting the male renders her every attention that can in any way tend to her solace and comfort the first thing that they do is to eject from the throat some saltish earth which they have digested into the mouths of the young ones in order to prepare them in due time to receive their nutriment it is a peculiarity of the pigeon and of the turtle dove not to throw back the neck when drinking but to take water in at a long draught just as beasts of burden do we read in some authors that the ring dove lives so long as thirty years and sometimes as much as forty without any other inconvenience than extreme length of the claws which with them in fact is the chief mark of old age they can be cut however without any danger the voice of all these birds is similar being composed of three notes and then a mournful noise at the end in winter they are silent and they only recover their voice in the spring nigidius expresses it as his opinion that the ring dove will abandon the place if she hears her name mentioned under the roof where she is sitting on her eggs they hatch their young just after the summer solstice pigeons and turtle doves live eight years the sparrow on the other hand has an equal degree of salaciousness and is short-lived in the extreme it is said that the male does not live beyond a year and as a ground for this belief it is stated that at the beginning of spring the black marks are never to be seen upon the beak which begin to appear in the summer the females however are said to live somewhat longer pigeons have even a certain appreciation of glory there is reason for believing that they are well aware of the colors of their plumage and the various shades which it presents and even in their very mode of flying they court our applause as they cleave the air in every direction it is indeed through the spirit of ostentation that they are handed over fast bound as it were to the hawk for from the noise that they make which in fact is only produced by the flapping of their wings their long feathers become twisted and disordered otherwise when they can fly without any impediment they are far swifter in their movements than the hawk the robber lurking amid the dense foliage keeps on the lookout for them and seizes them at the very moment that they are indulging in their vainglorious self-complacence it is for this reason that it is necessary to keep along with the pigeons the bird that is known as the tenunculus as it protects them and by its natural superiority scares away the hawk so much so indeed that the hawk will vanish at the very sight of it and the instant it hears its voice hence it is that the pigeons have an especial regard for this bird and it is said if one of these birds is buried at each of the four corners of the pigeon house in pots that have been newly glazed the pigeons will not change their abode a result which has been obtained by some by cutting a joint of their wings with an instrument of gold for if any other were used the wounds would not be unattended with danger the pigeon in general may be looked upon as a bird fond of change they have the art too among themselves of gaining one another over and so seducing their companions 
hence it is that we frequently find them return attended by others which they have enticed away chapter fifty three wonderful things done by them prices at which they have been sold in addition to this pigeons have acted as messengers in affairs of importance during the siege of mutina the chemis brutus who was in the town sent dispatches to the camp of the consuls fastened to the pigeons feet of what use to antony then were his entrenchments and all the vigilance of the besieging army his nets too which he had spread in the river while the messenger of the besieged was cleaving the air many persons have quite a mania for pigeons building towns for them on the top of their roofs and taking pleasure in relating the pedigree and noble origin of each of this there is an ancient insistence that is very remarkable al axius a roman of the equestrian order shortly before the civil war of pompeius sold a single pair for four hundred denarii as we learn from the writings of m varro countries even have gained renown for their pigeons it is thought that those of campania attain the largest size chapter fifty four different modes of flight and progression in birds the flight of the pigeon also leads me to consider that of other birds as well all other animals have one determinate mode of progression which in every kind is always the same it is birds alone that have two modes of moving the one on the ground the other in the air some of them walk such as the crow for instance some hop as a sparrow and the blackbird some again run as a partridge and the wood hen while others throw one foot before the other the stork and the crane for instance then again in their flight some birds expand their wings and poising themselves in the air only move them from time to time others move them more frequently but then only at the extremities while others expand them so as to expose the whole of the side on the other hand some fly with the greater part of the wings kept close to the side and some after striking the air once others twice make their way through it as though pressing upon it enclosed beneath their wings other birds dart aloft in a vertical direction others horizontally and others come falling straight downwards you would almost think that some had been hurled upwards with a violent effort and that others again had fallen straight down from aloft while others are seen to spring forward in their flight ducks alone and the other birds of that kind in an instant raise themselves aloft taking a spring from the spot where they stand straight upwards towards the heavens and this they can do from out of the water even hence it is that they are the only birds that can make their escape from the pitfalls of which we employ for the capture of wild beasts the vulture and the heavier wild birds can only fly for taking a run or else by commencing their flight from an elevated spot they use the tail by way of rudder there are some birds that are able to see all around them others again have to turn the neck to do so some of them eat what they have seized holding it in their feet many as they fly utter some cry while on the other hand many in their flight are silent some fly with the breast half upright others with it held downwards others fly obliquely or else sideways and others following the direction of the bill some again are borne along with the head upwards indeed the fact is that if we were to see several kinds at the same moment we should not suppose that they have to make their way in the same element chapter fifty five the birds called apodes or caispelli those birds which are known as apodes fly the most of all because they are deprived of the use of their feet by some persons they are called caispelli they are a species of swallow which build their nests in the rocks and are the same birds that are to be seen everywhere at sea indeed however far a ship may go however long its voyage however great the distance from land the apodes never cease to hover around it other birds settle and come to a stand whereas these know no repose but in the nest they are always either on the wing or else asleep chapter fifty six respecting the food of birds the caprimogulus the plaita the instincts also of birds are no less varied and more especially in relation to their food caprimogulus is the name of a bird which is to all appearance a large blackbird it thieves by night as it cannot see during the day it enters the folds of the shepherds and makes straight for the udder of the she-goat to suck the milk through the injury thus inflicted the udder shrivels away and the goat that has thus been deprived of its milk is afflicted with incipient blindness Pleita is the name of another which pounces upon other birds when they have dived in the sea and seizing the head with its bill makes them let go their prey 
This bird also swallows and fills itself with shellfish, shells and all. After the natural heat of its crop has softened them, it brings them up again, and then, picking out the shells from the rest, selects the parts that are fit for food. Chapter 57 The Instincts of Birds The Carduelis, the Taurus, the Anthus The farmyard fowls also have a certain notion of religion. Upon laying an egg, they shudder all over and then shake their feathers, after which they turn around and purify themselves, or else hallow themselves, and their eggs with some stock or other. The Carduelis, which is the very smallest bird of any, will do what it is bid, not only with the voice but with the feet as well, and with the beak, which serves it instead of hands. There is one bird found in the territory of Arilete that imitates the lowing of oxen, from which circumstance it has received the name Taurus. In other respects it is of small size. Another bird called the Anthus imitates the neighing of the horse. Upon being driven from the pasture by the approach of the horses, it will mimic their voices, and this is the method it takes of revenging itself. Chapter 58 Birds Which Speak The Parrot But above all, there are some birds that can imitate the human voice, the parrot, for example, which can even converse. India sends us this bird, which it calls by the name of Setansis. The body is green all over, only it is marked with a ring of red around the neck. It will duly salute an emperor and pronounce the words it has heard spoken. It is rendered especially frolicsome under the influence of wine. Its head is as hard as its beak, and this, when it is being taught to talk, is beaten with a rod of iron, for otherwise it is quite insensible to blows. When it lights on the ground, it falls upon its back, and by resting upon it makes itself all the lighter for its feet, which are naturally weak. Chapter 59 The Pie Which Feeds on Acorns The magpie is much less famous for its talking qualities than the parrot, because it does not come from a distance and yet it can speak with much more distinctness. These birds love to hear words spoken which they can utter. And not only do they learn them, but are pleased at the task, and as they con them over to themselves with the greatest care and attention, make no secret of the interest they feel. It is a well-known fact that a magpie has died before now, when it has found itself mastered by a difficult word that it could not pronounce. Their memory, however, will fail them if they do not, from time to time, hear the same word repeated. And while they are trying to recollect it, they will show the most extravagant joy if they happen to hear it. Their appearance, although there is nothing remarkable in it, is by no means plain, but they have quite sufficient beauty in their singular ability to imitate the human speech. It is said, however, that it is only the kind of pie which feeds upon acorns that can be taught to speak, and that among these those which have five toes on each foot can be taught with the greatest facility, but in their case even, only during the first two years of their life. The magpie has a broader tongue than is usual with most birds, which is the case also with all the other birds that can imitate the human voice, although some individuals of almost every kind have the faculty of doing so. Agrippina, the wife of Claudius Caesar, had a thrush that could imitate human speech, a thing that was never known before. At the moment I am writing this, the young Caesars have a starling and some nightingales that are being taught to talk in Greek and Latin, besides which they are studying their task the whole day, continually repeating the new words that they have learnt, and giving utterance to phrases even of considerable length. Birds are taught to talk in a retired spot, and where no other voice can be heard so as to interfere with their lesson. A person sits by them and continually repeats the words he wishes them to learn while at the same time he encourages them by giving them food. Chapter 60 A Sedition That Arose Among the Roman People In Consequence of a Raven Speaking Let us do justice also to the raven, whose merits have been attested not only by the sentiments of the Roman people, but by the strong expression also of their indignation. In the reign of Tiberius, one of a brood of ravens that had bred on the top of the temple of Castor happened to fly into a shoemaker's shop that stood opposite, upon which, from a feeling of religious veneration, it was looked upon as doubly recommended by the owner of the place. The bird, having been taught to speak at an early age, used every morning to fly to the rostra, which looked towards the forum. Here, addressing each by his name, it would salute Tiberius, and then the Caesars, Germanicus, and Drusus, after which 
it would proceed to greet the roman populace as they passed and then return to the shop for several years it was remarkable for the consistency of its attendance the owner of another shoemaker's shop in the neighborhood in a sudden fit of anger killed the bird enraged as he would have had it appear because with its odour it had soiled some of his shoes upon this there was such rage manifested by the multitude that he was at once driven from that part of the city and soon after put to death the funeral too of the bird was celebrated with almost endless obsequies the body was placed upon a litter carried upon the shoulders of two ethiopians preceded by a piper and borne to the pile with garlands of every size and description the pile was erected on the right hand side of the appian way at the second milestone from the city in the field generally known as the field of ridiculous thus did the rare talent of a bird appear a sufficient ground to the roman people for honoring it with funeral obsequies as well as for inflicting punishment on a roman citizen and that too in a city in which no crowds had ever escorted the funeral of any one out of the whole number of its distinguished men and where no one had been found to avenge the death a scipio emilianus the man who had destroyed carthage in numanita this event happened in the consulship of m servilius and caius chestius on the fifth day before the calends of april at the present day also the moment that i am writing this there is in the city of rome a crow which belongs to a roman of equestrian rank and was brought from Baetica. in the first place it is remarkable for its color which is of the deepest black and at the same time it is able to pronounce several connected words while it is repeatedly learning fresh ones recently too there has been a story told about Criteris, surnamed monoceris in erzena a country of asia who was in the habit of hunting with the assistance of ravens and used to carry them into the woods perched on the tuft of his helmet and on his shoulders the birds used to keep on the watch for game and raise it and by training he had brought this art to such a pitch of perfection that even the wild ravens would attend him in a similar manner when he went out some authors have thought of the following circumstance deserving of remembrance a crow that was thirsty was seen heaping stones into the urn on a monument in which there was some rain water which it could not reach and so being afraid to go down into the water by thus accumulating the stones it caused as much water to come within its reach as was necessary to satisfy its thirst end of section forty Section 41 of The Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simum. The Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 41. Chapter 63. The Mode of Drinking with Birds. The Porphyrio birds drink by suction those which have a long neck taking their drink in a succession of draughts and throwing the head back as though they were pouring the water down the throat the porphyrio is the only bird that seems to bite the water as it drinks the same bird has also other peculiarities of its own for it will every now and then dip its food in the water and then lift it with its foot to its bill using it as a hand those that are the most esteemed are found in Comagini. They have beaks and very long legs of a red colour. Chapter 64. The Hematopus. There are the same characteristics in the Hematopus also, a bird of much smaller size, although standing as high on the legs. It is a native of Egypt, and has three toes on each foot, flies forming its principal food. If brought to Italy, it survives for a few days only. Chapter 65. The Food of Birds. All the heavy birds are frugivorous, while those with a higher flight feed upon flesh only. Among the aquatic birds, the divers are in the habit of devouring what the other birds have disgorged. Chapter 66. The Pelican. The pelican is similar in appearance to the swan, and it would be thought that there was no difference between them whatever were it not for the fact that under the throat there is a sort of second crop, as it were. It is in this that the ever-insatiate animal stows everything away, so much so that the capacity of this pouch is quite astonishing. 
after having finished its search for prey, it discharges bit by bit what it has thus stowed away, and reconveys it by a sort of ruminating process into its real stomach. The part of Gallia that lies nearest to the northern ocean produces this bird. Chapter 67. Foreign Birds, the Phalaridus, the Pheasant, and the Numidicae. In the Hercynian forest in Germany we hear of a singular kind of bird, the feathers of which shine at night like fire. The other birds there have nothing remarkable beyond the celebrity which generally attaches to objects situated at a distance. The Phalaridus, the most esteemed of all the aquatic birds, are found at Seleucia, the city of the Parthians of that name, and in Asia as well. And again, in Colchis, there is the pheasant, a bird with two tufts of feathers like ears, which it drops and raises every now and then. The Numidicae come from Numidia, a part of Africa. All these varieties are now to be found in Italy. Chapter 68 The Phoenicopterus, the Atagen, the Phalacrocorix, the Pyrocorix, and the Lagopus. Apicius, that very deepest whirlpool of all our epicures, has informed us that the tongue of the Phoenicopterus is of the most exquisite flavour. The Atagen, also, of Ionia, is a famous bird, but although it has a voice at other times, it is mute in captivity. It was formerly reckoned among the rare birds, but at the present day it is found in Gallia, Spain, and in the Alps even, which is also the case with the Phalacrocorix, a bird peculiar to the Balearic Isles as the pyrocorix, a black bird with a yellow bill, is to the Alps, and the lagopus, which is esteemed for its excellent flavour. This last bird derives its name from its feet, which are covered, as it were, with the fur of a hare, the rest of the body being white, and the size of a pigeon. It is not an easy matter to taste it out of its native country, as it never becomes domesticated, and when dead it quickly spoils. There is another bird also which has the same name, and only differs from the quail in size. It is of a saffron colour, and is most delicate eating. Ignatius Calvinus, who was prefect there, pretends that he has seen in the Alps the ibis also, a bird that is peculiar to Egypt. Chapter 69. The New Birds. The Vipio. During the civil wars that took place at Bibriacum, beyond the river Padus, the new birds were introduced into Italy, for by that name they are still known. They resemble the thrush in appearance, are a little smaller than the pigeon in size, and of an agreeable flavour. The Balearic Islands also send us a porphyrio that is superior to the one previously mentioned. There the butio, a kind of hawk, is held in high esteem for the table, as also the vipio, the name given to a small kind of crane. Chapter 70. Fabulous Birds. I look upon the birds as fabulous, which are called pagasi, and are said to have a horse's head, as also the griffons, with long ears and a hooked beak. The former are said to be natives of Scythia, the latter of Ethiopia. The same is my opinion, also, as to the tragopan. Many writers, however, assert that it is larger than the eagle, has curved horns on the temples, and a plumage of iron colour, with the exception of the head, which is purple. Nor yet do the sirens obtain any greater credit with me, although Dinan, the father of Clearchus, a celebrated writer, asserts that they exist in India, and that they charm men by their song, and, having first lulled them to sleep, tear them to pieces. The person, however, who may think fit to believe in these tales, may probably not refuse to believe also that dragons licked the ears of Melampodes, and bestowed upon him the power of understanding the language of birds, as also what Democritus says, when he gives the names of certain birds by the mixture of whose blood a serpent is produced, the person who eats of which will be able to understand the language of birds, as well as the statements which the same writer makes relative to one bird in particular, known as the Galerita. Indeed, the science of augury is already too much involved in embarrassing questions without these fanciful reveries. There is a kind of bird spoken of by Homer as the scops, but I cannot very easily comprehend the grotesque movements which many persons have attributed to it, when the fowler is laying snares for it. 
nor, indeed, is it a bird that is any longer known to exist. It will be better, therefore, to confine my relation to those the existence of which is generally admitted. Chapter 71 Who first invented the art of cramming poultry? Why the first censors forbade this practice? The people of Delos were the first to cram poultry, and it is with them that originated that abominable mania for devouring fattened birds, larded with the grease of their own bodies. I find in the ancient sumptuary regulations as to banquets that this was forbidden, for the first time, by a law of the consul Caius Fannius, eleven years before the Third Punic War, by which it was ordered that no bird should be served at table beyond a single pullet, and that not fattened, an article which has since made its appearance in all the sumptuary laws. A method, however, has been devised of evading it by feeding poultry upon food that has been soaked in milk. Prepared in this fashion, they are considered even still more delicate. All pullets, however, are not looked upon as equally good for the purposes of fattening, and only those are selected which have a fatty skin about the neck. Then, too, come all the arts of the kitchen, that the thighs may have a nice plump appearance, that the bird may be properly divided down the back, and that poultry may be brought to such a size that a single leg shall fill a whole platter. The Parthians, too, have taught their fashions to our cooks, and yet, after all, in spite of their refinements in luxury, no article is found to please equally in every part, for in one it is the thigh, and in another the breast only that is esteemed. Chapter 72 Who first invented aviaries? the dish of Aesopus. The first person who invented aviaries for the reception of all kinds of birds was M. Linnaeus Strabo, a member of the equestrian order, who resided at Brundisium. It was in his time that we thus began to imprison animals to which nature had assigned the heavens as their element. But more remarkable than anything in this respect is the story of the dish of Claudius Aesopus, the tragic actor which was valued at one hundred thousand sesterces, and in which were served up nothing but birds that had been remarkable for their song, or their imitation of the human voice, and purchased, each of them, at the price of six thousand sesterces, he being induced to this folly by no other pleasure than that in these he might eat the closest imitators of man, never for a moment reflecting that his own immense fortune had been acquired by the advantages of his voice apparent indeed right worthy of the son of whom we have already made mention as swallowing pearls it would not to say the truth be very easy to come to a conclusion which of the two was guilty of the greatest baseness unless indeed we are ready to admit that it was less unseemly to banquet upon the most costly of all the productions of nature than to devour tongues which had given utterance to the language of man chapter seventy three the generation of birds other oviparous animals. The generation of birds would appear to be very simple, while at the same time it has its own peculiar marvels. Indeed, there are quadrupeds as well that produce eggs, the chameleon, for instance, the lizard, and those of the serpent tribe of which we have previously spoken. Of the feathered rays, those which have hooked talons are comparatively unprolific, the cancris being the only one among them that lays more than four eggs. Nature has so ordained it in the birds that the timid ones should be more prolific than those which are courageous. The ostrich, the common fowl, and the partridge are the only birds that lay eggs in considerable numbers. Birds have two modes of coupling, the female crouching on the ground, as in the barn door of fowl, or else standing, as is the case with the crane. Chapter 74. The Various Kinds of Eggs and Their Nature Some eggs are white, as those of the pigeon and partridge, for instance. Others are of a pale colour, as in the aquatic birds. Others, again, are dotted all over with spots, as is the case with those of the meleagris. Others are red, like those of the pheasant and the cancris. In the inside, the eggs of all birds are of two colours. Those of the aquatic kind have more of the yellow than the white, and the yellow is of a paler tint than in those of other birds. Among fish, the eggs are of the same colour throughout, there being, in fact, no white. The eggs of birds are of a brittle nature, in consequence of the natural heat of the animal, while those of serpents are supple, in consequence of their coldness, and those of fish soft from their natural humidity. 
Again, the eggs of aquatic birds are round, while those of most other kinds are elongated and taper to a point. Eggs are laid with the round end foremost, and at the moment that they are laid the shell is soft, but it immediately grows hard as each portion becomes exposed to the air. Horatius Flaccus expresses it as his opinion that those eggs which are of an oblong shape are of the most agreeable flavour. The rounder eggs are those which produce the female, the others the male. The umbilical cord is in the upper part of the egg, like a drop floating on the surface in the shell. There are some birds that couple at all seasons of the year, barn-door fowls, for instance. They lay two at all times, with the exception of two months at midwinter. Pullets lay more eggs than the older hens, but then they are smaller. In the same brood those chickens are the smallest that are hatched the first and the last. These animals, indeed, are so prolific that some of them will lay as many as sixty eggs, some daily, some twice a day, and some in such vast numbers that they have been known to die from exhaustion. Those known as the Adriani are the most esteemed. Pigeons sit ten times a year, and some of them eleven, and in Egypt during the month of the winter solstice even. Swallows, blackbirds, ring-doves, and turtle-doves sit twice a year, most other birds only once. Thrushes make their nests of mud in the tops of trees, almost touching one another, and lay during the time of their retirement. The egg comes to maturity in the ovary ten days after treading, but if the hen or pigeon is tormented by pulling out the feathers, or by the infliction of any injury of a similar nature, the maturing of the egg is retarded. In the middle of the yolk of every egg there is what appears to be a little drop of blood. This is supposed to be the heart of the chicken, it being the general belief that that part is formed the first in every animal. At all events, while in the egg, this speck is seen to throb and palpitate. The body of the animal itself is formed from the white fluid in the egg, while the yellow part constitutes its food. The head in every kind, while in the shell, is larger than the rest of the body. The eyes, too, are closed and are larger than the other parts of the head. As the chicken grows, the white gradually passes to the middle of the egg, while the yellow is spread around it. On the twentieth day, if the egg is shaken, the voice of the now living animal can be heard in the shell. From this time it gradually becomes clothed with feathers, and its position is such that it has the head above the right foot, and the right wing above the head. The yolk in the meantime gradually disappears. All birds are born with the feet first, while with every other animal the contrary is the case. Some hens lay all their eggs with two yolks, and sometimes hatch twin chickens from the same egg, one being larger than the other, according to Cornelius Celsus. Other writers, however, deny the possibility of twin chickens being hatched. It is a rule never to give a brood hen more than twenty-five eggs to sit upon at once. Hens begin to lay immediately after the winter solstice. The best broods are those which are hatched before the vernal equinox. Chickens that are hatched after the summer solstice never attain their full growth, and the more so, the later they are produced. Chapter 75. Defects in Brood Hens and Their Remedies Those eggs which have been laid within the last ten days are the best for putting under the hen. Old ones, or those which have just been laid, will be unfruitful. An uneven number also ought to be placed. On the fourth day, after the hen has begun to sit, if, upon taking an egg with one hand by the two ends and holding it up to the light, it is found to be clear and of one uniform colour, it is most likely to be barren, and another should be substituted in its place. There is also a way of testing them by means of water. An empty egg will float on the surface, while those that fall to the bottom, or, in other words, are full, should be placed under the hen. Care must be taken, however, not to make trial by shaking them, for if the organs which are necessary for life become confused, they will come to nothing. Incubation ought to begin just after the new moon, for, if commenced before, the eggs will be unproductive. The chickens are hatched sooner if the weather is warm. Hence it is that in summer they break the shell on the nineteenth day, but in winter on the twenty-fifth only. If it happens to thunder during the time of incubation, the eggs are addled, and if the cry of a hawk is heard, they are spoiled. The best remedy against the effects of thunder is to put an iron nail beneath the straw on which the eggs are laid, or else some earth from off a ploughshare. 
Some eggs, however, are hatched by the spontaneous action of nature without the process of incubation, as is the case in the dunghills of Egypt. There is a well-known story related about a man at Syracuse who was in the habit of covering eggs with earth, and then continuing his drinking bout till they were hatched. Chapter 76 An Augury Derived from Eggs by an Empress And, what is even more singular still, eggs can be hatched also by a human being. Julia Augusta, when pregnant in her early youth of Tiberius Caesar, by Nero, was particularly desirous that her offspring should be a son, and accordingly employed the following mode of divination, which was then much in use among young women. She carried an egg in her bosom, taking care, whenever she was obliged to put it down, to give it to her nurse to warm in her own, that there might be no interruption in the heat. It is stated that the result promised by this mode of augury was not falsified. It was perhaps from this circumstance that the modern invention took its rise of placing eggs in a warm spot and covering them with chaff, the heat being maintained by a moderate fire, while in the meantime a man is employed in turning them. By the adoption of this plan, the young, all of them, break the shell on a stated day. There is a story told of a breeder of poultry of such remarkable skill that on seeing an egg he could tell which hen had laid it. It is said also that when a hen has happened to die while sitting, the males have been seen to take her place in turns, and perform all the other duties of a brood hen, taking care in the meantime to abstain from crowing. But the most remarkable thing of all is the sight of a hen beneath which Doug's eggs have been put and hatched. At first she is unable to quite recognize the brood as her own, while in her anxiety she gives utterance to her clucking, as she doubtfully calls them. Then, at last, she will stand at the margin of the pond, uttering her laments, while the ducklings, with nature for their guide, are diving beneath the water. Chapter 77 The Best Kinds of Fowls The breed of a fowl is judged of by the erectness of the crest, which is sometimes double, its black wings, reddish beak, and toes of unequal number, there being sometimes a fifth placed transversely above the other four. For the purposes of divination, those that have a yellow beak and feet are not considered pure, while for the secret rites of Bonadilla, black ones are chosen. There is also a dwarf species of fowl, which is not barren either, a thing that is the case with no other kind of bird. These dwarfs, however, rarely lay at any stated periods, and their incubation is productive of injury to the eggs. Chapter 78 THE DISEASES OF FOWLS AND THEIR REMEDIES the most dangerous malady with every kind of fowl is that known as the pituita, which is present more particularly between the times of harvest and vintage. The mode of treatment is to put them on a spare diet, and to expose them, while asleep, to the action of smoke, and more especially that of bay leaves, or of the herb called savin. A feather also is inserted, and passed across through the nostrils, care being taken to move it every day while their food consists of leeks mixed with spelt meal, or else is first soaked in water in which an owlet has been dipped, or boiled together with the seeds of the white vine. There are also some other receipts besides. Chapter 79 When birds lay and how many eggs, the various kinds of herons. Pigeons have the peculiarity of billing before they couple. They generally lay two eggs, nature so willing it that among birds the produce should be more frequent with some and more numerous with others. The ring-dove and turtle-dove mostly lay three eggs, and never more than twice, in the spring, such being the case when the first brood has been lost. Although they may happen to lay three eggs, they never hatch more than two. The third egg, which is barren, is generally known by the name of urinum. The female ring-dove sits on the eggs from midday till morning, the male the rest of the time. Pigeons always produce a male and a female, the male first, the female the day after. Both the male and the female pigeon sit on the eggs, the male in the daytime, the female during the night. They hatch on the twentieth day of incubation, and lay the fifth day after coupling. Sometimes, indeed, in summer, these birds will rear three couples in two months, for then they hatch on the eighteenth day of incubation, and immediately conceive again. Hence it is that eggs are often found among the young ones, some of which last are just taking wing, while others are only bursting the shell. The young ones, themselves, begin to produce at the age of five months. 
the females, if there should happen to be no male among them, will even tread each other, and lay barren eggs from which nothing is produced. By the Greeks, these eggs are called hypenemia. The peahen produces at three years old. In the first year she will lay one or two eggs, in the next four or five, and in the remaining years twelve, but never beyond that number. She lays for two or three days at intervals, and will produce three broods in the year, if care is taken to put the eggs under a common hen. The males are apt to break the eggs in getting at the females while sitting, and hence it is that the pea-hen lays by night and in secret places, or else sits on her eggs in an elevated spot. The eggs will break too, unless they are received upon some surface that is soft. One male is sufficient for every five females. When there are only one or two females to a male, all chance of their being prolific is spoiled to their extreme salaciousness. The young breaks the shell in twenty-seven days, or, at the very latest, on the thirtieth. Geese pair in the water and lay in spring, or, if they have paired in the winter, they lay about forty eggs after the summer solstice. The hatching takes place twice in the year, if a hen hatches the first brood, otherwise their greatest number of eggs will be sixteen their lowest seven. If their eggs are taken away from them, they will keep on laying until they burst. They will not hatch the eggs of any other birds. The best number of eggs for placing under the goose for hatching is nine, or else eleven. The females only sit, and that for thirty days, but if they are kept very warm, then only twenty-five. The contact of the nettle is fatal to their young, and their own greediness is no less so. Sometimes, through overeating, and sometimes through over-exertion. For seizing the root of a plant with the bill, they will make repeated efforts to tear it out of the ground, and so at last dislocate the neck. A remedy against the noxious effects of the nettle is to place the root of that plant under the straw of their nest. There are three kinds of herons, called, respectively, the leucon, the asterias, and the pelas. These birds experience great pain in coupling, uttering loud cries, the males bleed from the eyes, while the females lay their eggs with no less difficulty. The eagle sits for thirty days, as do most of the larger birds. The smaller ones, the kite and the hawk, for instance, only twenty. The eagle mostly lays but one egg, never more than three. The bird which is known as the aegolius lays four, and the raven sometimes five. They sit, too, the same number of days as the kite and the hawk. The male crow provides the female with food while she is sitting. The magpie lays nine eggs, the melancorophus more than twenty, but always an uneven number, and no bird of this kind ever lays more. So much superior in fecundity are the smaller birds. The young ones of the swallow are blind at first, as is the case also with almost all the birds the progeny of which is numerous. CHAPTER eighty. What eggs are called hyponemia, and what kinosura? How eggs are best kept? The barren eggs, which we have mentioned as hyponemia, are either conceived by the females when they are influenced by libidinous fancies and couple with one another, or else at the moment when they are rolling themselves in the dust. They are produced not only by the pigeon, but by the common hen as well. The partridge, the pea-hen, the goose, and the canalopex, these eggs are barren, smaller than the others, of a less agreeable flavour and more humid. There are some who think that they are generated by the wind, for which reason they give them the name of Zephyria. The eggs known as urina, which by some are called kinosura, are only laid in the spring, and at a time when the hen has discontinued sitting. Eggs, if soaked in vinegar, are rendered so soft thereby that they may be twisted round the finger like a ring. The best method of preserving them is to keep them packed in bean meal or chaff during the winter, and in bran during the summer. It is a general belief that if kept in salt they will lose their contents. Chapter 81. The only winged animal that is viviparous and nurtures its young with its milk. Among the winged animals the only one that is viviparous is the bat. It is the only one, too, that has wings formed of a membrane. This is also the only winged creature that feeds its young with milk from the breast. The mother clasps her two young ones as she flies, and so carries them along with her. This animal, too, is said to have but one joint in the haunch, 
and to be particularly fond of gnats. End of section 41《Section 42 of the Natural History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. The Natural History, Volume 2. By Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 42. Chapter 81 the only winged animal that is viviparous and nurtures its young with its milk. Among the winged animals, the only one that is viviparous is the bat. It is the only one, too, that has wings formed of a membrane. This is also the only winged creature that feeds its young with milk from the breast. The mother clasps her two young ones as she flies, and so carries them along with her. This animal, too, is said to have but one joint in the haunch, and to be particularly fond of gnats. Chapter 82. Terrestrial Animals That Are Oviparous, Various Kinds of Serpents. Again, among the terrestrial animals, there are the serpents that are oviparous, of which as yet we have not spoken. These creatures couple by clasping each other and entwine so closely around one another that they might be taken for only one animal with two heads. The male viper thrusts its head into the mouth of the female, which gnaws it in the transports of its passion. This, too, is the only one among the terrestrial animals that lays eggs within its body, of one color and soft like those of fishes. On the third day it hatches, its young in the uterus, and then excludes them, one every day, and generally twenty in number. The last ones become so impatient of their confinement that they force a passage through the sides of the parent and so kill her. Other serpents again lay eggs attached to one another, and then bury them in the earth, the young being hatched in the following year. Crocodiles sit on their eggs in turns, first the male and then the female. But let us now turn to the generation of the rest of the terrestrial animals. Chapter 83. Generation of all kinds of terrestrial animals. The only one among the bipeds that is viviparous is man. Man is the only animal that repents of his first embraces. Sad augury indeed of life, that its very origin should thus cause repentance. Other animals have stated times in the year for their embraces, but man, as we have already observed, employs for this purpose all hours, both of day and night. Other animals become sated with venereal pleasures. Man hardly knows any satiety. Messalina, the wife of Claudius Caesar, thinking this a palm quite worthy of an empress, selected for the purpose of deciding the question, one of the most notorious of the women who followed the profession of a hired prostitute. And the empress outdid her, after continuous intercourse, night and day, at the twenty-fifth embrace. In the human race also, the men have devised various substitutes for the more legitimate exercise of passion, all of which outrage nature, while the females have recourse to abortion. How much more guilty than the brute beasts are we in this respect? Hesiod, has stated that men are more lustful in winter, women in summer. Coupling is performed back to back by the elephant, the camel, the tiger, the lynx, the rhinoceros, the lion, the disciples, and the rabbit, the genital parts of all which animals lie far back. Camels even seek desert places, or at all events, spots of a retired nature, and to come upon them on such an occasion is not unattended with danger. Coupling with them lasts a whole day, the only animal, indeed, of all those with solid hoofs, with which such is the case. Among the quadrupeds, it is the smell that excites the passions of the male. And this act, dogs also, seals and wolves, turn back to back, and remain attached, though greatly against their will. In the greater part of the animals above mentioned, the females solicit the males, and some, however, the males the females. As to bears, they lie down, like the human race, as previously mentioned by us, while hedgehogs embrace standing upright. In cats the male stands above while the female assumes a crouching posture. Foxes lie on the side, the females embracing the male. In the case of the cow and the hind, the female is unable to endure the violence of the male. Consequently, she keeps in motion during the time of coupling. The buck goes from one hind to another in turn, and then comes back to the first. 
lizards couple and twined around each other like the animals without feet. All animals, the larger they are in bulk, are proportionably less prolific. The elephant, the camel, and the horse produce but one, while the acanthus, a very small bird, produces twelve. Those animals, also which are the most prolific, are the shortest time in breeding. The larger an animal is, the longer is the time required for its formation in the womb. Those also which are the longest lived require the longest gestation. The growing age, too, is not suitable for the purposes of generation. Those animals which have solid hoofs bear but a single young one, while those which have cloven hoofs bear two. Those, again, whose feet are divided into toes have a still more numerous offspring, but while the others bring forth their young perfect, these last bear them in an unformed state, such, for instance, as the lioness and the she-bear. The fox also brings forth its young, in an even more imperfect state than these. It is a very uncommon thing, however, to find it whelping. After the birth, these animals warm their young by licking them, and thereby give them their proper shape. They mostly produce four at a birth. The dog, the wolf, the panther, and the jackal produce their young blind. There are several kinds of dogs. Those of Laconia, of both sexes, are ready for breeding in the eighth month, and the females carry their young sixty or sixty-three days at most. Other dogs are fit for breeding when only six months old. The female in all cases becomes pregnant at the first congress. Those which have conceived before the proper age bear pups which are no longer blind, though not all the same number of days. It is thought that dogs in general lift the leg when they water at six months old. This, too, is looked upon as a sign that they have attained their full growth and strength. When doing this, the female squats. The most numerous litters known consist of twelve, but more generally five or six is the number. Sometimes, indeed, only one is produced, but then it is looked upon as a prodigy, and the same is the case, too, when all the pups are of one sex. In the dog, the male comes into the world first, but in other animals the two sexes are born alternately. The female admits the male again six months after she has littered. Those of the Laconian breed bear eight young ones. It is a peculiarity in this kind that, after undergoing great labor, the males are remarkable for their salacity. In the Laconian breed the male lives ten years, the female twelve, while other kinds again live fifteen years, and sometimes as much as twenty, but they are not fit for breeding to the end of their life as they generally cease at about the twelfth year. The cat and the ichneumon are, in other respects, like the dog, but they only live six years. The disciples brings forth every month in the year, and is subject to superfetion, like the hare. It conceives immediately after it has littered, even though it is still suckling its young, which are blind at their birth. The elephant, as we have already stated, produces but one, and that the size of a calf three months old. The gestation of the camel lasts twelve months. The female conceives when three years old, and brings forth in the spring. At the end of a year, from that time, she is ready to conceive again. It is thought advisable to have the mare covered, so soon as three days, and indeed sometimes only one after she has foaled. It is believed also that it is by no means an uncommon thing for a woman to conceive on the seventh day after her delivery. It is recommended that the manes of mares should be cut, so as to humble their pride, in order to make them submit to be covered by the male ass, for when the mane is long they are liable to be proud in vain. This is the only animal, the female of which, after covering, runs facing the north or the south, according as she has conceived a male or a female. They change their color immediately after, and the hair becomes of a redder hue, and deeper, whatever the color may naturally be. It is this that indicates that they must no longer be covered, and they themselves will even resist it. Gestation does not, however, preclude some of them from being worked, and they are often with foal long before it is known. We read that the mayor of Ecrates, the Thessalonian, conquered at the Olympic Games while with foal. Those who are more careful inquirers into these matters tell us that in the horse, the dog, and the swine, the males are most ardent for sexual intercourse in the morning, while the female seeks the society of the male after midday. They say also that mares in harness desire the horse sixty days sooner than those that live in herds, that it is swine only that foam at the mouth during the time of coupling, 
and that a boar, if it hears the voice of a sow in heat, will refuse to take its food, to such a degree, indeed, as to starve itself if it is not allowed to cover, while the female is reduced to such a state of frantic madness as to attack and tear a man, more especially if wearing a white garment. This frenzy, however, is appeased by sprinkling vinegar on the sexual parts. It is supposed also that salacity is promoted by certain elements, the herb rocket, for instance, in the case of man, and onions in that of cattle. Wild animals that have been tamed do not conceive, the goose, for instance. The wild boar and the stag will only produce late in life, and even then they must have been taken and tamed when very young, a singular fact. The pregnant females among the quadrupeds refuse the male, with the exception, indeed, of the mare and the sow. Superfecion, however, takes place in none but the disciples and the hare. CHAPTER 84 THE POSITION OF ANIMALS IN THE UTERUS All those animals that are viviparous produce their young with the head first, the young animal about the time of yeaning, turning itself round in the womb, where at other times it lies extended at full length. Quadrupeds during the time of gestation have the legs extended and lying close to the belly, while, on the other hand, man is gathered up into a ball with the nose between the knees. With reference to moles, of which we have previously spoken, it is supposed that they are produced when a female has conceived, not by a male, but of herself only. Hence it is that there is no vitality in this false conception, because it does not proceed from the conjunction of the two sexes, and it has only that sort of vegetative existence in itself which we see in plants and trees. Of all those which produce their young in a perfect state, the swine is the only one that bears them in considerable numbers as well, and indeed several times in the year, a thing that is contrary to the usual nature of animals with a solid or cloven hoof. CHAPTER 85 ANIMALS WHOSE ORIGIN IS STILL UNKNOWN But it is mice that surpass all the other animals in fecundity, and it is not without some hesitation that I speak of them. Although I have Aristotle and some of the officers of Alexander the Great for my authority, it is said that these animals generate by licking one another, and not by copulation. They have related cases where a single female has given birth to one hundred and twenty young ones, and in Persia some were found even pregnant themselves, while yet in the womb of the parent. It is believed also that these animals will become pregnant on tasting salt. Hence we find that we have no longer any reason to wonder how such vast multitudes of field mice devastate the standing corn, though it is still a mystery, with reference to them, in what way it is that such multitudes die so suddenly. For their dead bodies are never to be found, and there is not a person in existence that has ever dug up a mouse in a field during the winter. Multitudes of these animals visit Troas, and before this they have driven away the inhabitants in consequence of their vast numbers. They multiply greatly during times of drought, it is said also that when they are about to die, a little worm grows in their head. The mice of Egypt have hard hairs, just like those of the hedgehog. They walk on their hind feet, as also do those of the Alps. When two animals couple of different kinds, the union is only prolific if the time of gestation is the same in both. Among the oviparous quadrupeds, it is generally believed that the lizard brings forth by the mouth though Aristotle denies the fact. These animals, too, do not sit upon their eggs, as they forget in what place they have laid them, being utterly destitute of memory. Hence it is that the young ones are hatched spontaneously. CHAPTER 86 SALAMANDERS We find it stated by many authors that a serpent is produced from the spinal marrow of a man. Many creatures, in fact, among the quadrupeds, even, have a secret and mysterious origin. Thus, for instance, the salamander, an animal like a lizard in shape, and with a body starred all over, never comes out except during heavy showers, and disappears the moment it becomes fine. This animal is so intensely cold as to extinguish fire by its contact in the same way as ice does. It spits forth the milky matter from its mouth, and whatever part of the human body is touched with this, all the hair falls off, and the part assumes the appearance of leprosy. CHAPTER 87 Animals which are born of beings that have not been born themselves, 
animals which are born themselves but are not reproductive, animals which are of neither sex. Some animals, again, are engendered of beings that are not engendered themselves, and have no such origin as those above mentioned, which are produced in the spring or at some stated period of the year. Some of these are non-productive. The salamander, for instance, which is of no sex, either male or female, a distinction also, which does not exist in the eel, and the other kinds that are neither viviparous nor oviparous. The oyster also, as well as the other shellfish, that adhere to the bottom of the sea or to rocks, are of neither sex. Again, as to those animals which are able to engender of themselves, if they are looked upon as divided into male and female, they do engender something, it is true, by coupling. But the produce is imperfect, quite dissimilar to the animal itself, and one from which nothing else is reproduced. This we find to be the case with flies, when they give birth to maggots. This fact is better illustrated by the nature of those animals which are known as insects. A subject, indeed, very difficult of explanation, and one which requires to be treated of in a book by itself. We will therefore proceed for the present with our remarks upon the instincts of the animals that have been previously mentioned. Chapter 88. The Senses of Animals. That all have the senses of touch and taste. Those which are more remarkable for their sight, smell, or hearing. Moles. Whether oysters have the sense of hearing. Man excels more especially in his sense of touch, and next in that of taste. In other respects he is surpassed by many of the animals. Eagles can see more clearly than any other animals, while vultures have the better smell. Moles hear more distinctly than others, although buried in the earth, so dense and sluggish an element as it is. And what is even more, although every sound has a tendency upwards, they can hear the words that are spoken. And it is said, they can even understand it if you talk about them, and will take flight immediately. Among men a person, who has not enjoyed the sense of hearing in his infancy, is deprived of the powers of speech as well, and there are none deaf from their birth who are not dumb also. Among the marine animals it is not probable that oysters enjoy the sense of hearing, but it is said that immediately a noise is made the solon will sink to the bottom. It is for this reason, too, that silence is observed by persons while fishing at sea. CHAPTER 89 which fishes have the best hearing? Fishes have neither organs of hearing, nor yet the exterior orifice, and yet it is quite certain that they do hear, for it is a well-known fact that in some fish-ponds they are in the habit of being assembled to be fed by the clapping of the hands. In the fish-ponds, too, that belong to the emperor, the fish are in the habit of coming, each kind as it bears its name. So, too, it is said, the mullet, the wolfish, the salpa, and the chromis have a very exquisite sense of hearing, and that it is for this reason that they frequent shallow water. CHAPTER 90. WHICH FISHES HAVE THE FINEST SENSE OF SMELL? It is quite manifest that fishes have the sense of smell also, for they are not all to be taken with the same bait, and are seen to smell at it before they seize it. Some, too, that are concealed in the bottom of holes, are driven out by the fisherman by the aid of the smell of salted fish. With this he rubs the entrance of their retreat in the rock, immediately upon which they take to flight from the spot, just as though they had recognized the dead carcass of those of their kind. Then again they will rise to the surface at the smell of certain odors, such, for instance, as roasted sepia and polypus. And hence it is that these baits are placed in the osier kipes used for taking fish. They immediately take to flight upon smelling the bilge water in a ship's hold, and more especially upon scenting the blood of fish. The polypus cannot possibly be torn away from the rock to which it clings, but upon the herb cunyla being applied, the instant it smells it, the fish quits its hold. Purples also are taken by means of fetid substances. And then, too, as to the other kinds of animals, who is there that can feel any doubt? Serpents are driven away by the smell of heart's horns, and more particularly by that of storax. Ants, too, are killed by the odors of origanum, lime or sulfur. Gnats are attracted by acids, but not by anything sweet. All animals have the sense of touch, those even which have no other sense, 
for even in the oyster and among land animals in the worm this sense is found chapter ninety one diversities in the feeding of animals i am strongly inclined to believe too that the sense of taste exists in all animals for why else should one seek one kind of food and another another and it is in this more especially that it is to be seen the wondrous power of nature the framer of all things some animals seize their prey with their teeth others again with their claws some tear it to pieces with their hooked beak others that have a broad bill wobble in their food others with a sharp nib or coals into it others suck at their food others again lick it others sup it up others chew it and others bolt it whole in no less a diversity is there in the uses they make of their feet for the purpose of carrying tearing asunder holding squeezing suspending their bodies or incessantly scratching the ground chapter ninety two animals which live on poisons roebucks and quails grow fat on poisons as we have already mentioned being themselves the most harmless of animals serpents will feed on eggs and the address displayed by the dragon is quite remarkable for it will either swallow the egg whole if its jaws will allow of it and roll over and over as to break it within and then by coughing eject the shells or else if it is too young to be able to do so it will gradually encircle the egg with its coils and hold it so tight as to break it at the end just in fact as though a piece had been cut out with a knife then holding the remaining part in its folds it will suck the contents in the same manner too when it has swallowed a bird whole it will make a violent effort and vomit the feathers chapter ninety three animals which live on earth animals which will not die of hunger or thirst scorpions live on earth serpents when an opportunity presents itself show an especial liking for wine although in other respects they need but very little drink these animals also when kept shut up require but little aliment hardly any at all in fact the same is the case also with spiders which at other times live by suction hence it is that no venomous animal will die of hunger or thirst it being the fact that they have neither heat blood nor sweat all which humours from their natural saltness increase the animal's voracity in this class of animals all those are the most deadly which have eaten some of their own kind just before they inflict the wound the sphingium and the satyr stow away food in the pouches of their cheeks after which they will take it out piece by piece with their hands and eat it and thus they do for a day or an hour what the ant usually does for the whole year the only animal with toes upon the feet that feeds upon grass is the hare which will eat corn as well while the solid hoofed animals and the swine among the cloven footed ones will eat all kinds of food as well as roots to roll over and over is a peculiarity of the animals with a solid hoof all those which have serrated teeth are carnivorous bears live also upon corn leaves grapes fruit bees crabs even and ants wolves as we have already stated will eat earth even when they are famishing cattle grow fat by drinking hence it is that salt agrees with them so well the same is also the case with beasts of burden although they live on corn as well as grass but they eat just in proportion to what they drink in addition to those already spoken of among the wild animals stags ruminate when reared in a domesticated state all animals ruminate lying in preference to standing and more in winter than in summer mostly for seven months in the year the pontic mouse also ruminates in a similar manner chapter ninety four diversities in the drinking of animals in drinking those animals which have serrated teeth lap and common mice do the same although they belong to another class those which have the teeth continuous horses and oxen for instance sup bears do neither the one nor the other but they seem to bite at the water and so devour it in africa the greater part of the wild beasts do not drink in summer through the want of rain for which reason it is that the mice of libya when caught will die if they drink the ever-thirsting plains of africa produce the oryx an animal which in consequence of the nature of its native locality never drinks and which 
in a remarkable manner, affords a remedy against drought. For the Gaetulian bandits, by its aid, fortify themselves against thirst by finding in its body certain vesicles filled with a most wholesome liquid. In this same Africa, also, the pards conceal themselves in the thick foliage of the trees, and then spring down from the branches on any creature that may happen to be passing by, thus occupying what are ordinarily the haunts of the birds. Cats, too, with what silent stealthiness, with what light steps do they creep towards a bird? How slyly they sit and watch, and then dart out upon a mouse! These animals scratch up the earth and bury their ordure, being well aware that the smell of it would betray their presence. CHAPTER Ninety Five, Antipathies of Animals Proofs that they are sensible of friendship and other affections. Hence there will be no difficulty in perceiving that animals are possessed of other instincts besides those previously mentioned. In fact, there are certain antipathies and sympathies among them which give rise to various affections besides those which we have mentioned in relation to each species in its appropriate place. The swan and the eagle are always at variance, and the raven and the chlorius seek each other's eggs by night. In a similar manner, also, the raven and the kite are perpetually at war with one another, the one carrying off the other's food. So, too, there are antipathies between the crow and the owl, the eagle and the trochilus, between the last two, if we are to believe the story, because the latter has received the title of the king of the birds. The same again with the owlet and all the smaller birds. Again, in relation to the terrestrial animals, the weasel is at enmity with the crow, the turtle dove with the pyralis, the ichneumon with the wasp, and the phalangium with other spiders. Among aquatic animals there is enmity between the duck and the sea mew, the falcon known as the harpy, and the hawk called the trichorus. In a similar manner, too, the shrew-mouse and the heron are ever on the watch for each other's young, and the egithus, so small a bird as it is, has an antipathy to the ass. For the latter, when scratching itself, rubs its body against the brambles, and so crushes the bird's nest, a thing of which it stands in such dread that if it only hears the voice of the ass when it brays, it will throw its eggs out of the nest, and the young ones themselves will sometimes fall to the ground in their fright. Hence it is that it will fly at the ass and peck at its sores with its beak. The fox, too, is at war with the nisus, and serpents with weasels and swine. Acelon is the name given to a small bird that breaks the eggs of the raven, and the young of which are anxiously sought by the fox, while in its turn it will peck at the young of the fox, and even the parent itself. As soon as the ravens espy this, they come to its assistance, as though against a common enemy. The acanthus, too, lives among the brambles. Hence it is that it also has an antipathy to the ass, because it devours the bramble blossoms. The egithus and the anthus, too, are at such mortal enmity with each other, that it is the common belief that their blood will not mingle, and it is for this reason that they have the bad repute of being employed in many magical incantations. The thos and the lion are at war with each other, and indeed the smallest objects and the greatest just as much. Caterpillars will avoid a tree that is infested with ants. The spider, poised in its web, will throw itself on the head of a serpent as it lies stretched beneath the shade of the tree where it has built, and with its bite pierce its brain. Such is the shock that the creature will hiss from time to time, and then, seized with vertigo, coil round and round, while it finds itself unable to take flight, or so much as to break the web of the spider, as it hangs suspended above, this scene only ends with its death. CHAPTER Ninety Six, INSTANCES OF AFFECTION SHOWN BY SERPENTS On the other hand, there is a strict friendship existing between the peacock and the pigeon, the turtle-dove and the parrot, the blackbird and the turtle, the crow and the heron, all of which join in a common enmity against the fox. The harpy also, and the kite, unite against the triorchus. And then besides, have we not seen instances of affection, in the serpent even, that most ferocious of all animals? We have already related the story that is told of a man in Aridia who was saved by a dragon which had belonged to him, and of his voice being recognized by the animal. 
We must also make mention here of another marvellous story that is related by Philarchus about the asp. He tells us that in Egypt one of these animals, after having received its daily nourishment at the table of a certain person, brought forth, and that it so happened that the son of its entertainer was killed by one of its young ones, upon which, returning to its food as usual, and becoming sensible of the crime, it immediately killed the young one, and returned to the house no more. CHAPTER Ninety Seven: THE SLEEP OF ANIMALS The question as to their sleep is one that is by no means difficult to solve. In the land animals it is quite evident that all that have eyelids sleep. With reference to aquatic animals, it is admitted that they also sleep, though only for short periods, even by those writers who entertain doubts as to the other animals. And they come to this conclusion, not from any appearance of the eyes, for they have no eyelids, indeed, to close, but because they are to be seen buried in deep repose, and to all appearance fast asleep, betraying no motion in any part of the body except the tail, and by starting when they happen to hear a noise. With regard to the thunny, it is stated with still greater confidence that it sleeps. Indeed, it is often found in that state near the shore or among the rocks. Flatfishes are also found fast asleep in shallow water, and are often taken in that state with the hand. And as to the dolphin and the balina, they are even heard to snore. It is quite evident also that insects sleep, from the silent stillness which they preserve, and even if a light is put close to them, they will not be awoke thereby. CHAPTER 98 WHAT ANIMALS ARE SUBJECT TO DREAMS Man, just after his birth, is hard-pressed by sleep for several months after which he becomes more and more wakeful, day by day. The infant dreams from the very first, for it will suddenly awake with every symptom of alarm, and while asleep will imitate the action of sucking. There are some persons, however, who never dream. Indeed, we find instances stated where it has been a fatal sign for a person to dream who has never done so before. Here we find ourselves invited by a grand field of investigation, and one that is full of alleged proofs on both sides of the question, whether, when the mind is at rest in sleep, it has any foreknowledge of the future, and if so, by what process this is brought about, or whether this is not altogether a matter quite fortuitous as most other things are. If we were to attempt to decide the question by instances quoted, we should find as many on the one side as on the other. It is pretty generally agreed that dreams— immediately after we have taken wine and food, or when we have just fallen asleep again after waking, have no signification whatever. Indeed, sleep is nothing else than the retiring of the mind into itself. It is quite evident that besides man, horses, dogs, oxen, sheep, and goats have dreams. Consequently, the same is supposed to be the case with all animals that are viviparous. As to those which are oviparous, it is a matter of uncertainty, though it is equally certain that they do sleep. But we must now pass on to a description of the insects. Summary. Remarkable Facts, Narratives, and Observations. 793. Roman authors quoted. Manilius, Cornelius, Virulanus, the actor Triumphorum, Ombricius Melior, Masorius Sabinus, Antistius Labio, Trogus, Cremutius, M. Varro, Macer, Emilius, Melissus, Mucianus, Nepos, Fabius Pictor, T. Lucretius, Cornelius Celsus, Horus, Deculo, Hyginus, the Sacerne, Nigidius, Mamillus Sora, foreign authors quoted, Homer, Feminoe, Philemon, Boius, who wrote the Ornithogonia Hylus, who wrote in augury, Aristotle, Theophrastus, Callimachus, Aeschylus, King Hiero, King Philometer, Archietus of Tarentum, Amphilochus of Athens, Anaxipolis of Thasos, Apollodorus of Lemnos, Aristophanes of Miletus, Antigenus of Syme, Agathocles of Chios, Apollonius of Pergamus, Aristander of Athens, Bacchius of Miletus, Bion of Soli, Kyrias of Athens, Diodorus of Priene, 
Dion of Colophon, Democritus, Diophanes of Nicaea, Epigenes of Rhodes, Euagon of Thasos, Euphronius of Athens, Juba, and Rotion, who wrote on agriculture, Iscrion, who wrote on agriculture, Lysimachus, who wrote on agriculture, Dionysus, who translated Mago, Diophanes, who made an epitome of Dionysus, Nicander, Onesicritus, Philarchus, Hesiod. End of section 42 And end of the Natural History, Volume 2, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley.